no, no, list no, no, no. of yeah. Scotland. And you say, yeah, yeah. I'm from Scotland. Yeah. Um, and I will finish talking, and everybody feels they've had their baby bottles in the Pat's on the head and said, don't worry, little head, about these difficult things, and it's a you know, and I'm sure you've all been there. I might as well start now. Yeah, yeah. 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 Well, don't, well, don't, don't worry. I mean, you know, the, the ship might have to be fine. Michelle, they can speak, grab a cup of tea or coffee. And I just want to get struck off eventually, but I don't care anymore because you know, I can do much without being a, a qualified doctor. Yeah. But, um, but that, you're absolutely right. That's what stops the GPs um, being helpful because every time they come and mention all my things and get people, they go, oh, no, 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 you can't do it. The idea is to give you a kind of um, um, a, a, a frame as to, as to you know, what it's all about. And if at any point you don't get it, you can say shout. Stop, put your hand up, you know, just say you're not being clear, repeat that, you know, blah, 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 blah. if I lose you, it's a waste of time. I'm just chatting up myself instead of chatting you up, and I'm here to see the food. So, um, um, so, you know, so yes, GPs have no information. And in fact, they're deserting the NHS for 130 doctors a month. Um, they go to the region, they go to the seas, and they're happy to swear. Um, to the very top of the paper affairs. Uh, and my brother, you know, is part of it. I mean, morale is a full time vote. Anyway, anyway, start and begin. Um, the idea of today is for you all guys to go away with, as I call it, rules of the game and tools of grace to do with that. You know, you have to do this for you. So I have to teach you to become your own doctor. Okay. So know what to look for. To understand your reactions to and to help you. Now, if after this workshop you want to email me a question and you know, say where do I go from here, then I can put them in the right direction. But I can't make any of you my patients. So if I need to become my patient, I can keep records, and blah, 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 it's not good for you, and all that. So you know, I'm just here to do a teach you as well. You know, so I'm very happy to help you know, subsequently. And one or two of the other workshops say, for the next year, can say, can you come back again? Because we've moving on for Level. But there's so much that can be done with just basic work up that is the starting point. And I now know that there's an order that we have to be done. And if you do the amount of order, you don't get the good results. If you want the quickest and the cheapest way to get work, because it's expensive to do why you can't work, and you've got to pay for these extra. So let's talk about the overall strategy. There are two kind of bits of my teeth in the morning. Now, fatigue is the symptom that. Um, you experience when energy delivery mechanism is down. And um, so if you've got poor energy delivery mechanism, we call that chronic fatigue syndrome. And if you've got um, inflammation as well, which is allergy, infection, or immunity, that gives us the inflammation symptoms and that gives us the ME. So chronic fatigue syndrome is pure poor energy delivery mechanism, and ME is poor energy delivery mechanism. And an immunological hold in and inflammation. Um, and you know, that's, that's they're, they're Now, we have to start thinking about symptoms now because the one of the worst things that doctors do is they don't look for root causes of problems. You know, they're not asking why, it's just symptom suppression. So you know, headache becomes paracetamol deficiency, depression becomes you know SSRI deficiency, you know, blood pressure becomes you know antihypertensive drug pills, and so on. So symptoms are our guiding post. Symptoms tell us what's wrong. So if you think of this as a, as a detective story, the symptoms are our clues. And you go in with drugs, it's like somebody walking all over the crime scene. It messes up all the clues, you don't know where you are. And you know, all drugs have side effects, all drugs have mitochondrial function, or many drugs have mitochondrial function, and just to say mess up the, the area. So we have so the sooner you can get to grips with your problem before it becomes muddled by you know, non-story lines, lampages and prozacs and, and, and painkillers and god knows what, you know, the better. Um, now the symptom of fatigue 
is, is it's all, remember, all symptoms in our brain. There's nothing in our body, it's all in our brain. And the brain gives us symptoms for very good reasons. Because it gives us symptoms to stop us doing things. So if you didn't have any symptoms, if you never, never experienced pain, if you never experienced fatigue, you work all day, all night, all day, all night, you'd all be dead in two weeks, because nobody survived three weeks ago. So, you know, when you get a symptom, I'm going to say welcome to them when you go dying, but ask the question why. What is it that's causing it? Now, of course, by the time we've had chronic fatigue or any years, it's all come a bit muddy and, and it's difficult to attribute things to things, but always be thinking in, in that way because you would be amazed what clues suddenly spring out. And as we talk, you, you come to me with your history and I'll say, oh, that sounds like a mole problem, oh, that sounds like a chemical poison or whatever. But you could, if you can do that yourself, and the clues are in, in my books, obviously, so you go away and read them now, too. But, you know, we, if you would think that we have a certain bucket of energy to spend in the day, it's available to us, and we can spend so much energy. Now, two-thirds of that energy just goes on staying right. Just basic brain function, basic gut function, basic heart function, just, you know, being alive. Which leaves about a third to spend on doing things, you know, physically, mentally, doing things emotionally. But then if your energy demand gets close to energy delivery, then we start getting symptoms. Why? Because if energy demand exceeds energy delivery, you die. You know, the heart stops, the brain stops, the organs all go into failure because they haven't got the energy to function. So the brain can never permit a situation where you're spending more energy than you've got. Because death is just around the corner. So as the energy gap narrows, the brain can be worse and worse and worse symptoms. Which might be fatigue, and it might be pain, of course. Um, um, but for example, if the brain doesn't want to spend energy, another mood it will give you is low mood, anxiety, feeling stress, procrastination. Why? Because it stops the brain spending energy. And although the brain just weighs two percent of total body weight, it consumes twenty percent of our total energy. So at the end of the day, talking to people, I'm absolutely slayed. But I go out walking my, my daughter with a dog walk all day and feel as light as I am at the end of the day. So, you know, it's just an illustration of how the brain uses a lot of energy. So, um, so use those symptoms as clues. And of course, you know, if in the muscles and um, the organs you're using energy faster than um, delivery, you get lactic acid burn. You, know, you, you, you switch into anaerobic metabolism, you do lactic acid, and that's jolly painful. And a very common complaint in my only patients is they've got chest pain. And you know, they go to the cardiologist and the cardiologist says, oh yeah, yeah, it's any typical chest pain. Well, of course, I've never heard much rubbish in my life. <laughs> hey, so what's the completely meaning of saying? You've got angina. You've got angina because you've got lactic acid burn in the heart. And you've got lactic acid burn in the heart muscle, not because of poor blood supply, which is all the cardiologists in the family, but because of poor mitochondria function. The mitochondria cannot generate energy fast enough for the heart to be powerful. And there's a lot of work on an American by Paul Peckerman, who was asked by the Americans, you know, how can we assess how ill these patients are? And he looked at them, he was part of the office, and said, well, they're in heart failure. You know, that's why they're, 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 they're ill. They haven't got the heart function to power their body. And he did tests measuring cardiac output. And sure enough, you know, those with the most severe, and he had the lowest cardiac output, and those with the most mild, relatively better. And of course, that's the base of POTS, which is, you know, a very common condition. Because the business of pumping the blood around the body uh, is much easier um, when you're lying down. That's why I like sitting down with my feet up. <laughs> and you should be too. <laughs> so you need bangs at the next level. It's much easier for the heart to pump the blood on the flat than um, when you're vertical up and standing down. So the ME patients, the very sick ones, have to spend their whole life on the job. They would give the heart the minimal amount of work it's necessary to circulate the body. As soon as they stand up, you increase cardiac output by about 20%. It's much harder work pumping blood up here and down there than on the flat. Now, the only way the ME pays for the chronic fetus of the heart can increase cardiac output, it can't be any more powerful than the mitochondria doing their best. It has to be faster. So you get the tachycardia, the heart beats faster to try to maintain the blood flow. But even that's not sustainable because they quickly switch into the anaerobic metabolism. Heart output, cardiac output falls, blood pressure drops, and you keel over. So that's what POTS is all about. It's simply a symptom of low cardiac output. But I just ask, I yep. know you've got the tilt there. Yes. 
Is there any other sector? So I went to Cardi, I won't do it in Cardi, but I went to Cardi yeah. and asked the children, is there any other sector? Of course, you can do it yourself at home. You know, you lie, get yourself a blood pressure cuff, and they're very useful when you're needy when you get when you start putting the thyroid up. Get yourself a cuff that measures your pulse and blood pressure and lie down and see what your blood pressure is and see what your pulse rate is. And then you stand up and continue to monitor. And if your pulse rate increases, it, uh, your blood pressure is maintained for a while, and then suddenly you drop precipitously if the heart can't maintain output, and you feel pain in the So you, you can diagnose yourself. It's not difficult. So if you do have a problem, then what do you ask cardio? Well, they're useless. <laughs> yeah, because they don't address the root cause. I mean, they'll say, oh, have these problems to slow the heart down. But that's symptom suppression. You know, the the technical harder is that it's the heart that's trying to maintain blood pressure and, and, and circulation. So what do you do? Just rest the sleep button? That we, well, in the short term, yes, but what we have to do is we have to improve energy delivery methods. So the first starting point for treating you know, all chronic fatigues and any is to improve energy delivery methods. And um, with respect to that, there are four important players. And I use the car analogy all the time because I get it and most of my patients get it. Uh, which is, for your car to work, you've got to have the right fuel in your car. <clears throat> now, if we spent the day talking about nothing other than that subject, and you all went away and did it the letter, you would all improve. Okay? It's the hardest thing you have to do, but it's also the most important. So I talk about foundation stones for treating my end patients and getting people where they might well be now from the start of the foundation stones. But actually, I should correct myself, it's foundation stones. You don't get the diet in place, everything else is wasted. You've got to get the right fuel in the tank. I mean, you could have a Formula One car and engine and thyroid and accelerator and all that. But if you bring the wrong fuel in, it ain't going to go. And you know, humans evolve over hundreds of thousands of years on a ketogenic diet. And guess what? All mammals run on a ketogenic diet. And you might think, oh, horses eat grass and cows eat grass. Yes, but that is fermented into ketones. So, you know, grass eating vegetarians are running on ketones. They're all, you know, carnivores are eating fat and meat, and they are running on ketones. So, um, um, you know, you will come to me with a million and one excuses because I have a red and white, they shouldn't be eating ketones, are. and I've got to the point where I'm becoming nasty and vicious, and it's non negotiable, you've got to do it. <laughs> so, um, back to the energy delivery method. You've got to have the right fuel in the tank, and that is diet, what you eat, micronutrients, which I'm going to talk about, and it's gut function. Because you've got to be able to absorb those things and get them to where they need. And then you have the mitochondrial engine. And that's my special area of interest. And that's why I did the work in the 1990s and the 2000s. And John found how I published in the late 2000s. And I found notice in um, uh, 2013. Um, because the mitochondria is the engine of your car. Now, mitochondria are fascinating things because they are the common engine to all living things in the whole wide world. It's like every car in the whole world has got the same engine. It's, you know, and so our engines are the same as monkey's engines, the same as you know, my pet dog and, and my horse and the cows and the trees out there. You know, if you're alive, you've got mitochondria and you have the same engine to work in exactly the same way. And for your mitochondria to work, you've got to have the right fuel in the tank, yeah? You've got to have the raw materials to do that. And the commonest rate in the I now know from having done 996 tests with Acumen Laboratories. I totted them up the other day. Um, um, so it's things like KP10, B3, acetylcarnitine, ribose, magnesium, B12. Then you've got to not be inhibiting the mitochondria in something. And so mitochondria can just say, because they haven't got the raw materials, or they're blocked by something. And mitochondria being blocked is like throwing hands of sand into a high, high tube It mucks it up in unpredictable ways. It might block oxygen. It might block counterfeit protein, it might block you know, energy release and ATP or whatever. But toxic stress is, is, is uh, an important cause of micro going slow. And then you've got to have the control mechanism right. So that leads us onto the thyroid accelerator panel and the adrenal gear box. And you, know, so you can have the perfect Formula One engine and the perfect fuel in the tank. But if the guy's not pressing on the accelerator pedal, it's just going to crawl out at five miles an hour with the else in the way. And you've got to be able to get it in response to stress, and that's what we're doing. Tonight. So those are the four, you know, basics for energy delivery. And then you have to have regular servicing, and that's all about sleep. Yeah, we could talk all day about sleep, but 
what I want you to do is throw your particular <coughs> questions and, and, and issues so I can enlarge on those. But I'm just giving the overall strategy, okay? So the first drive is to improve energy delivery mechanisms, so as good as we can. And then if um, people are still not well, or they've obviously got inflammation symptoms, by which I mean the feeling of malaise, the feeling of ill, the large lymph nodes, their ME was triggered by an acute viral infection or a coronavirus or whatever, um, 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 or they've got allergy symptoms dating back to years old, with snotty noses and catarrh and, and, um, and recurrent migraines and irritable bowel syndrome. And that means the immune system. And the immune system is our standing army. And guess what? The standing armies use a lot of energy and a lot of raw materials. And so if your immune system is busy, for good reasons or for bad, and normally with my enemy patients with chronic inflammation, it's for bad reasons, then that A, kicks an enormous hole in your energy bucket, and B, causes nasty symptoms of inflammation, which is characterized by pain, redness, heat, swelling, and loss of function. So, um, and, and, and it doesn't matter, you know, and, and so the symptom of inflammation is the same, whether it's autoimmunity, whether it's allergy, or whether it's chronic infection. So again, by taking a good history, we can then get some clues as to what it is going there, and then um, focus on dealing with that specific information. But um, as I say, as I'm saying earlier, there's also a certain order in which you have to do all this stuff. And there I said it starts with the directed diet. Because if you don't do that, all else doesn't work. Why? Because if you're running your body on carbohydrates, your blood sugar is going up and down and up and down. Now, you ask any manufacturing system, any car assembly factory, if, you know, if fuel and raw materials are coming in irregularly, it makes things inefficient. So if the blood sugar is too high, mitochondria don't work very well. If the blood sugar is too low, the mitochondria don't work very well. Um, so they just have to kind of win this time when they are functioning. So that's a major problem. Secondly, as your blood sugar goes up, you pour out itsin. Itsin brings blood sugar down by shunting the fat. And then as the blood sugar comes down, um, if it comes down very quickly, the brain panics, it thinks it's going to run out of fuel, and therefore it's out of the drain. And, um, and this is the basis of what we call metabolic syndrome. Metabolic syndrome is a dreadful name for a very common condition. And if you can diagnose metabolic syndrome very easily by looking at supermarket trolley. So when I get out of my doors in Brighton, I like to go shopping little, and it's fascinating to look at what people are putting in their trolleys. And I think, if I ate that, I would be ill. You know, I, I just wouldn't survive more than a few days. And it's the cereals, and loads of sweet fruit, and biscuits, and chocolate, and crisps, and, you know, they're just fueling their body on carbohydrates. Now, the reason we do this is because it's cheap, very convenient, and they're highly addictive. And if you see carbohydrates in terms of addiction, you will understand why we go to them all the time. You know, in the short term, in the short term, what they do is they mask the energy gap. Again, I can talk all day about addiction, but one of the features um, of people who are quite decent is they use addiction to mask their symptoms. Now, young people do it if they want to go out dancing, they um, you know, have an ecstasy tablet or a cocaine tablet, something like that, and um, it masks that symptom of the energy gap. Suddenly, the brain can see. Well, also energy. You know, I can dance all night, I dance all day, I can be jolly, I can be extrovert, and they narrow their energy gap very dangerously. And occasionally you hear of kids and, you know, who have taken empty habit and dropped dead or whatever, and I'm quite sure what they've done is they narrow their energy gap so much, suddenly they're spending more energy than they've got, and they can't stop. And it really is as simple as that. And you never hear why they stop, why they die. You know, I always look out for the mechanism there, and I feel that you can never find it, the empty habit kills there's no mechanism, no explanation of why. And I'm quite sure it's because addiction masks the symptoms of fatigue. And that's what sugar does. It gives us a little boost. We call it comfort eating. And then the athletes, you know, um, um, are below, they, 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 they compete. Now, for an athletic event, yes, it will improve the performance. I understand why they do it. But if you're doing it all the time just to cope with normal life, you run into the spike eating until the weight goes up, the spiking blood sugar. And you have diabetes, and every time the blood sugar drops, you start adrenaline, and you get high blood pressure. And that is metabolic. And we see epidemics of this diabetes, high blood pressure. And guess what? That is also a risk factor for heart disease, for cancer, and dementia. 
So what this means is I can tell my patients with great confidence, do all, put all this stuff in place. And yes, it can't work, but I expect your energy level to be. But the plus point is your best years are ahead. Because you know, I'm a job night, I want to live my life to the full, a very high level, and then when I get 120, drop off the first like that. And we all have the potential to do that. <laughs> And if you don't get there, it's because you've all filled up somehow on the way. So what I'm saying is, put all this stuff in place, and you know, your future years will be great. Because there's a general expectation, isn't there, that as you get old, you know, old age doesn't come alone, it comes with aches and pains. Rubbish. We, we do that to ourselves. You know, people expect to go down, and, oh, I've seen you moments, oh, I'm losing my brain, oh, I've got arthritis, oh, blah, 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 and then they're in the grave. No, 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 I don't want to do that, and there's no reason why anybody should. At a high level for a long time. So, if you haven't got any of chronic fatigue syndrome, do these things yourself. And if you are a carer for somebody who's got it, you will be helping yourself you know, hugely. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Um, so, my was 18 and she went on, or tried to, probably from about, I mean, she has no sugar now, no gluten, generally no carbs, she has no fruit, she just has berries. So, for lunch, she'll have like um, uh, the wild salmon and she'll have some broccoli. She won't even have the broccoli sauce because she says that has no sugar in the head, etc. So she goes to the nth degree, but she did struggle after three months with not having any carbs. So now she has a tiny bit of rice and stuff because she doesn't eat meat. Okay. There's a problem perhaps not in the middle of that. No, that is, well, first of all, it's, it, yes, a low carb diet, but you've got to have enough calories. And, and you won't get your calories from eating broccoli. You've got to have the fat, and that is so important. And again, it's difficult with both vegans and vegetarians because, you know, um, meat fat is such an important resource and meat. So and so are eggs and so are fish, all that. Um, but um, one of that symptom of struggling to keep with that is typical hypothyroid. And so my guess is she probably needs thyroid tablets. So my immediate reaction will be, is she eating enough? Because this what anybody came out of Bells and had kind of pizza because they were putting enough food in the tank. And it's not obvious, is it? Um, and the, um, one, of the, one of the features of hypothyroidism is that people struggle to keep with that. And we will talk about how you can sort very easily because um, um, when you initially keep that, you use adrenaline, you we use adrenaline for fat burn, but you shouldn't be burning with thyroid hormones, you shouldn't be using thyroid hormones for fat burn. So if you go keto and you can't sustain it, it's typical hypothyroidism. So we'll talk about how to do that. But this is a very useful tool for um, seeing if you're in ketosis. It's a, it costs 50 quid, it's a bit expensive, but the tests are free and they're very easy. And um, um, you just switch it on by pressing the button, and it comes to life. It takes 20 seconds to warm up, so you get a countdown. That's be sitting in the current line, if I put it on the chat. But um, the point is, you can blow into it, and it tells you if you're in ketosis. And if you're in ketosis, you're doing the diet well enough. And, um, at, that, and at that point, you can then move on to all the other things. So it's going to be in a moment. When it beats the second time, it means you've blown enough, and then it takes a couple of uh, seconds to, to, to um, give you the answer. So I'm, I've got 2.6 millimoles of ketones, acid in my breath, so I know I'm in ketosis. So whatever I've had for breakfast is good enough to keep me in ketosis. So that's a very useful tool, because instead of people coming to me and saying, oh, I think I'm doing it right now, I'm having this, I'm having that, I'm having the other, I'm saying, don't ask me, measure yourself, because everybody's different. Everybody gets into ketosis at different levels, and you can do it after every meal and check that that meal was good enough. What's it called? Then? I've got some here. I've got okay. them here. They're on my website, right. and they're called ketone breath meals. Okay. Now, um, this, is this is something I've been doing only in the last year or so, and it's not in my books. I haven't got, you know, because uh, the books are out of date so quickly, that's the trouble. Because my, I'm learning at an exponential rate. So the basic stuff is there, but that's a, it's a very useful tool. I mean, initially I was using keto sticks for peeing on it, and that's quite good. But as you get into ketosis, you know, long term, the body gets much better at matching energy, you know, fat production for ketones to energy delivery, and you stop peeing them out in your urine. And then with the test so going the blood testing. The blood tests the best. Oh. But I'm a win. You know, I don't like that myself. And they cost a pound each yeah. for a stick. Lowering the diet, that's no, and people do. And I don't care. So long as you're fat burning, I don't care if you're burning a lot or a little, I want you to be fat burning. And because when you're fat burning, your blood sugar levels are absolutely like that, you've lost all the fluctuation. 
And very often, the first thing people comment on is their sleep is better. Why? Because you're spiking adrenaline at night, it wakes you up. Um, I mean, believe me, you know, I'm an addict, so I know what this. You know, um, you know, I love alcohol. Both my parents died, you know, from alcoholic disease, essentially. So I then drink it. But I do enjoy a glass of wine when I, you know, once a fortnight or whatever. And what happens? It wakes me up in the middle of the night. I wake up in the middle of the night. Why awake? Why? Because alcohol stimulates insulin, and that got your blood sugar and spikes adrenaline. And I wake up at night, you know, it's crazy. Like, you know, isn't it? No, two o'clock. Oh God, you know. So, um, so that's amazing. It stops me drinking, I have to say. <laughs> but the ketogenic diet is absolutely starting point. And there's another reason why it's absolutely starting point. It's because you know, if you're eating a lot of carbohydrates, and people eat an extraordinary amount of carbohydrates, you will end up with an upper fermenting gut. Now, the human gut is almost unique in the mammal species because we, it's, it's a dual fuel gut. We have an upper gut, which is a digesting, carnivorous, acidic gut that allows us to deal with um, meat and fat. So my upper gut is like my dog's gut. You know, she only eats meat and fat, um, um, and she's very healthy. And so, so the upper gut is, is a carnivorous gut. But the lower gut, the large bowel, is a fermenting gut, and it allows us to digest food. We've got fiber in it. And um, so, so the fermenting gut is a bit like a horse's gut, or a sheep's gut, or a cow's gut, because they only ferment. They, they, you know, they, their guts are like our colons, one of those like huge colons. And, um, and that ferments fiber for another fuel source, which actually is fermented into a huge gut, uh, short chain fatty acids, which burns ketones. Now, um, when humans evolved, um, and this is part of the reason why we are so numerous on the world today, um, they, as, they, as they evolved, they moved away from the equator into colder climates. And what happens in colder climates? You move north or south, there's a winter. And um, to survive the winter, if primitive man can take advantage of an autumn bonanza, an autumn harvest, i.e. by eating carbs and getting addicted to them and eating more and more of them and getting fat, that's survival value for the winter. So metabolic syndrome is an evolutionary tool that we have adopted to survive vicious winters. And so primitive man would have winter time every year, maybe a couple of months, when he get that. Potatoes, root vegetables, grains, natural harvest, and whatever. And he ate those foods because we have an addiction gene that makes us addicted to those foods. We eat more and more and more of them. So you know, if I start, somebody offered me a pack of biscuits, I would have to say no. Why? Because if I had the first biscuit, the whole lot would go. If I had one square of chocolate, the whole bar would go. Because I know I'm an addict. So I've just about got self control to say no to the first. And then I don't have to worry about, about the rest. But, but if I'm primitive man, that is actually an advantage to eat and eat and eat and eat and get fat. Because obviously it's insulation and it's a food supply. But now with our food delivery system and our modern agriculture, we can eat those foods all year round. And uh, primitive man had to be on eating them because they just ran out. There wasn't any more food. But now there's uh, food freely available, and some people eat bread and carbs and biscuits all year round and never escape their bodies. They're never getting sick. So, um, um, so, so we're addicts, we tend to eat high carbohydrates, and we end up with an upper fermenting gut. So the upper gut ferments food instead of digesting it. Now, bacteria and yeast cannot ferment. How do we know that? I'm leaking uh, a, a bucket of lard on the side of my kitchen, not even in the fridge, and it doesn't go off. You know, I can leave butter in the fridge or um, fat in the fridge for months, 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 and it doesn't go off. Whereas I've left a banana or something or bread, but you know, it gets harmed by yeast, it gets harmed by bacteria. So um, if you're eating lots of carbohydrates, you will, you will start fermenting your upper gut. Now that causes lots of problems. The first thing is, is that the gut is full of, of bacteria and yeast. And when you take nutritional supplements, you feed them. Why? Because mitochondria are very similar to bacteria. I mean, from a evolutionary perspective, they derive from bacteria. So mitochondria love coqutane. They love the I think well, bacteria in the upper gut love coqutane. They love the rabbit. It makes them grow more avidly. So you are not going to get the goodness in your supplements, in your food, if you've got enough of many gut because you're just feeding the vine. I mean, you get vine, you get the vine, and you don't have a lot. That's the first problem. The second problem is. When those when foods get fermented, if you ferment carbohydrates in the upper gut, you produce all sorts of 
glasses like alcohol, ethanol, methanol, um, acid, um, uh, lactic acid, hydrogen sulfide, ammonia, and ammonia compound, a real toxic soup. And that wasn't it. Well, actually, what happened is um, um, the venous drainage of the gut all goes to the liver. So the liver is a great filtering system, it's a great sorting hat house, if you like, where it sorts out all those nasty toxins that come through, which also includes bacteria and toxins. It also can use it in involves bundle mycotoxins, you know, and if you're taking drugs and caffeine and everything else, you know, that too. So the liver does a fantastic job to clean up the dirty blood that's coming from our gut. And if you put the portal bay in that dirty blood straight into the systemic circulation, you'd be unconscious within a few minutes. And that's what happens in people with liver failure, they say they get dementia, um, and psychosis or brain cases psychopathy, and um, um, they get demented and they uh, rapidly get all the and stuff. So the liver does a fantastic job. And again, an illustration of this, A, liver is the most nutritious food you can eat. Why? Because it's full of all the things necessary. It's full of B it's full of minerals, it's full of essential fatty acids. It's a great food. It's not your food. <coughs> Offer to liver, grab it with both hands and yes, bit yum yum yum. And again, primitive tribes, when they hunt and they kill, um, the carcass is divided up. So the men get all the organ meat because they're the most nutritious. So the men get the livers and the hearts and the kidneys, and the women get the crab or muscle meat. They get the rump steaks and stuff in the beef as well. <laughs> so, and another illustration of how important the liver is is that at rest, the liver consumes more energy. And the heart and the brain put together. So, by sorting out fermenting gut, you're reducing the work of the liver. It doesn't have to use up so much energy, and it doesn't have to use up so much raw material, and that frees up stuff for you to have a life with. So, um, you know, sorting out fermenting is so important. You know, and if you're fermenting, you know, you couldn't be, and we know about fermenters like Peter back to my lorry, um, we know about the auto brewery center and funding. Uh, um, uh, Fermentation that we've done. But these days, I don't care what the bucket. You know, and guess what? I don't spend people's precious resources trying to find more of the bucket so they take really antibiotic. Because it's not like that. Because the approach to treating it is the same. Start with the directed Stop feeding them with, um, with sugar and carbohydrates and starches. I don't mind if they're complex starches or reduced starches or simple starches. doesn't matter. They're all feeding back. And secondly, kill the nutrition system. Now, joy of vitamin C, cheap, it contact kills everything. So um, this is the next step to treat this when you get Start the directions out, kill the vitamin C. And then you'll start getting some benefits from the supplements. Now, in my early days of treating um, um, all sorts in the 1980s, <coughs> when I really didn't have a clue, and I was just muddling along with these delightful patients who were holding my hand and cajoling me away along, um, what I did find out is that injections were very helpful. These injections B12 and vitamin C. And I now know why. Because I hadn't thought of those people from their guts out, and so I was putting injections directly into their bloodstream, but I passed in the director for scoffing and everything. And, um, and yes, maybe <coughs> by passing the other two, it was suddenly giving people the nutrition they never had access to before. And you know, lots of my patients love the B12 injections, love the magnesium because they suddenly, their brain wakes up and then their, their mood is good, they feel relaxed, you know, it's getting to where it's needed. And these days I use those injections less and less and less. Why? You sort the gut out, you know, your body can access all these things. And again, um, I used to use a lot of transdermal supplements, now I still do, and they're very useful. So you um, spray them off the skin, B12, um, 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 minerals, why? Because it's, 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 it's getting around the gut problem. It's getting straight into the bloodstream. And uh, another very useful technique because these days, I do less and less tests, and more and more let's do things. <clears throat> because I'm using tools which multitask, they do more than one job. Um, you know, they're completely safe, the potential harm is zero, and, um, and they benefit, cause benefits in lots and lots of ways. So for example, Epsom salt farm, very cheap, very easy. You can buy Epsom salt, then get delivered to your door, um, 20 kilos at a time, about 30 quid, and that will give you 40 to bar. What does that do? It detoxes you. It's a great way of pulling out the nasties. Gives you a nice dose of magnesium through the skin. And it gives you a nice dose of sulfate, which helps you to detox. So it's a really good tool. So increasingly these days, I'm saying, you know, don't go out and spend a fortune on tests. We know what to do. 
spend your precious resources on putting in place you know, all the things you've got to do to get right. So, <clears throat> um, the mitochondrial engine, as I say, so you get the data phase, up speed efficiency, and then you start absorbing the substance you need. The doses are, all, are in the books and on my website, you know, the Bible, and that's fine. KP10, plastoplantine, vitamin B3, it's magnesium, and B1. They're the, um, the ones that can't time, and time, and time. Um, now, D-ribose is expensive, so the, and D-ribose is a sugar, so you cannot grow out of ketosis. So the way I tend to use ribose these days is <clears throat> last thing at night if you really overcook it, because it stops the delay fatigue. So if you know you've really overdone things, take a big dose last thing at night, and <clears throat> you will recover much quicker. You're not my words, the words of my patients, and also lots of studies have been done showing that. The ribose is a... Uh, very helpful. Well, that helps with the, with the heat rises. Does that help with that? As the what rises? Heat. You know, like when you've got a hot flushing. That's, a, that's something else. That's not really part of energy delivery method. Okay. Um, and we will come on to temperature and how we deal with that, you know, as part of the thyroid and the dream stuff. <laughs> but, <clears throat> but those basic times that say, hey, now. Sorry, what was it called? I've got CO2, CO3, CO3. Acetyl l magnesium. And the doses are all in the books or on my website. So it's, it's just a little bit. Is it magnesium? I don't think so. Um, I tend to say we'll get the cheapest you can, you can afford. But some, I mean, magnesium salt, like magnesium chloride, magnesium sulfate, they talk about. Magnesium citrate isn't so bad, but it's more expensive. Magnesium EAP is great, but it's very expensive. So um, whatever you can. But another reason to use epsom salt baths is because magnesium goes in beautifully. Yeah. And there's a lovely study done by Rosemary Waring, who's now a professor of quite an Oxford Institute of Health and Kings Department of Physics. And um, what she showed is she took 19 patients. She, wants, she asked the question, how well do extra salt baths work? I mean, do they really have an effect? And so I think that, um, uh, 19 or 20 patients who, or pick people, who bath daily in extra salt. So before the, um, um, the experiment, she took blood levels of magnesium sulfate, and also urine levels of magnesium sulfate. Then they had um, daily baths for two weeks, and the recipe was a mix, an interesting mixture of imperial and um, um, metric units, because it was a, 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 um, a 500 gram of electrical salt in an 18 gallons of water. <laughs> <laughs> um, soaked in that, and then at the end of the two weeks, she repeated their blood, magnesium, um, blood sulfate, and urine. And in all cases, the blood and the urine, magnesium, and sulfate increase. So they're, yes, they're absorbing nicely in their body and they're peeing out with the urine, and, and, and that's doing good on pass on. And the interesting one is, and there were several patients who had arthritis, who said, and my arthritis cleared up. <laughs> <laughs> so there are other clinical benefits as well. So again, it's a very useful tool. Again, transdermal magnesium is fantastically useful. It's cheap, it's easy to apply, um, um, and um, uh, it's Although it won't have the same effect on the blood, it's very good for local friction. Like so things like bursitis, frozen shoulder, sinusitis, uh, not sinusitis, um, 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 tendonitis, um, you know, any pain. Because I suspect an awful lot of pain like those itises are due to friction in the tissue. And I think what magnesium does is it gets in there and it lines the tissue and reduces the friction so that um, uh, joints and muscles and tendons can move you know, frictionlessly <coughs> over each other. So, um, so, so, with the, so with the mitochondrial energy, we get the raw material in place, you know, and then you and then you have to ask: Is it possible something is blocking? And um, the fact of the matter is, we are all poisoned, whether we like it or not, because we live in a toxic world. And my view is, we should all be doing, you know, um, a detox technique. People love to say, oh, it's the mercury it's doing, oh, it's the aluminum it's doing, oh, it's the organic phosphate doing. And my view is, well, it's actually a cocktail. You know, I've never done a test and found people you know, free from all those chemicals. They've all got a you know, basic level of because we live in such a beautiful world. So obviously, you do your best to avoid. And you know, again, the books are listed, you know, the important things that um, you know, mercury, dental, mouth, fillings. Bottom line is, nobody should be walking around. They are legal. 
And in, in the early days, you know, I'm worried about saying because we've got to do it, 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 because it's the expense and because the pain. And I don't think I've had one patient come back to me and say, well, that's a waste of time, you know, um, uh, why did I do that sort of thing? And we know it's associated with dementia and other, and, and mostly it's a known casting mm -hmm. example. So, you know, and I ran a meeting in the early 2000s. We well, had a guy called Fritz Lorschneider come, and he was talking about you know, the, the, the top fist in the narcissist of rhetoric. And the very question I put to him was, what do I tell you know, my poor any patients who haven't got any money? You know, um, uh, uh, do they have to go to an expensive dentist who cost them thousands of pounds to get them? He said, he said no. Do the basic stuff, you know, the basic protective things before you have them out, like take charcoal and saline and vitamin C to help protect you from the toxicity and just get the right limbs out. Now, in the short term, you might have a spike in medical toxicity, but four months, six months down the line, you're going to be much better off. <coughs> so at that point, I copy that to my dentist and we go down and say, can't pull the right things out, but something, you know. So, so, so we've got them to, to, to keep them as they are. Yeah, that's rubbish. That's absolutely rubbish. No. Um, um, yeah, we are taught, or the dentists are taught, and the doctors are taught, that um, mercury is a solid, and once in there, there it stays. That is not the case. It's a liquid. It's a very tough liquid, or, you know, but there's a wonderful video on YouTube um, of, uh, of, uh, of a tooth that's been removed that's got a mouth in it. And if, if you, if you Take a picture of it with um, ultraviolet light. You can see that the mercury coming off in, in smoke. Actually, the vapor is falling off all the time. And as Lord Schleider said, you know, yes, mercury, half the time we're exhaling, but half the time we're inhaling. <laughs> <laughs> and guess what? We inhale it, and it's absorbed in the lungs, and it gets into the bloodstream very easily, and it bioconcentrates in the heart, and in the bone, and in the brain. So if you want a really good test of your mercury levels, do a heart biopsy. Am I going to volunteer for one of those? No, I don't think so. The point being, if you just do a urine test, you won't see it. And um, uh, and again, some doctors are very naughty. They do blood tests and urine. Oh, you'll find no problem with mercury because they're they're looking in the wrong place. So if you want if you want to test to see how much heavy metal you've got on board, you have to use a chelation Now, the details have it on my website. The test is everybody, anybody can access it to know the laboratory, and the, the very game is called Catch and you get that from eBay, you can go to my office at the same time. <laughs> so anybody can do this test, you don't need a doctor to do it, um, anyone can do it. Anyone can do it. And the way that it works is um, you enter your bladder first thing in the morning, you take a dose of GMSA at the rate of 15 milligrams per kilogram, so you know, if you're about 50 kilograms, you can get about 700 milligrams, you collect all your pee for six hours, at the end of six hours you empty your bladder, Roughly measure, you know, um, the volume of the rough. It doesn't have to be accurate, and then you send a sample off to the lab to look at it. And um, you know, because I'm mean and because I'm careful, I never, I've never done a test on myself. But after a consult, I really ought to get my you know, heavy metal done. So I did, and to my slight horror and shock and shame, I had quite high levels of um, lead, quite high levels of arsenic. No idea where that came from, and, and fairly okay mercury for that. My feelings, but you know, so now I'm. I'm getting rid of the stuff now, but we've all got it on board. So if you can't take the test, you know, do the metal detox routine. Now, guess what? Pulled back from the heavy metal very well. Taking lots of minerals. How do you get the minerals on board? Do a ketogenic diet, and you've got to take them. Glutathione, and I'm coming for you now that we should all be taking glutathione all the time. We live in such a toxic world. And um, um, if you, I don't know if any of any of your blood tests along, we can interpret some of those. But um, if you've got a high bilirubin, then you're going to be low with fire. And what I've seen so often is so? bilirubin. Okay. I mean, uh, uh, bil bilirubin is one of the normal things that the liver part of normal metabolism. Um, um, to get rid of bilirubin is a process in the liver called glutaronidation. Some people haven't got that detox pathway, and they have something called Gilbert syndrome. Do you know what Gilbert syndrome? I think I've got a high I think I've got my blood test. 10% of the population has your risk It's actually very common. I'm very like, sensitive to drugs. Well, that might be part of it. Yeah. Because um, um, you will be told by your doctor, oh, 10% of the population have it, you can ignore it. You'll go jaundice very easily, but don't worry about it. It means you're a slow detoxifier. So you are more susceptible to toxic stress. So the organophosphate poison farmers I saw, 30% of the population have your risk 
again, Rose was wearing was showing some of those people with sodium toxide of greater risk of Parkinson's. And she measured their detoxification by giving the drug, which is ice cream, which will help rapidly with um, metabolizing excretors and slow excretors have a high risk of Parkinson's. So, um, um, so if I've got something to go with syndrome or high and I say, well, you definitely need glutathione because you can metabolize um, bilirubin via turning pathway, the glutathione pathway. And what do I see? I see the bilirubin levels coming down like this. So the glutathione pathway, the glutathione pathway, oh, yeah. which is and glutathione, very cheap, uh, very well tolerated. Can you give you some low bilirubin, but are highly Bilirubin is only marked with one pathway. So, um, yeah. so my view is we should all be taking glutathione. Mm -hmm. Don't spend money on expensive tests, just everybody do it. And, um, um, and chemical sensitivity goes with toxicity. If you've got chemical sensitivity, it's because you've been poisoned. And again, it's, this is the immune system behaving normally. Because the immune system is, I think of the immune system as a mobile brain. You know? it's, it's the brain cells throughout the body recognizing goodies, recognizing baddies, and kicking the baddies out before um, uh, they cause problems. And how do they kick them out? With inflammation. Mm -hmm. uh, if you get poisoned by something, the immune system will recognize that poison and think, right, well, well, the next time we see that poison, we'll react with inflammation and get rid of it. But of course, inflammation is designed to get rid of bacteria <coughs> and yeast and viruses. It's not designed to get rid of in, in, uh, chemicals. And so you may get up this horrible inflammation, which is inappropriate and damaging. And chemical sensitivity is a real big problem. Uh, and we don't have any simple answers to it other than do your best to avoid, um, do your best to detox, um, and, uh, and maybe desensitize it doesn't work terribly well. It's a real big thing to have. Because the body just hasn't got the mechanism to get rid of chemicals. Well, it's yeah. an, well, we have got mechanisms to get rid of chemicals mm -hmm. because we're used to dealing with toxins in the gut. If you get an overwhelming exposure, mm. like the farmers who've been dipping sheep, or the farmer that's been working in um, poisonous gases, because there's so much fire retardants and chemicals in buildings that yeah. when they, they burn these days, you know, there's a very severe poisoning. There's a 9 11 syndrome amongst the farmers who, uh, farms, the farmer who were uh, uh, fighting under the blazes uh, there. They all became acutely sick. There's a Gulf War syndrome, mm. which is, we know that is chemically driven. Um, there's a sick building syndrome. Which is partly chemically um, driven, but they're also with sick buildings, and there's also a mold issue with the, with the blood clot syndrome. There's also uh, an infectious issue because they're using biological warfare. Mm. So, but the immune system reacts in the same way with inflammation to try and get rid. And it's an inappropriate reaction to chemical sensitivity because that's not a good way of getting rid of chemicals, but it's the only one that the immune system knows to use. Yes, we have got other methods. That's why sauna sweating is so good. Okay. Um, that's why I love people to do regular Epsom salt baths or regular sauna therapies or fire and bread saunas or whatever, right. because that's a, we know that's a proven benefit. It reduces our toxic load, yeah. and we should all be doing that probably all the time if we don't get cancer and heart disease and all the rest. So, so it's not like the infrared. It's an hour and a half round trip, etc. Oh, yeah, yeah. I don't know if it's crazy. So we're renting on seventeen pounds a week. But I mean, you can buy a, a fire and bread blanket. Um, you can get them cheap, but there are things that's one. And that works brilliantly well. You can have, you can put the supper in it. They can be lying down, um, so it be part of their dressing thing. And the fire and bread is also very good for mitochondria. That's mitochondria. So again, it's not one of those glorious not the fire and bread. Fire and bread. Fire and bread. Sorry. Did you spell that? F I R. Yeah. Right. It's in the books. Yeah. Yeah. But, they, but the point is, you see, the sick ME patients don't tolerate it. You put them in a sauna and they feel. Now, the joy of fire and bread and have your own at home is it just warms up the subcutaneous tissue so you don't increase your temperature too much. It literally boils <coughs> off the toxins that into the fat onto the lipid down on the surface of the skin, and then you have to shower off afterwards to wash it off. If you don't wash it off afterwards, it just goes straight back into the skin. Um, and back to the skin. So it's tolerated than the Yes, it's much better tolerated because you're not increasing the core temperature. And most of the stuff comes out in the first five or ten minutes. So little and often, little and often. Um, 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 and as I say, it's a program. So I've now collected 32 patients, I think, who've had tests before and after the heat imaging. Now, you might say, gosh, you've had 100 patients. Why should you've got more patients? The answer is, 
I don't do tests anymore because I'm not doing tests on people so that I can show on my lovely audit that it works. I know it works because the statistics are so powerful. And um, you know, the levels come down reliably well. And roughly speaking, 50 heating sessions will halve your body load. Now, you never get it to naught. Why? Because we live in a toxic world. So it comes up exponentially. And if you're a mathematician, basically 50 will halve it. And then another 50 will get 25%. Another 50 will get 12%. Another 50 will get 6%. You know, so it gradually, gradually comes down. And my guess is we probably need about one a week to maintain the safety Now, um, you don't have to have a sauna, you can do any heating regime you do. But if you're an athlete, you can run and, and, and then shower at the end of it. And my daughter lives in Paris, that's what she likes to do. She goes to the farm, has a shower, that's good enough for her. Um, if you've got the energy to just <coughs> hop normally and shower, you know, one of the best things my Emily patients do is go for a sun, sunshine and sea holiday. Why? Lots of lovely sunshine, they're getting warm, they're in the water, they're out the water, they're in the water, they're out the water, all the infrared, no moles, they feel very mild. I'd much rather they spend money on a holiday like that than on some fancy test to show them one little problem. So, you know, what I'm trying to say is don't think you've got to have the test to get well. You don't need them. Just put the regimes in place and do them in the right order. And, and as you get more well, you can build on that and pour more stuff into it. And yeah, it is hard work. Hard work. And it's a bumpy ride. You get what I call DDD reactions. I bet you've seen my page on my website. But DDD stands for di detox and die-off reactions. Because you get worse. So there's a lovely meme that Craig found for me. He put on the website. So, you know, your vision of recovery is that it's a nice, smooth path. And, you know, bing, you arrive at the little flag that you get on there uh, that you arrive. But actually what happens is you do the diet, oh, and you fall into the, you know, the key tip of you call like that, oh, you fall into the deep reaction. You make one, you call like that, then you start getting bugs, oh, you get a hurt from the reaction, and on you go. So you just have to know that what you're doing is right and hang on in there and do the regimes as well as you can without making yourself too sick. Can I just ask one question? Because you're talking about um, the importance of getting them in the right order. Yeah. So, for example, you start, say you start doing that, I mean, I'm not on a keto diet at the moment, I'm yeah. kind of mainly. But not, yeah. You know, okay. Um, how long would you sort of do that before you would start adding in? Or is that all written in? No, no, no. no, 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 no because okay, my ideas are yeah. moving on faster than my books. Yeah. Published a letter. Now I, I finished ecological medicine last May, and it's still not published. So right. So it said, but as soon as you're in ketosis, yeah. Then you know, uh, and then you get up to speed with vitamin C, and that stops your gut fermenting, and you can do that in a couple of days. Mm -hmm. And then suddenly you're being able to absorb a bit of the supplements. So some right. of the mitre regimes, because people come to say, oh, I've been taking this supplement and have made the blinds with this. I on a keto diet? No. I've been there, you know. So, um, and you don't come, need to come to an expensive doctor who lives bloody miles away to work that out. You know, it's, it's so, so. so that's why there's an order about it. And keto is missing minerals and. Absolutely. And all those things will trigger a detox because vitamin C pulls out heavy metals. Vitamin C kills microbes. And as soon as you start killing microbes from the gut and elsewhere, you get a time reaction. And you know, and you get keto flu, and it's a and, and it's a bloody miserable ride, or it can be a miserable mm. ride. I mean, actually, people are helping you with this because the carers should be doing this as well. <laughs> um, just feel better and better. And, more. and 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 you know, even just from the first few workshops I've had, a lovely email from people saying, "Oh, brain foggy brain's gone for the first time ever." I mean, foggy brain. There's two causes: that. yes, for energy delivery, but for many people, it's called the auto brewery syndrome. Guess what happens if I have a glass of wine? I get a foggy brain. You know, we all do. It's not rocket science. What's that? What kind of hinges in the middle? I've got two small children that I need to care for. I can't have a deal. I just can't have a deal. So I just need to minimize that. You know, I've known all the stuff for 10 years and I've been in the middle of it. What can you do to minimize it? Yeah, you can especially with the keto that's like. Oh, I start keeping all the gold masks. <laughs> no, 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 it doesn't last that um, I don't know a shortcut. Mm -hmm. I wish I did. And people ask me this energy. You know, is there a shortcut? And the answer is there isn't a shortcut. And this is why it's so difficult. There is, you know, I know the path to walk. I know the shortest path to getting well, but it's a hard one. And in terms of the blood denial, I'm almost terrified of it and pushing the maples into the wrong place. What in earth rubbish? I had this very I'm, conversation. I'm too much of that guy's stuff. No, I had this very conversation with um, Eleanor Blarock Bush, who runs the big trace element 
um, um, laboratory in Germany and it's called micro lab or something, but it's, it's, it's actually the uh, for grade third. And I met the company the other day, I put that very question to her. She said, they rubbish all this stuff out, oh, GMSC, have be careful, it takes mercury into the brain and through the She said, not. It's pulling it out constantly through the urine. If you're reducing the blood, rather than just simple diffusion, will bring it, you know, from other parts into the blood in, and then you get rid of it. And you won't get rid of heavy metals with sweating regimen. You get rid of everything else. You get rid of pesticides, volatile organic compounds. And I know that because I've been fat by up to, I have done fat biopsies, or transplant protein studies, or DNA adults, or whatever, and I see the level coming down the line as well. Toxic metals um, um, won't come out with the skin. You've got to use glutathione, minerals, um, uh, DMSA maybe. Um, I mean, clean heart reckons that clays in the gut work quite well, like toxoranthrella, but it won't come out with the sweating machine. What does that stand for? Uh, I don't know if it's a product of the fancy there is, but it's, it's, a, it's a synthetic, you know, like... Well, it works, it works, it works, it works, it works, it works, all clays are the same, you get the cheapest one, you get the cheapest one, yeah. What do elephants do, you know, you see the David Ashmore film, they go up into the mountains and they dig clay out there, but all clays are clays, and, and you get the same stuff, but they're all doing the same stuff, and, you know, we have to be very careful of, you know, are these fancy products just, you know, kind of and they've got a good set of a good marketing techniques. So the only stuff that works. Like that. The clay in the box, can you do my drop of the clay in the box? Uh, the clay won't take it. The clay is a solid thing. You won't get in through the skin. You've got to swallow the stuff. Yeah. Um, so, um, uh, and again, if you swallow it, what you have to remember is that it grabs everything. It doesn't just grab the baddies, it grabs the goodies as well. So if you're going to take clay, why use this? It's not a toxic offense, which is you know, um, fairly reasonable. Three grams, lasting night on empty stomach. So it doesn't take all the goodies out. So don't take it don't take it to minerals, you can just grab the goodies and, um, uh, and not the baddies. Well, yeah. Can you talk a little bit about the sea and the bad effects of the people that show you? Well, the, uh, I mean, the joint vitamin C is, um, the potential for damage is zero. I mean, it is fabulously safe for us. Um, humans are in a category of their own because humans are the only, humans, fruit bats, and guinea pigs are the only mammals that can't make their own vitamin C. So the reason why we've got Nancy isn't going to get coronavirus or flu or get ill, because she can make her own vitamin C. So, and goats can, I mean, studies being done in goats, showing they will produce 15 grams a day of vitamin C in response to you know, an infectious threat. Humans can't do that. We have to eat our own vitamin C. It's a biochemical error that you know, happens for goodness knows when. Um, and, um, um, uh, and, and the dose of vitamin C is the critical bit. The best form of vitamin C and the cheapest is the sporting that's myself. I've got 500 kilograms, 500 gram bags, um, um, which will last you a long time. And the key is with this. People want to be told, how much vitamin C have I got to take? And that's just hardly no. Um, the bare mineral would be five grams a day. Now that's 5,000 milligrams. The recommended daily amount of vitamin C is 30 milligrams. That will stop you getting scurvy, but it won't stop you dying from coronavirus. Vitamin C will stop you dying from coronavirus. Make sure the GMC um, uh, over here is that because they will love it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, I've just done a handout about coronavirus and how to prevent it. Craig, my lovely Craig, who helps me, is, is editing it because you know, um, he writes much better than I do, so he's genius it up and then it's on the website and I'll send it out The coronavirus, you know, no need to die from it. We're all going to get it. How do I know that? Because it's infectious before people get symptoms. It's rising exponentially already. So. Don't think you're not going to get it, you will get it. But with vitamin C and with iodine and keep it in that, you will be absolutely as right as well. You will not die from it. So what's the, you know, the principles of treating acute infection? And again, we should all be doing this all the time. And just jump sideways to give you some logic here. Um, as I, I was writing a book called The Infection Game, which is this somewhere, and um, it came to me that there are kind of three levels of intervention that I'm putting all the time. And I call these levels groundhog packages. Why groundhog is that film? You know, groundhog day when it's a time loop and the guy keeps coming back to the same old stuff again and again and again. And you know, I talk groundhog all the time because I'm talking the same things all the time. But there, I say there are three levels of it. Now there's what I call groundhog basic. That's what we should all be doing all the time to optimize our health, to live to 120 years potentially, and then drop off the end, you know, very sharply. That's how I would do it. 
now. I know I'm not going to get hung for years because um, my family history of early demise is very bad. So my, my problem probably ain't that good, but I'll settle for hunting. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so there's groundhog basic, which is the ketogenic diet, the basic package of supplements, didn't see five grams at night, use the thigh on, you know, sauntering once a week. That's the, the basic package that we should all be doing just to stay well. But then we have what I call groundhog acute. Now we know all pathology has an infectious virus. Dementia, all cancers have got an infectious state, it might be a virus, it might be a bacteria. Um, um, heart disease has infectious virus. And when do these infectious get into us? They get into us with flus, with sexually transmitted diseases, um, you know, um, uh, with you know, vaccinations, dare I say. That's when the bugs get into our body. And we know they've got into our body because we get symptoms. So if you get, if you get coronavirus, it starts with a little thickening in the throat, you know, and then a bit of a sneeze, and then a cough, and, and then you feel feverish. And the point is, is that's when the virus is getting into the body or is starting to really replicate the numbers. And you have to hit it hard then. So groundhog acute is all about hitting infections hard and hitting it early. Now, hopefully you're already doing groundhog basic, so you're on the ketogenic diet already. But the two most important infections. The first, take the disease bowel problems. And the idea there is you take 10 grams every hour until you get diarrhea. And people are terrified. Oh, it's a massive dose of vitamin Oh, could I call down? Didn't you see? Very closely related to sugar. You think nothing has to do with sugar. They do that, need a monk bar. And I think that's fine. And then suddenly 50 grams of vitamin C, oh, that's terribly dangerous, but you know, I said vitamin C is a lot safer than sugar. So, yes, they're big doses according to what we've been led to believe is, is, is good. But you know, in, in the context of how the body is, they are not big doses. And then, those lots of people are very inside the body. Absolutely. Take it, kids. But, you know, um, and, until you get diarrhea. And getting diarrhea is a very good thing when you are in a state. Why? As much the thyroid load is in the gut. And if you sweep them out, get rid of them, physically displace them, before they have a chance to invade, you are, you know, reducing the energy. It's a little bit, you know, like if Napoleon, you know, invaded England, um, you know, in the, whatever it is, 1806 or something, what's the best one? Blast them off the beaches, you know. I mean, obviously, Nelson's Navy is all about don't even know you put holes, you know. So, but if you're on the beach, you blast them off the beach. Don't wait until you move into the Tower of London to grab the town town tour. It's going to be much more difficult to get rid of them there. Exactly the same as any effect. Blast them off the beach before they, before they have a chance to get rid of it. And don't be afraid to big dose of vitamin C and you can get diarrhea. In fact, my daughter is aware of what she said. She said, um, uh, premature, in, in this is respect to coronavirus, premature crapping. It's preferable for premature for croaking. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what I'm going to do with the vitamin C. And then the other fantastic thing is that it's a bit of a nut. It's a bit of a nut, but feel your feel done and basic. We talked about a minimum of five pounds. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a slightly different process of it. Yeah, it is. Um, and, 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 uh, and we'll come around to the cube, which is another group of it. But yeah, so if you're just normally well, five pounds. Um, um, if you come acutely ill, groundhog is cute. But if you come chronically ill or age, because guess what? You know, all age is associated with the increasing infectious load and why temperature is going to grow. We can face groundhog chronic. So I do groundhog chronic because I want to do it for long and I want to pull off these my at or whatever. So, um, so you know, as we get older, the imperative to do these things better increases. Why do we have a why chemistry just becomes a little bit better? And you know, we've all made mistakes in the past. You know, uh, you know, who hasn't you know, picked up some infection or some bug or some sexually transmitted disease or whatever at some stage in they're all being vaccinated. So we're all carrying infections. And of course, one of the biggest infections that everybody forgets about is retrovirus. We've all, we all have our own retrovirus. I mean, about 7, maybe 15 cents by DNA is made up of retrovirus. And if our immune defense would go down, the retrovirus prevails, and that, and that causes the leukemia and the infection. There's many people with those diseases, their endogenous retrovirus starts to come to life and start to do the But there's another bit to the coronavirus story that you mustn't forget. This is the next tool. And again, you should all go away and one of these for your family. Because vitamin C kills from the inside out, and iodine kills from the outside in. And it's a fantastic tool. Cheap, easy, anybody can do it. 
Now, this is just a fault line. It's got the plastic bottle key from okay? Um, and um, the way that you administer the ID, you get some new gold ID, which is um, that 30 mil, I think it's about 70, it will last a jolly long time. So the cover box in there, like that. Give it a bit of a shake to stop it before you break at the bottom, and then snip it. So what I do is I've got my finger like that, like that. And it coats the um, airways, sinuses, lungs, throat, the whole lot. You can smell the stuff going in, and it contact kills everything. And again, this is revolution my practice, revolutionized my practice because it's cheap, it's easy, anybody can do it. Potential side effects still. ID multitask, also detoxes. Um, uh, we're all ID efficient. Great for the thyroid, great for the breath. Um, it helps to detox the patient. The last one when it's a real multi-passing tool. So you know, snip it maybe 15, 10, 15 times, um, two or three times. So if you've been exposed, if you think you've been exposed to somebody, you need to be sneaking whatever. Blast it out. Now, it won't stop you getting infected by the glass, and that is desirable because that will educate and but instead of being invaded by hundred thousand of the metabolic group, you're invaded by a hundred of them. So the immune system has a good practice of shooting lots of beaters and killing them and learns from the next exposure, um, but it doesn't treat, it's not much to treat. So what these things are doing, vitamin C, and they're not, the immune system is still learning, still exposed, just you know, um, speeding up the arm itself, improving the potential. So there's a really cheap thing, I call it the ACO, and it costs just an increase. So, you, know, you don't want you and your family to give it, put one here, take that away, you use it. She was eating it, what well, it's going to be. Ah, 
You make up a very nutritious tube feed yourself with the grace coconut milk, which gives you the fat and the energy. 
uh, we need some protein, we need some minerals, but um, um, just cut out all the carbs. As soon as you cut out the carbs, she'll stop fermenting because that pain is bacterial and fungal colonization of the stomach and, um, 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 and the acid that goes with that. We're seeing epidemics at the moment of esophageal reflux. And in fact, you know, the, the cardinal symptom of upper fermenting gut is burping, um, bloating, esophageal reflux, you know, heartburn, all that sort of stuff. And if you've got that, it's almost pathognomonic of um, upper fermenting gut. Treatment, as we've, as we've discussed. I've had several patients who've been, I've now had three patients who've been diagnosed with Barrett's esophagus. Now, Barrett's esophagus is a pre malignant esophagus. We know it's going to move on to cancer esophagus sooner or later. And the treatment is, oh, well, we do an endoscopy every six months, and when we detect cancer, we'll take your esophagus out. I mean, it's hardly a treatment, is it? You know, it's a, it's a terrible prospect. And all three have done a ketogenic diet, taken conceived bowel tolerance, and guess what? The barrett esophagus has disappeared. They've been cured. Now, two of them have said to their doctor, you know, um, what do you think, you know, uh, was made the difference there? And the doctor said, um, we must have got the diagnosis wrong in the first time. <laughs> <laughs> doesn't fit my paradigm, so I don't think it's exactly. yeah. it not true. It doesn't fit. Exactly. <laughs> or aren't you lucky or something like that? And you, you started telling us about the chronic pressure you were going to yes. say, and is that the ketogenic facility? Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, uh, and, yeah, and so it, you have to do everything with greater acidity. So, you know, um, um, and with the groundhog, <coughs> I would say, Take it from the seat of tolerance all the time. Don't just take the five grams, you know, as a basic package, but take the bowel tolerance all the time. And um, um, so, of course, you know, I don't ask my patients to do anything without doing it myself. So um, I thought, well, I've got to get this. And this was some years ago. And I thought I was doing a good piece of it. I thought I was you know, doing it all right. And my bowel tolerance vitamin C was 35 grams a day, which shocked me. Now, actually, that gives us useful information. Because your, your bowel tolerance of vitamin C gives you a good handle on how healthy you are. So, you know, if you've got, um, you know, no toxins and no infections and no fermenting gut, then it's going to be about 5 to 15 grams. Um, but what that tells me is I wasn't going to keep any bowel tolerance. I did have some fermentation gut. Maybe I was toxic. Maybe I had some infection. Over a few days, it came down, and it's now about 8 or 10 grams a day. Now, you'll be pleased to hear. You don't have to get have diarrhea all the time to work out if you're at bowel tolerance test. Because um, 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 the <coughs> idea here for bowel tolerance is to take enough um, vitamin C to kill the grams of, friendly, of unfriendly microbes from entering the upper gut, but not the kilograms of friendly microbes in the large bowel. So if you, over, if, you, if you take too much, some vitamin C gets into the large bowel and starts to kill some of the friendly microbes then, which get fermented by the other friendly microbes and gives you foul smelling wind. So um, that's a very good clue. If you start producing foul smelling wind, then you overdose your vitamin C. You should produce some wind because you know, farting is normal, and you should. And that happens when you ferment with the friendly bacteria, you ferment fiber in the large bowel. Now that ferments to methane and hydrogen, which don't smell. So yep, you might fart, but you won't clear the room. Um, if you want to see if you're producing methane, then you can put a match to it. I don't recommend that, <laughs> <laughs> but it is flammable. <laughs> so that's a nice cheap test for when you've got the right sort of thing. <laughs> 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 is there a similar time limit if you're doing keto as to when you're then not taking into gut? Well, it happens very quickly. And it should happen within a few days if you're doing vitamin C as well. Um, in fact, again, when I was researching for um, the infection game, I thought to myself, I wonder if anyone's used vitamin C to treat the hemocratic pylori, which that's, that's the bug that all gastroenterologists do know about. It's the one that's associated with duodenal nazis. And, uh, and the treatment of it is vicious. You know, it's high duty, heavy dose antibiotics for you know, two weeks to try and clear it. And I found a Polish study where they looked at 90 old patients and they just treated them with vitamin C. Now, I have to say, the regime they put in place, I thought to myself, no chance in hell of making a difference. They weren't ketogenic, they were eating normal, you know, Western diet, and they had five grams of vitamin C. That was their daily dose. I thought, no chance. 30% of them were cured. Now, with the antibiotics and all that stuff, you get to about 80 or 90%. But 30% without being dark, to my mind, is an incredible result. You know, I'm hugely impressed. 
So again, if I have any hint of up fermenting up like bacteria, by yeast, by um, Brassicus is harmless, by the heat of that or always start giving this in. You have a jolly good chance of getting yourself a successful bacteria. And take it in like bronze. It's going to be. Okay. And it's an empty, most people have an empty stomach by then, so there's the vitamin C. It's going to sit in there all night and be gradually absorbed and do lots of good systemically. Um, let's just take that. Doesn't matter. Thank yeah. you. Powder's the cheapest. Powder's the cheapest. Yeah. Um, but if you've got, any, if you've got you know, a, a, a coronavirus lurking, little and often through the day. So actually, what I do is I put my daily dose in that. Um, and I like fizzy water, so um, uh, by the end of the day, I slurp my way through it. So I have little enough to do today, and I know I can have about eight grams in there without feeling the room. Um, and then if I've got that first hint of an infection or something, then I blast around the top pipe as well. As a result of which, I do get cold, but they're very mild, and they last less than 24 hours. So when everybody else in the office, because I can't take my girls to do this, just blows me away. They were all my secretaries around me, and they're still sniffing and you know, They're off for a week with a cold or something, and I haven't had a, I haven't missed a day of work um, since I qualified. The only days I miss is when I break my neck on the first and the second occasion, but not the third occasion. <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, uh, I'm staying ahead of the infection when you come to um, the vitamin C I have doesn't really dissolve very well unless I mix it with hot water. Um, is it ascorbic acid? Um, it's the big orange tubs from Holland and Barrett. I don't know well, I don't know what other crap they put in there. But, yeah. but if you eat it, I mean, I, yeah. I've got some uh, bags of vitamin C here. So if anybody wants to take away vitamin C with them, um, but I just use this stuff. <coughs> I can't see why I should wake them up. Um, uh, I mean, we can, I can talk all day on sleep, so we can we can talk about that if you like. Because sleep is really, really, really important. Um, but the commonest disturber of sleep, um, to well, there are three common disturbers that come and come again. One is metabolic syndrome, which I know Two is thyroid and adrenal problems, and we'll talk about that now. And three is inflammation. Your brain, brain doesn't sleep. Um, in fact, I went to a seminar by Klinghart on Saturday, and he reckons that he's another doctor like me, functional medicine, one of the guys. Um, the, the majority of patients with dementia have got Lyme in their brain, Lyme disease. But you know, it's very difficult to detect them now, and the tests are not good now. But the German tests all right, the army. Yes. Armin is a very good guy. Right. Um, his tests are completely reliable. He's on the side of the gods. He's doing all the right things. He's asking the right questions. I've just applied to the Lime because it's open to something. Fantastic. Well, um, yeah, we know it's kind of Armin or? Armin Labs. Oh, Armin Labs, sorry. Yeah. I've got another website up called Natural Health Worldwide, NHW. And the idea of that is just to put people in contact with each other. But on that is details of how you get in touch with labs um, um, for accessing all these tests. And some of them need a practitioner and some of them you just get yourself. Um, it's very helpful. Um, and, if you, it, and, and also on that website are people who are NHW practitioners who might be doctors like me. They might be, have a, a health qualification. They might be acupuncturists or osteopaths or whatever. Or they might be experienced patients. And you guys, after today, you're all going to be experienced patients in their diet. And you might be able to help somebody you know, on the way. Some people work on that for nothing. Some people are charged for their time. But you, it tells you what's what. But the, you access the website for nothing and all the information is there, obviously free. So um, that's another place to look for if you want help. But the best way to do it is to do it yourself and learn all these techniques. Let's talk um, about that one. Sorry. I'm sorry, I was going to say the arm test though. So somebody told me last night that the NHS uh, GPs don't recognise, so they won't actually treat you. But I know. Like, well, you know. I mean, everybody's been there. You know, it's not the NHS, it's the NHS consultants. They have this ridiculous notion oh, it's a private test, it's not valid. Nonsense. You know, these labs all have to be validated internationally. I'm going to stick every possible single box of quality and um, that is, is costly to tick. Um, so, them saying that is absolutely wrong. What I can tell you is that you know, I've had several of my patients go to Get, get asked for NHS tests for Lyme disease, the tests go to Porton Down. Yeah. I've only ever seen one positive come out of that. Uh, negative. Well, there you go. So well, tests that they do, negative. Yeah. Voila. You know why? 
I, I don't know why, but you know, you know, Porton Downs a nasty secret place, and they're only gonna let out what they want to let out. So I just don't trust them. No, to, to I, produce well, I guess that's the problem. Is if you then get from um, paying for the land, then how do you get it? Yeah, that's what you get to well, I mean, well, we'll be able to do it for your site or well, what you have to remember is that you know I I've been treating any patients since the early 1980s, and um, lots of them do very well, and some of them have to have Lyme disease. The point is, if you can get your immune system in a sufficiently good shape, it'll kick it out on its own. You know, Lyme disease doesn't mean you've got to have those antibiotics to get rid of it. Um, I mean, uh, clean heart tends to treat it with herbs. And he has various you know, lotions and potions that he uses and get apparently gets good results. And again, bless him. You look up his clean heart protocols, he's got all his protocols online where he gives us you know what you need. And like, it's not Sorry, I mean, it's heard, clean heart, Dietrich Clean Heart, K L I N G H A R D T. Sorry, he's one of the good guys. I've got that right. clean K L I N G, yeah, H A R D T. Oh, he's yeah. another bit from coffee. <laughs> and, that's, and that's my ration for the day. <laughs> yes, I think yes, we do. Yeah, and if you, I mean, I, 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 I see, I can chat all day. If you want to have a break, do you need a break? Yes. Okay. We'll just shoot off any time. I'll just keep rabbiting, but we'll, we'll let you catch up with me. Um, so you mentioned inflammation was um, sleep, and that kind of caused a problem. Um, what? How can you sort of? Reduce that because I think that's my problem. Okay. Well, in the short term, if I've got somebody who really doesn't sleep, yeah. I give them the pills. Right. Yeah. But um, the deal is, um, if you're going to have the pills, you know, which might be prescription hypnotics or over counter hypnotics, you've got to put all the other stuff in place. Now, there's chapters on this in the chronic kind of book. Yeah. But um, first, we've got to think because if your blood sugar is going up and down, um, um, you're going to be disturbed by adrenaline. Secondly, thyroid, adrenal, and circadian rhythm. Now, again, um, this used to be a doctor's only area, and now you can do it yourself. Why? Because we've got glandulars, and these are effective, and you can buy them. You don't need retro doctors to get in the way. I've got some here today you can take away if you so wish. But it's, um, our circadian rhythm is determined primarily by light. Do you know, I was reading. Such an interesting book about the moment, about Edward III. And um, he was um, a fantastic king. And he was um, um, one of the first people to appreciate the need for a clock. What I had realized is up until then, the day had been divided into 12 hours of darkness and 12 hours of lightness. And during the summer, the hours of the day got longer because <laughs> the days were longer and the hours of the day were shorter and vice versa. Do you know, I never knew that until this morning. You, you obviously knew that. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's amazing. It's crazy. Well, it's, it's sort of logical and crazy all at once. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, um, um, our body doesn't remember telling you the light. So we have light landing on our skin. And you cannot be full spectrum light. I mean, sitting, you know, guess what? You know, primitive man evolved running naked under the African sun. So the more you know, full spectrum light you get, the better. I'm so privileged because when I work at home, you know, I don't work in the server anymore. I work in my office, which has got you know, windows on three sides, and I work better in there. I know my brain works better in there. I can keep up the, you know, um, uh, the yapping, you know, entity uh, in that lovely light environment. Uh, so light is really important. What, and then as soon as it starts to go dark, that switches on the production of melatonin, which is the sleep hormone, as you know. Now melatonin doesn't make you sleepy, but without melatonin, you haven't got the right hormone in the environment to sleep. So don't think it will knock you out like, you know, the Zimmerman job it was, but it just gives you the right hormone environment. And then at mid, about midnight, blood levels of TSH spike. So the TSH comes from the pituitary, and TSH stimulates the thyroid gland. And then about four o'clock in the morning, your blood levels of T4 spike or come up, and that is a fairly inactive part of the thyroid hormone production. And then at five o'clock in the morning, your T3 comes up, because T4 gets converted to T3, and that spikes, and that, that kicks the adrenal glands into light. And about six or seven o'clock, the adrenal hormone spike, the cortisol, the adrenaline, the DHA, and that wakes you up. So there's a you know, there's a tiny back, there's an orchestra about it, and that's the normal state of affairs. But if you don't get that daylight exposure, you know, the conductor the orchestra doesn't work. You know, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't chime in at the right time. And so getting out there, you know, walking, 
Um, just being in the sunshine, I mean, I hate to see sick ME patients indoors and in darkened rooms, and, you know, um, because it's just, it's solitary confinement in the dark, you know. They're, it's bizarre time, so get them in a sleeping bag <coughs> and get them outside in a stretcher if possible. And, oh, right, they say, oh, I don't like the bright light, they'll put glasses on or whatever. But just getting out there in that light is so, so important. Well, that's the sort of level. Oh, yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll come on to that. No okay. mm -hmm. It's like, a very interesting, interesting question. Going. There's a very interesting question. There was an article in New Science about that who, who reckoned that the most light sensitive um, department of bodies were back in the knees. Mm -hmm. And on the back of that, <coughs> they were <coughs> advocating that travellers who, who, who travel regularly put lights on the back of their knees to get their circadian rhythm back. Very strong Oh, that's it. That's interesting. Thank you for that. <laughs> Um, so, um, so it's not doesn't have to be through the eyes. So, for example, people who are born blind, they have a normal state in the eye that accords with the light. It's something because they avoid wearing sunglasses. Um, uh, I'm not sure about that. I'm not sure about that. Um, uh, I mean, again, I know I'm jumping sideways now, but we shouldn't. We, we should be trying not to wear glasses because they weaken our eyes. Now, I've been chatting with it's a lovely doctor I chatted with who's, who's coming to stay at Upper West in the summer called um, Yosem Mendonca, who's the most brilliant surgeon you have ever come across in your life. He's using stem cell therapy and reconstructive surgery and rubber dentistry. He's just a, a, a wizard. But we got on the subject talking about eyes because I was saying, oh, vitamin C is fantastic. Because since I've been taking vitamin C to bowel problems, my eyesight has improved. So I now no longer need glasses to read. I have a bright light, and sometimes I do that with very small. But they've got better. And he said, Oh, yes, he said, he said, in fact, the worst thing you can do is wear glasses. Why? Because they make the eyes lazy. Mm -hmm. They make the eyes lazy. And if you so if you have got, if you do need glasses for whatever, wear get a pair of glasses a half a diopter weaker than you actually need, and then your body eyes will adjust to that. And then you get them half a diopter weaker again until your eyes adjust. And you keep going. He said, I've got mine from 4.5 diopters now, but down by I need half a diopter now to read. Mm -hmm. Because it pulls the whole eyeball into shape as you're focusing. And you know, guess what we're seeing? It's epidemics of it now, A glaucoma and B retinal detachment. Why? Because the eyeball is being, it's, it's, it's just going weak and floppy because that glass is allowing that to happen. So you're getting retinal detachment and glaucoma. And um, again, the vision C side of things, um, you know, we talked about energy, how much energy bits of the body consume. The most energy demanding part of the body is the back of the eye. So, as I mentioned earlier, the brain uses energy 10 times faster than the body. The retina uses energy 10 times faster than the brain. Why? Because the business of converting photons into a, a, a light, into an electrical signal that the brain can then interpret, is massive. So, there's massive energy generation going on at the back of the eye. And where you've got energy generation, you've got free radicals. And free radicals are driving a modern epidemic of cataracts and natural degeneration. What does vitamin C do? Watch them out. So, you want to keep your, maintain your eyes healthy so that you can still see when you get to home. Take vitamin C, bowel point, don't wear glasses. So, you can look at it as best you can. And I think all this stuff about sunlight damage in the eye. Take vitamin C and that. What about if you've got double vision and you're horizontal and you're vertical? Well, that is a neurological disorder and needs investigation in its own life. That's something you're just shaking around. I've got prisms in my glasses. Well, I would, I my advice to you is have the weakest possible prism you can get away with. Well, I don't know what they do. I don't know what they do. Okay. Well, I'm no expert on that, uh, but I'm just giving you a general. There's another reason for it. Um, I would think so. I don't know whether my father's is there. Yeah. Well, he worked in Saudi Arabia. His eyes were averagely okay, but he didn't wear sunglasses when he went out mm -hmm. and got the glare sand and the heat. And we came back and had uh, three or four differences. So he his blind uh, uh, lens afterwards. So he wasn't blind. But, if, uh, but I would say if you were taking vision to see the bowel pumps, that would have been hugely protective. Yeah, mm -hmm. what I'm thinking is that maybe something got burnt in the cones of the eye. I don't know. I don't yeah. know. I'd hate to say. Well, mm -hmm. well mm -hmm. just to.
a good fair point, fair point. I don't I know all the answers, but yeah. With the keto diet, um, how is it possible to avoid getting hypoglycemia and know you're getting that in the fish to avoid that? Um, you just have to eat enough fat. I mean, initially you will get the symptom of hypoglycemia. And the reason for that is um, um, as you stop eating carbohydrates, you go on to eating fat. Um, it takes a little while for the body to learn to fat burn. It takes a, a, at least one week and maybe two weeks. And during that time, the brain hasn't got the fuel because you're not eating the carbohydrates. So it will pour out adrenaline to, you know, to stimulate fat burning and to, you know, um, uh, to, 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 to provide fuel. And of course, the symptoms of hypoglycemia are not symptoms of hypoglycemia, they're symptoms of adrenaline. So if you're using adrenaline for fat burn, it feels like hypoglycemia, but actually you've got plenty of fuel there. So you're tested for benefits and not the same for anyone. Well, again, the tests for hypoglycemia are not, um, are not very helpful because, because if you did a one-off blood sugar, the, the problem with hypoglycemia is not the actual level of sugar in the blood, it's, it's the rate of change. So um, during the 1960s, when the treatment for epilepsy in children was a ketogenic diet and it worked incredibly well, um, um, they would look at their blood sugar and sometimes it would be low one millimole per litre and the children had no symptoms whatsoever. When people, if people come to my office for whatever reason um, and I do their blood, if, if they want to have a blood sugar and I measure it, the lab all too often rings me up and says, oh, they're dangerously hypoglycemic. You know, you couldn't detect the glucose in their blood, it was so low. You phone them up and tell them to have some glucose with it. I said, no, it's fine, they're only on So the point is, low blood sugar doesn't cause the symptom, it's the adrenaline that causes the symptom. And adrenaline responds not to the actual level of sugar in the blood, but the rate of change. So if you're running on carbs, your blood sugar's doing that. It's up and down, up and down. The rate at which it goes up, determines the insulin response. So if you have you know, a sweet drink and you drink very quickly, you'll get a big insulin response. You'll get a real high from it, you'll get a rush. And then if you get a lot of um, insulin produced, the blood sugar comes down very quickly. And it's the rate of the change of the blood sugar that determines the amount of adrenaline that's coming up. So if it's falling fast, you'll pour up adrenaline. But until the body learns to fat burn with thyroid hormones, it continues to use adrenaline and it takes about a week or two to learn to use thyroid hormones. Once it's learned to use thyroid hormones, you stop using adrenaline. You can back on the thyroid hormones and you can feel the body with ketones. If, if you still struggle with keto flu, as it's called, or then um, it's typical hypothyroidism. And at that point, you start thinking uh, metabolic lab risk. So let's talk about that because thyroid problems are big and they're very common. And uh, now you've got the tools of trade to sort it out yourself. You don't need me to get in your way. And you don't need any doctor to get in your way. In fact, if you go and ask a doctor about that, this thing TNC, sorry. Um, if, if you ask me a doctor about it, they will discourage you and tell you not to do it. But to do it, to do it properly and safely, you've got to do it right. Don't think you can have the thyroid hormones and go out, the, go out the room and do it. It just ain't like that. You've got to do the foundation stone. You've got to get keto adapted. Um, first, you've got to have some basic vitamins and minerals. You want the mitochondria to have some reasonable chance of working. Um, and so I'd suggest you know, a few, certainly a few weeks of mitochondrial supplements. Why? Because the way that the thyroid hormones work is they kick the mitochondria into life. And if you've got mitochondria that are malfunctioning and can't be kicked into life, then you know, you're in, the engine is screaming and, and not, it's not doing any good and you will get side effects and problems. So, yeah, I mean, I tried taking down hormones once and I got, I just got a kind of heart palpitation. Mm -hmm. I felt really... Okay. The reason for that yeah. is you're not keto adapted. Mm -hmm. And so what that means is your adrenaline levels are up and then they're down. So every time your blood sugar falls, you spike adrenaline. Now, adrenaline and thyroid hormones do very similar things. Adrenaline is the hormone that allows us to adapt from second to second, minute to minute, you know, activity. Mm -hmm. You know, T3 is, you know, over the hours and T4 is over the days, so, uh, you know, adjusting your the speed of your engines, if you like. So if you just throw in thyroid hormones when you're spiking adrenaline, of course you'll get side effects because you'll get the, the thyroid problem and the adrenal hormone on top. So you're, as if your heart had a huge kick from thyroid, a huge kick from the um, adrenaline, and yes, you'll get palpitations if you're carrying. So, so that's what you mustn't do because your thyroid hormones are really bad now. Right. So don't be frightened of them, do it properly. Now, thyroid hormones improve mitochondrial function in two ways. 
first of all, they, they, they run faster. And you've got to give those start that those mitochondria, the, the raw materials to run for faster, either ketogenic diet and some supplements and drinking crops, etc. But they also determine the number of mitochondria you've got. They determine the size of your engine. They determine how many mitochondria you've got in each cell. So it's the difference between a De Chabot and a Rolls Royce. And guess what? My Rolls Royce is in my cell. I don't want De Chabot's. Not because they're French, of course. <laughs> <laughs> um, they're just a little engine. There's 500 cc. <laughs> So, um, so that's why you've been used sour you've got to be keto adapted, and you've got to increase the dose very slowly. And I reckon to start off on 15 milligrams of meta V um, uh, um, a day, and increase in 15 milligram increments every two weeks, so very slowly. Most end up needing between 90 and 120 milligrams to do well. Is this on your website? I think so. Yeah. <laughs> if you look, um, uh, I've got a page which I call Conducting the Chronic Fatigue Syndrome Orchestra, which is all about this stuff, all about acting the dark, the mitosis, the thyroid, and the treatments. And again, if you've been, if you've had metabolic syndrome for years, you've been spiking adrenaline for years, your adrenals are going to be exhausted. And, um, um, and we can treat that with adrenal glandulars. And the one that I think is best value is the Swanson's adrenal glandular, very cheap. I've got some here if you want to try it. Some of my patients, if they really don't respond to that, I add in hydrocortisone. Now, hydrocortisone, you can buy over the counter as hydrocortisone and cream. The chemists sell it. You know, anybody can get it, you don't need a prescription. And um, one meal has 10 milligrams of um, hydrocortisone in it, and you need about 20 milligrams of that. So, two meals of hydrocortisone cream, rub them. Now, don't put it on the same bit of skin, but move it around. So, if, if you're really not getting the results with adrenal glandulars, then add in some hydrocortisone cream, not in that very much. Now, how do we measure all this? How do we measure progress? Think about energy giving. If you've got those four pairs I've mentioned, the sum total of those four pairs is your core temperature. So if your car is running perfectly, the heater will come on and be nice and warm in there. You know, what happens when I jump into my old truck first thing in the morning? It's probably freezing in there. You know, I've got to warm the whole thing up before. You know. same, same is true of the human body. So if all those four mechanisms are working fine, you will have a normal core temperature, which is 37 degrees centigrade. So um, this is so get the diet in place, get some mitosophenols in place, and then start measuring your core temperatures. Now the point here is your average core temperature reflects your thyroid function, and the fluctuations, the wobbles from second to second through or minute to minute to day, is reflected of your adrenal function. Now this isn't my work. This is the work of a guy called Dr. Ryan. There's a link on my website, his website. Now he doesn't mention. He doesn't talk about the. Um, um, uh, the diet and the mito bit. I suspect because he's not dealing with a lot of any patients, but I know that's got to be in place before the other stuff's going to work. Dr. Rand. Rind, R I N D. There's a link on my website to his stuff. Yes. And, um, um, Could you uh, just repeat the average core temperature is the. Uh, reflects the thyroid function. Thank you. And the wobbles reflect the adrenal function. Thank you. And, um, and so from measuring your core temperatures, and I don't say do it all the time, but have a window of time, say four days, when you do it several times a day, and that can be good average reading and good fluctuation. And then adjust the dose of thyroid or adrenaline. Now most end up metabolic needing 90 to 120 milligrams, some more, some need less. With the adrenals, most need 350 to 700 milligrams, sometimes a bit more. Um, if you're not getting the result of that, add in some high cream. But the interesting thing about this, if despite doing all this, your temperature is still all over the place, I think that's the body trying to run a feed to deal with infection. So we then have to say, well, what about the infectious hole in the, in the energy body? And so we can start looking at that side. Does this person have a chronic infection? If so, you know, is it viral? Is it bacteria? Is it fungal? Um, and we get clues from history as to where to look, what tests to use. But the treatment is you start off with groundhog chronic, you know, all roads lead to Rome. It's the same old stuff. Um, you know, um, hack the numbers back and give the new system half the chance to do the job itself. So, would a consistency, so my body temperature is consistently between 35.5 and 36. Well, you're far too low. So, what, what does that mean? You're low. Is that what it means is your sum total of all energy delivery mechanisms are down. Right. Now, I can't tell from looking at it if it's the diet or the mitochondrial engine or the thyroid or the adrenal. Right. It's probably a combination of both. You start with the diet. Right. Get PK adapted. How do you know you PK adapted? Because you're blowing on the breakfast. Okay. 
Then you get up speed with vitamin C mm. to make sure your gut is fermenting, and that then allows you to absorb the supplements. So right. you get the basic mito supplements in place. Okay. okay. Give those a few weeks to work because you know it takes that sort of a few weeks to get up to that, and then start looking at your core temperatures again. Now, just doing that might sort them. Yeah. But if they're still low despite that, you ask yourself, is it low average mm -hmm. temperature or is it major volume? What I also certainly recommend people do is check your heart, check your blood pressure as well to make sure you're not overdosing. Because the last thing I want is one of you guys who overdose with power hormones, get you know, a tacky dyspnea, go along to an endocrinologist, and, and, and then never leave gets banned from the market and you wreck it for everybody else. Mm -hmm. okay. At the moment, you can get this stuff online fairly, fairly inexpensively and you don't need a prescription. You can do this. <coughs> Believe you me, there are tens of thousands of people out there already doing it. And the British Star, is it British Star Charity, BBS, are a great group of people, very supportive online and, and can help. And again, they're keeping strong around this because mm -hmm. the last thing you want to do is lose a valuable resource. Can I ask a question about taking temperature? What's the best thing? Because we've well, got one, I don't, I don't trust it. Um, well, I, I use the digital one, it's a very easy one. Uh, well, that's really good. But what you want to do is just, just do a couple of a core temperature, which is you know, per rectum. Now, the Germans love talking about bottoms and the English don't sort of thing, but um, just to see what the difference is. But between the difference between your under the tongue or your ear should be about half a degree. Right. Um, and you know, the normal temperature. Some people say 7, some people say 7.1, but um, so under the tongue, it gets to about 36.6, 36.7, you're not far off. You're going to be there. Could I ask you again? You said about measurements and measurements. What was the agreement on one? About 350. Um, to 700. Now again, remember, when you bring these things in, you will trigger another DVD reaction. Like, or not, not that, but a detox will possibly hurt the reaction. So be nice to yourself. You know. I can't afford to make you all ill, and you certainly don't want to be trundled off a casualty with some horrible heart disease. So be nice to yourself and do it gently, because it's going to be a bumpy ride. Especially if you've got two kids to look after, um, you know, you can't afford to be, you know, awful. Um, I mean, really, you know, you need to be in a situation where you're being cared for, not you're caring for too old. And I do understand your life gets in the way. But, you know, I wish I could give you a shortcut to come. <coughs> what I can tell you is this is the most efficient way to get there. Because believe you know, me, I've done it wrong for 35 years, and I now know how to do it right. Or at least the starting point. I mean, I still learn new stuff all the time, as you can imagine. But this stuff from the, um, the IV, how much does that help the thyroid? You mm. expect the adrenal you know, um, if, if you had hypothyroidism because of iodine deficiency, it would be very helpful. Mm. And guess what? The whole of Europe's iodine deficient. Mm. But there are so many reasons for poor thyroid function. I mean, we're knocking out our thyroid by fire retardants, by polybrenos, by phenols, by heavy right. metals, by viruses. So you know, it might help some. And autoimmunity. I mean, we're seeing epidemics of autoimmunity. Why? Vaccination different. Mm. Okay. Vaccinations, in theory, great idea, but the 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 practical reality is a disaster. Mm. And uh, I see so many patients with ME who have either been triggered um, by vaccination or made relapses triggered. The, the dirtiest vaccine of all is HPV. Do not let your kids have HPV vaccinations. It yeah. is a disaster. Oh. I know. I mean, it's manslaughter sort of, as far as I'm concerned. It was. It's, it's, and this is why I started the charity medical abuse in, in ME is because you know, it's medical abuse. And um, but you know if if you know, I, I, I mean I run vaccine conferences with Christina England who written the books and uh, two years ago um, she had a conference all set up and you know the police moved in wouldn't let anybody go in there. I mean just getting to that state mm -hmm. now that you're not allowed mm -hmm. to talk about it. Mm -hmm. I mean just a, a, a you know I'm, I've sent. You know, already on the Facebook group, I sent us about vitamin C and uh, coronavirus. I've now done the coronavirus handout, which does you know, highlights the most important things with the references. Craig said to you, he said, there's a page thing up on Facebook. If anybody mentions on Facebook now that vitamin C stops you from getting viral infection, they go into the same ca category as terrorists. <laughs> it's a banned subject now. So you're not allowed, to, you're not allowed on Facebook to say vitamin C is protected against coronavirus. Mm -hmm. And their vaccinations are saying the anti-vaccinators are now in the terrorist group. They're anti-social people. Mm -hmm. well, how many people have you seen that have graduated to the VTP? I think mine was quite a trigger, but um, just a technical. Well, I've seen people have bad reactions to all viruses, yeah. uh, to all vaccinations. But the two real nurses, well, three real nurses, yellow fever. Mm -hmm. Um, um, hepatitis B. Mm -hmm. Hepatitis B. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. 
It's the HPV, it's the nicest biologic that that's most common. And you're probably aware of the work done by Chris Exley, who's demonstrated that uh, the, it's the adjuvant in HPV, which is a, also a problem. And there are very different aspects to, to vaccinations, all of which are problems. But, vaccine, but the aluminium in there is there as an immune adjuvant. Now, the vaccine producers call it a preservative. It isn't a preservative. If it's a preservative, they could use vitamin C. Much mm -hmm. It's an adjuvant. The point here being, if you inject somebody with an attenuated bacteria or a dead vax or a dead virus, the immune system test is attenuated. You know, we can ignore it. It's dead. It's not a threat. So you have to put a wake-up call in there. So all vaccines have adjuvants. That used to be mercury. At one stage, it was neomycin. They used to use squalene. They used to use silicone at one stage. But now aluminium is the flavor of the market. But it's just as nasty and toxic as all the others. So all vaccines got aluminium in there, which is a wake-up call. It says to the immune system, wake up and do something about, do something about this, you know, bit of DNA of, I'm carrying on, but bit of viral RNA and I carry. But um, if you wake up the immune system, that's a dangerous business. Because it will, if it gets a toxic dose of aluminium, and aluminium in vaccination is the nanoparticle size. It's the size that a little immune cell will recognize as a foreigner. It tries to digest it, tries to kill it. it tries to kill it by throwing enzymes at it, like superoxide, Disney players, and hydrogen peroxide, and all those things. But of course, you can't kill a nanoparticle of aluminium. You just turn that cell into an inflamed cell as it migrates around the body. Wherever it ends up, you know, there is inflammation. It's driving inflammation in the brain, in the liver, and in the joints. And we know you know, vaccination reactions can be very severe. Um, in fact, with HPV, they list the serious side effects, and including the serious side effects is death. So we please hear death is just a serious side effect. <laughs> <laughs> it's like the HPV virus. <laughs> <laughs> um, so HPV is real bad news for lots of reasons, and now they're rolling out the boys. Um, so if you do not let your son have a baby. Well, no, you don't even have to think about it. You sign that. You sign it in year seven. Your child can go to school in year nine. You receive it without you knowing or signing. Well, my dear friend Jenny Goodman, you know, her, her, he said when it came back to me, he refused to go to school because it was such peer pressure and such risk that they get mm -hmm. back. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of mm -hmm. detox, so mm -hmm. You don't know. Uh, yes, I mean, interestingly, there's a study done um, of the parents who are autistic children in America. And they just said to mum to what do you think is the most effective treatment for your kid? What helped you the most? And I'm having a hope that they came out of the room. So that's interesting. But again, um, the, there's a, again, a wonderful organisation, the um, Orphan Electric Association, and they do the journal. It's a dreadful name. Automatic just means the right molecule, but it just confuses everybody sounds. But um, vitamin C is highly protective in vaccine treatment. Mm -hmm. So another reason to have groundhog basic with kids, you know, at least if they do get done and you're not looking. I mean, a, a, um, a friend of mine's got kids at local school and they're holding flu vaccines, you know, every autumn now, mm -hmm. squirt up the nose. But they're they, they, they shared, so even if you don't opt in, oh, no. oh, exactly. I just asked a question about yeah. uh, inflammation. I was told I had, I think, a key, do you know, key, Q, E, E, G, electrical, electro, like, kind of okay. test on, on, and I was showed up lots of inflammation okay. in, in the brain stem, okay. apparently. It would a protocol that could get rid of that, the groundhog. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Well, that's is yeah. that the best way. way? It's very, it's very anti. I mean, there are lots of, of, of things you can do that's very anti. -fat. The most important thing you do is stop eating sugar and clean up from eating that. Right. The biggest toxic load comes from the diet because, as I say, it's not just the products of fermentation; it's the bacterial endotoxin, mm -hmm. it's the fungal mycotoxins, you know, it's the whole lot. And so, just doing the diet greatly reduces your pro-inflammatory tendency. Mm -hmm. Uh, but yes, uh, again, vitamin D is, is a very good anti-inflammatory that helps damp things down. Probiotics, you know, are used for a good anti-inflammatory. You know, that precipitous around notice when what's one I like induces immune tolerance in the gut. It's uh, very good for people with allergic guts. So you know, it's another little tree. But but vitamin C is a very good anti-inflammatory. Mm. It's also an antihistamine. You know, I think it's a good anti-inflammatory. I mean, all these things, multitask, you know, reducing your toxic load with forming. Um, reduces the pro-inflammatory mm -hmm. drive all those nasty you know, um, um, uh, pesticides and chemicals. Could I just, and um, Wi-Fi, of course. Let's get Wi-Fi, which is very pro-inflammatory. Going back a little bit. <laughs> the thyroid, do you know yep. what range is this, like, the 
normal brain. Okay, we're talking about blood tests for thyroid. Now, I talk about those at great length in the book, but the bottom line is don't trust them and don't trust their interpretation. Now, I, do, I, I have to do thyroid tests on my patients, um, really, because to defend myself from you know, um, the ravages of the general medical council. But take the thyroid test with a large pinch of salt for lots of reasons. First of all, the reference ranges have changed. The reference range have changed, why? Because the way the hospitals establish their reference range is they just find 100 people coming in and say, oh, well, they're, they're obviously all normal, so we'll work out what the average of all those results is, and that gives them a range. But of course, if 40% of the population are hypothyroid, then the range is going to get lower and lower and lower. So, at the moment, the London Laboratory, which is the one I use, uh, the doctor's laboratory, their reference range for a T4 is 12 to 22 peak moles per, uh, min moles per litre, peak moles per litre. Um, and Professor Sir Anthony Toft, who is a consultant endocrinologist at Edinburgh, in his book, The BNA Guide to Treating Hypothyroidism, states some people don't feel well until their T4 is running at 30 peak moles per litre. Um, whereas mo many NHS lab ranges are now 7 to 14. Mm -hmm. That's a massive difference. Well, that's low. But the point is, doing the blood test tells us there's biochemical scope for trial of hormones because we actually all have our own personal reference range. And again, so this is a study that was done where they took, again, um, 100 normal people and they just measured their thyroid test every month for six months. And everybody has their own personal normal range. For some, it's 16 to 18, for some, it's 24 to 26, for some, it's you know, 13 to 15. So, you know, what we should be doing is measuring, you know, the range of everybody's teenagers and say, well, that's your reference range and we keep it there for the rest of your life. But guess what? It doesn't happen. And guess what? All teenagers are hyper oh, so so They won't have 3T4 and 3T3, that's for sure. I've never seen no, no, very, very no, sorry, the TSA. Uh, well, again, TSH is a very blunt tool. It tells you about primary hypothyroidism, which, yes, occurs in a chronic season, but the major cause is secondary hypothyroidism because the pituitary is down. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, and therefore it won't, you know, and therefore all my any patients get told the thyroid is fine. And actually a massive cause. Well, I argued with my doctor when I was 17 about my pituitary exam. Bless you, I've heard all this before, mm -hmm. believe you me. This is why you've got to do it yourself. And you've got to do it on clinical grounds. The biochemistry gives you a useful guide, the test gives you some clues, but look at the history. And what we'll do this afternoon is we'll go through the history and how we all as soon as you, whenever you like, we get and how you pick clues in the history of what's gone by in the past, what's most likely. But you know, people come to these workshops thinking, I'm going to find my key and we'll sort that and I'll be well. And it's just not like that. Everybody has to do it all, including well people. So um, 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 I do it, you know, my patients do it. And okay, it's, it's hard at first, but you know, I thought people have faced it. You know, I know I'm not going to get cancer, I'm not going to get dementia. And I'm not a bit of heart disease, you know, I'll cut it when I'm ready, sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And also, right, I know you haven't mentioned this, but part of the immunity that you're talking about, um, do you know what the right level for mannose binding rectum is? It's irrelevant. Just oh, okay. ignore it. You know, what I don't like doing is micro um, managing all these tiny things, because when you get the big things right, it all falls into place. Okay. And, um, uh, and, 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 and so many doctors and say, oh, it's a mercury problem, oh, it's Lyme disease, oh, it's a mitochondrial thing. It isn't, it's the whole shooting match. And, mm. um, and you've got to work out for yourselves. And, but the basic things done well overcomes all this. So the diet will increase the mannose binding. I have no idea. Oh, okay. I have no idea. <laughs> um, um, all I know is that you know you should be eating meat because it's, it's so yeah, toxic. Um, um, and if you reduce the toxic load sufficiently, yes, of course, there are lectins in foods, and nuts and seeds are full of lectins, but we can deal with them fine. But if you've got a leaky gut and we overwhelm our body with loads of other poisons, suddenly they start to become a problem. So I say, do the whole thing well, and those problems just melt away. Is there anything you suggest for diabetic? Well, diabetic is, is, is diabetic exactly is is the long term result of. Um, Western diets, which are you know, based on sugars and carbs, we don't it. It's it's a dietary thing. Yeah. Sorry, can I just ask you? I've got yeah. What's the primary secondary hybrid hybrid thyroidism? Because you're talking about your primary hybrid thyroidism is just when the thyroid gland itself is attacked. 
Right. Think of autoimmunity, or maybe iron deficiency, or maybe it's been poisoned by something. Right. The pituitary one, uh, and we know that's the case because the TSH starts to rise. And that's what doctors will die of. That's what doctors will die of if you're lucky. Again, they've moved the moved the goalposts to TSH. Yeah. In, yes. in America, you get treated if your TSH is above three. In this country, you've got to go above ten now before you get to that point treated. So you know, being hugely under treated, even when they do, even if you're lucky enough to have the right bowel of off. <laughs> but in the MEs, the problem is is most. It's also at the pituitary level. So if the pituitary gland is down because I don't know, maybe inflammations in the brain or sleep disorders or whatever, um, um, you know, people don't really know why the pituitary goes down. We know it's poison oil down phosphate, for example, mm. that will knock out the pituitary. Maybe head injury. I've got several patients yeah, who've I've had head um, injuries. Okay. Yes, because often you get a, a fracture of the um, base of the skull without it that doesn't get maybe not doesn't get diagnosed. But the pituitary sits in a little um, um, bony pocket called the stella turtica, the, the, the Turk saddle it's been described as, and it hangs on a little stalk like a pea hanging out, and it's very easy for that stalk to get damaged and and, and that. Ups, Where is it in the brain? Right in the middle. So pituitary oh, right. actually cut, you know, just just here. Yeah. Yeah. The pituitary okay. yeah. it, right. that, it? it makes you feel fine thinking <laughs> about it actually. Anyway, but so that's a common cause. But then there's also mm. um, T4, which is the hormone that's produced by the thyroid gland, isn't very active. Mm. It has to be converted into T3 to do any good, and that requires minerals. You can fit the selenium, zinc, iron. So guess what? If your mandatory minerals make up, you can't do that. And then we have the problem of thyroid hormone receptor resistance. So you can have perfect thyroid function test, everything looks funky dory, but if the receptors aren't responding, um, then um, the, the thyroid hormone doesn't even work. Now, there are lots of possible causes of that, now, but I'm quite sure part of it is to do with metabolic syndrome and the fermenting gut. And you know, when you get people on a good PK diet, um, I'm my guess is, is, is very often people can reduce their big dose of T3 if that's what they're on or whatever. So again, it, it, it simplifies, it clarifies the picture, it you know, stops the water from being muddy if we get all this basic stuff in here. Do you use pituitary hormones? No, I don't. I use the ones that have preconception. <laughs> okay, okay, well, um, um, I'm just a bit wide about pituitary Yeah, no, I don't understand. I guess not mine. That's just not It's like at one stage there's a, a, a very for growth hormone for patients that they need to inject with it. The, the, you know, guess where it comes from? Animal tissue. Yeah. And the risk of injecting prions or retrovirus is just massive. I mean, that's another problem to flag up really uh, recently. You, I'm sure you know Fuginikovic, who was the, um, the doctor who published in 2008 um, a study looking at um, mouse retrovirus, XMRV. And um, essentially, she found um, mouse retrovirus in, I think it was 68% um, or something, 67% of ME patients. 30% of men with prostate cancer compared to 6% of the population. And, um, um, and so she didn't actually say it in the paper, but effectively she's saying, well, it's mouse retrovirus which is causing driving prostate cancer in men and um, ME in human, in, in, in um, uh, ME patients. Uh, and after she published that paper, she was thrown in prison with no charge. And she was held in prison, you know, out of prison with all the drug addicts and what's on her. Uh, that her co authors of the paper all retracted the paper and said, Oh, we didn't really mean that. <laughs> we're, we're not going to say we're not going to. She stood her ground. And when she came out of prison, um, again with no charge, no charge, no charge, no charge of being filed, she was told on the Q team, You ever say that again? And we straight back in prison. So she lost her job, she lost her um, career, she lost everything. Fortunately, she got a husband who was a heir for her. And only now is she coming back into the lineup and she comes at conferences and she talks about her experiences and what it's all about. So how but she think? Or how, how? XMRV from vaccination. Because you see, again, there's a book that you all must read if you've got any doubt about vaccination. It's the most beautifully written book. Um, it's called The River by Edward Cooper. Now, he is an investigative journalist who asks the question, where does the AIDS epidemic come from? Where does HIV come from? Now, it, I, um, it, it's, it's a thousand pages long, a very close type. It took me weeks to read it because, you know, I don't get the time to read. And there are, there are, the last 180 pages are solid references. And it's, it reads like a detective story. And there is nobody 
in the AIDS, polio world that he doesn't interview either them or their living relatives. And he goes to the researchers, to the doctors, to the patients, to where, they, uh, where the work was done, and to cut an enormously long and reference you know, um, uh, <coughs> story to the bare minimum. During the 1950s, there was a race to produce the first polio vaccine. There was saving, there was salt, there was Kaposky. They all wanted to make their name in the, in the viral world by producing the first polio vaccine. And in the business of production, they took shortcuts. And this polio shop called Dr. Kaposky, who was obviously a very talented guy, he could play concert piano music, he spoke several languages, he was a great extrovert. He was developing this, this vaccine and he was growing polio vaccine on chimp kidneys in Philadelphia and in Belgium and in the Congo. And now one chimp kidney will produce enough vaccine to do about 100,000 children. So it's a very efficient way of producing um, uh, vaccine. Now, of course, you can't grow viruses on sugar and water. They have to be grown on a, a living animal tissue. Why? Because viruses grow by entering the cells, hijacking the cellular machinery for creating new virus. So the cell makes the virus for that, for that virus, it makes a new virus particle. So when you make the vaccine, you also have chimp kidney cells in there as well. And if you look, all vaccines, if you look for their ingredients, they all contain animal products, without exception. All viral vaccines, so don't be fooled by that. So what he was doing is he was injecting, yes, polio vaccine, but also chimp monkey tissue into millions of children in the Congo, in the Belgian Congo in West Africa. And um, what he did is he took simian immunodeficiency virus, because as they all mammals have retroviruses, mice have them, cows have them. In fact, 36% of breast cancer has cow retrovirus in there. Um, um, he was injecting monkey retrovirus into children and it jumped species and became mm. HIV. Mm. And all the different strains of HIV can be traced back to that one source by doing the mice number studies. Now, he is being very polite. He says, yeah, okay, this is still a theory. We haven't proved it. Proven it. Why? because they, the vaccines are still in existence, but the people who possess them will not permit them to be tested for um, simian immunodeficiency virus and HIV virus because they're fearful of the, of the, of the fallout. Mm -hmm. Because you know, AIDS, as you know, has decimated Africa, not because they're dying of AIDS, well, they are some of them, but because they're so immunosuppressed, they're dying of TB. And coronavirus in Africa is going to be lethal. It's going to wipe out, well, Bill Gates says 10 million, but um, who knows, you know, Africa is going to be very susceptible to a coronavirus. But look, look at the misery it's caused in Western world for people with HIV by AIDS. And it's a man made epidemic, mm -hmm. there'd be any doubt about that. And that's why vaccinations are so dangerous because Judy Mitvix has identified mouse retrovirus in prostate cancer and ME. We now know that 36% of breast cancer has got bovine um, retrovirus in. Why? Because in the 1980s they were growing vaccines on bovine tissue. And what stopped them was BSE. Now, believe you me, they weren't in the least bit worried about us getting BSE from eating beef. That was complete red herring. What they're really worried about is the vaccinations. Because, you know, they've been growing bovine tissue and you're injecting bovine prime, um, um, uh, i.e. BSE material into kids. And guess what? New variants you don't have from young people. Why? Because they're the ones that get vaccinated. So, and the interesting thing about BSE is we saw an epidemic of new variants CJD, and we had about 1,500 deaths in it after. We're now seeing a second wave because those that, with the short incubation got CJD within a few years because they were homozygous for the gene for susceptibility to BSC. We're now seeing the heterozygous who are, um, are partially susceptible to BSC and they have a much longer incubation period. And we know um, uh, prion disorders can take up to 38 years before they manifest. The commonest cause of death in Westerners today is dementia. Now, dementia is not a diagnosis, it's a clinical picture. And um, everyone says, oh, it's Alzheimer's disease. Well, okay, Alzheimer's is one form of that, but it's also atherosclerosis, sclerotic. But the point is, we should be doing post-mortems on every patient that dies from, from dementia to find out what's really in their brains. And guess why they're not doing it? Because they don't want to find. Mm -hmm. They don't want to find the time to they don't want to find um, um, Lyme disease. You know, they don't want to find um, retrovirus in there. 
because you know they will be to blame. They grow the flu on eggs. Yes, well, that's probably a bit better. <laughs> 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 but yeah, eggs, eggs are going to have retrovirus. I mean, all, all, every animal bird's been looked at has, has had its own retrovirus on board. Yeah, I, I can't eat a lot of eggs. Uh, I, I can't eat eggs in summer at all. I get summer cramps. So uh, when my GP offered me flu vaccine, I said, can I have a good breed? Uh, absolutely not. No. And you, uh, you, you, you say no for other reasons. Something mm -hmm. that say, you yeah. say no for other reasons. Yeah. Do not vaccinate. Why? Because we've got vitamin C and we've got RD and we don't need vaccination. Now, the only other problem she doesn't ask him. <laughs> She's learned. <laughs> <laughs> the only thing I probably would um, suggest is, is tetrotoxin because you know, anybody who sticks a dirty pitchfork through their foot, as I regularly do, you know, is at risk of getting tetanus. If you have a vaccination, Make sure you have a big dose of vitamin C around it, which is that will protect you from the line of it. So, I, I have tetanus for like going on holiday, and I feel like my hip might have really deteriorated. Well, well, again, I've had a whole DMC game that, as I can tell you, because you know, I would recommend it for my anybody, but they, they choose their holidays wisely. And they get well, this is before I know. But I mean, vaccines are very good at switching on anything. Emily and autism share many um, features that are very similar. Mm -hmm. Well, one reason I left the NHS, I did 20 years as an NHS GP, is because they said um, I've got to have hepatitis B vaccine in order to work in any good practice. I thought, well, I'm really sorry. And there were other factors as well, so I thought, well, no. Paid off my mortgage by then. My girls were dependent, so I thought if, I, if it fails completely, I'll struggle while then we change along to some lorry drivers or something else. Something will come up. So I jumped out. So I jumped out the end of the independent GP in 2000. And that's when all my troubles with the GMC started because I'm gobby. I put all my stuff on my website. You know, <laughs> I say things that you know are not politically correct, and I don't care two f's about it because you're all clever people. You can choose what you think is the most compelling argument. And that's how it should be. Um, but you know, I've been continuously prosecuted by the GMC ever since. I'm now hearing I'm at prosecution number 31. I've got the GMC here in Looming as we speak. Um, um, and I can defend myself like I always have for the month of her They hate that too, because I'm gobbly. I'm just going back to what you were saying about tetanus. Most of us don't have this for so, you know, well, exactly. Exactly. I guess what? Well, I know, that, to be honest, really, the chance, you know, even the chance of, of getting text from a person ill is still. Uh, well, it's, it's deep penetrating injuries. A, a dog it, bite or a cat bite would be bad news, for example. Difficult. It's difficult. I would not have a DTP, you know. I know, but you should have, again, you shouldn't have DPT. That's three that's bites and one bite. And you, but guess what? You can't you get that. signal text. No, signal text anywhere. That's the first point. The other point is, is vaccinations shouldn't be given as a subcutaneous or intravascular injection. They should be given as an intradermal injection. Mm -hmm. Why? Because you need a fraction of the dose. It's just between the layers of the skin and you get a much better immune response. But the trouble is they're technically quite tricky, especially with a wriggling child. And you know, the nurses don't like doing that. And guess what? You sell a lot more vaccine if you buy me mm -hmm. half a mill of the stuff. Mm -hmm. So it's big, more money for big pharma. Mm -hmm. But you know, when I was at medical school, we were taught the way you should be getting vaccines, I did. I went out and did research in, in Uganda and um, um, Kenya on that. You should be giving vaccines intradermally. So you raise up a little blob and you inject about 0.05 of a mil of the stuff. So, you know, so if, if I was given the choice, I'll be giving tetanus vaccine, single vaccine, intradermally combined with a big dose of vitamin C, and that would be a safe way of, um, of administering the vaccine. What about food vaccine? About what? Food Okay. No, it's 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 don't know any studies that say that was a good thing. So I don't know. But I know who can see works. So guess what? Let's use the tools which have got a good evidence base, great science, cheap, easy, anybody can do it, side effects here. Yeah, it's a no brainer. You know, you said about the animal products. With the, the adrenal that I use, and it's yeah. It is, yeah. So I shouldn't be using it. 
Yeah, no, no, so it's a swallow, it's fine, it's easy, it's fine. When you inject them in the vaccinations, that's the problem because you then get through our own our natural defences. Um, 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 vegetarians sometimes you know, gather for the having animal, um, you know, adrenal glanders or thyroid glanders, which are animal derivatives. <coughs> One of my patients says, well, it's okay in her book because um, the animal is going to be killed anyway for meat and the thyroid is just a byproduct, so she justifies it to herself in that way. Uh, you can get synthetic T4, of course, you can get synthetic T3, but um, it's more difficult than getting the glandulars. And if you really don't want the adrenal bovine glandulars, you can use GAT or pregnenone. They're not quite as good, but not, you know, but, um, because they're not as... I try to get as close to nature as possible, you know, get, get the things that are uh, closest to what we're producing. I think we've, we should now go through all the management plans because we've, we've covered the... I mean, you chip in at any moment and um, ask questions. Does anybody need a break for a pee or a drink? Mm -hmm. Off you go then. <laughs> Can we make the, the cup of tea? Yeah, there's the, tea, there's yeah. coffee, there's coconut milk and ordinary milk. Help yourselves. Oh, yeah. all right. Huh? Oh, the boiling water can come out of the tap or the kettle.
Right. Um, okay. And she tolerates that fine. Then two capsules a week, and then three caps a week. And uh, best well, like the would be possible dose of urine yeah. yeah. okay. okay. Two. Urine elements would be Okay. So it's almost How do you know when to stop taking it? Well, I suppose that this is normal. So, um, I couldn't take the um, I think I did a I think that's what shows when you should be 18. That was probably exactly accurate. The point is, I mean, I don't need these sheets give you details of the text. So, any Perineans, 
I mean, you don't get neat iodine in your eyes, that'd be jolly painful. But you know, what, so if somebody had an eye problem, I'd say, do the iodine oil under the eye, and then the vapor from it will get into the eye and sort out the conjunctivitis or the vapor mm -hmm. or whatever. And that's about the diet, just like the adrenals, they might take the iodine, put that into the overstimulate my adrenals. It doesn't stimulate anything. It doesn't, no, it doesn't stick, it's just a raw material. So, um, I mean, you hear so much rubbish from the end plants about iron. Oh, you mustn't take your Hashimoto's, or you mustn't take your thyrotoxic nonsense. Um, it's, uh, it's not called very cotton. The only time we get problems with iodine is when the wretched doctors inject the stuff, you know, with iodine contrast dyes or um, um, uh, use iodine for, you know, for um, IVPs, for example. That's when you can switch on the algae too. But given, you know, through the skin, you know, under the tongue, inhaled, no problem at all. Side effects are none. I just turned that time to get a bit of side treat and get a bit, you know, cut some meat to the left. I'm not going to try to Well, it's probably just triggering a detox then. Yeah. Um, or maybe it's given suddenly the thyroid's got some raw material and saying, oh, yippee, let's get home. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's the old story. It will start low, build up slow. And um, so, you know, so you've got to walk the path, you've got to walk it properly. And what I used to do in the early days is give people a list of things to do, and they cherry pick the easy thing. I won't do that diet, I mean, <laughs> but I will take some supplements, that's okay. And they think they spend lots of money on supplements, that will do it. You know, of course, it doesn't, and then they're disappointed. And then they go to the conventional doctor and say, Well, they're bothered by the supplements they use, this, aren't they? Because they've never had, they haven't even absorbing them, they just be wasted. It's the iodine, it's, it's the, the thyroid's using the iodine, isn't it? That's the primary use of the well, iodine. That's what we are taught. Yes. But more iodine is used by the breast than by the thyroid. Ah, right. right. And, 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 and iodine deficiency is, is, is probably a major factor for breast cancer, mm -hmm. using epidemical. Um, it's also necessary to make oxytocin, which is the love hormone, and that's one that the autistic kids haven't got. Right. And mm -hmm. um, not work done by me, but by a guy called Brownstein. Um, mm -hmm. and, and very often, you know, the eye contact comes back when we get their ID levels up because probably they can make oxytocin. And of course, okay. oxytocin was the yeah. stuff that Bottom put on Titania's um, mm -hmm. eyes to make her fall in love with a donkey. Mm -hmm. the donkey. <laughs> yeah. I'm quite sure that was oxytocin. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. It's the love hormone. I get it every time I see my dog or my daughter. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> we think about it and talk about it. Yeah. <laughs> so, what It was about the hydration, wasn't it, from Roger? The hydration yeah. of the mitochondria. Uh, so uh, going in at like 1.3 atmospheres and supposedly uh, the forcing the oxygen okay. in into the cellular level better was how it had been described to us. Well, I can, I can hear what they're saying, but what I would say is that um, I published a paper um, in um, 2009 about mitochondrial function. And what we found is the mitochondrial function improved markedly just with simple supplements and detox regimes. Right. So that, I'm, I'm not sure I buy that as an explanation. I say my guess is that that hydroxyl had an antibiotic effect, an antimicrobial effect, some sort. What else do we do now is let's go through these because what I want you to do is to all go home with um, your own copy of with your own management plan. So, because you, know, you can't all do everything. Um, you have, so if you can focus your fire on the important things, then that's going to get you better quicker. 
So yes, you've got to do the basic package. So, and this is how I take a history for people. Uh, I go through exactly this format or something very similar. So the first thing I say is, well, when did it start? And um, did it start suddenly or has it come on gradually over years? Because that gives you clues. So if it started um, very suddenly following a flu-like infection, H5 bar virus comes up all the time. And it's a major trigger of pathology. Um, it's a major I mean, uh, there are at least 33 autoimmune conditions that are associated with H5 bar virus. And there's a study done by Martin Lerner, or now four studies published, again, all the details in the books, um, treating any patients with phallocyclovir and getting very good results um, because it reduces their viral load. And I've had several patients who, who have done the basic work up, still stuck, got um, um, a history of uh, trigger white gland fever, send them to Armin Labs, they've got high A spot results, treatment with antivirals, and they've done very well. Thank you very much. So, um, so if you've got that clue, you're, you're looking for a viral player. It's the name of the test that Armin uses. It's a measure of gamma interferon release when lymphocytes come in contact with the virus. So he takes your blood, he mixes it with the virus, and then he looks at how activated those cells become. So if, those, if he gets a lot of those cells that are activated in exposure to um, that virus, it means they're sensitized and they're fighting. You can do an L spot for Lyme and for EBV. You can do an L spot for a whole range of infections. Now. It is the most useful test, I have to say. But if the virus isn't active, then they can't treat it. Nothing to do with the virus, it's to do with the cell. If, if that patient's T lymphocytes are reacting against L spot, uh, uh, are against H1 virus or herpes viruses or Lyme, whatever, then that means that patient's cells have learned to recognize and are fighting that infection. And by implication, that patient has that infection. Because I've had the results from it, but I was told it was inactive. Well, that's good. That means they're not fighting. And, and those, his results are sort of 95% specific and 97% uh, uh, sensitive. So they're very good tests. They are the best. The antibody tests are not entirely useless, but they are not as helpful. I mean, obviously, it would be lovely for everybody to have all the tests, but prohibitively expensive. You know, throwing money at this condition doesn't do it. You've got a, um, and money is a very useful resource. I mean, all this stuff about money doesn't buy you happiness, not by the back. It's a novel. And and this is, for me, this is the most frustrating aspect of what I do. People don't have resources to get well. And money is one resource, energy is another resource, you know, and I think money down the glass. So that's why I'm trying to find the cheapest and the most efficient ways to get well. So is what was the name of the BBB, the name of the test? Um, it's the Elispot test, E L I S P O T. The details are in my book oh. and on my website. And Armin Labs are very helpful. And Gillian, um, um, oh, crumbs, I'm not sure, uh, who runs uh, the office at this oh, end. Crowley. Crowley. Yeah. Crowley. Yeah. Gillian Crowley. Absolutely. Oh, yes. Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. Very helpful. You can get you the kits um, and help you with the um, how to get to the boss again. On the Natural Health website, there are details of phlebotomists um, who some will come to your house and take blood, but of course it's more expensive, or a local hospital where you just go along and say, here are the pots, here's me arm, you know, you know, get some blood into the pots, will you? And, and then you post it off. So um, um, that's clue. Again, if the acute onset follow vaccination, that switches on allergy and autoimmunity. So um, you know, there's that you put that person into a pro-inflammatory state. And um, of course there's aluminium in there, which needs to be detox the heavy metal, so that gives us another clue as to strategies. Did it follow, follow foreign travel? You know, and um, um, one of the most dangerous things that young people do these days is take a year off between school and university, have hundreds of vaccinations, go to some ghastly foreign country where they're assailed by horrible bugs and, and drugs and sexually transmitted disease, and they come home and they're completely effed. <laughs> and believe you or not, I see that frightening often. Again, universities are extremely dangerous places. Why? Hundreds of, 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 of kids in there eating crap food with every addiction going, you know, cigarettes, cannabis, you know, drugs, plus you know, sexually active, all, and all the girls are on the pill, um, uh, and bang, we get Emmy. It's a freaking disaster. So, um, you know, I've got a very dear friend of mine, I'll, I'll talk about later, Michelle, and we're going to have educate her kids because, because the rules will come, you watch, the rules will come that um, 
children won't be allowed to go to school unless they're vaccinated. Mm -hmm. It's already the case in some countries. Mm -hmm. And guess what? It's not education anymore, it's crowd control. Mm -hmm. What do they learn? Mm -hmm. There's no free play, they're not taught to teach themselves. Mm -hmm. So um, so that's going to be my next project. So I think it's really well to talk to the group of families and then to leave the time as well. Yeah, absolutely. So, following foreign travel, you know, could be aerotoxic syndrome. You've probably all heard about aerotoxic syndrome, but the bottom line there is that aircraft jet engines run at extremely high temperatures, about 7 800 degrees. So, at those high temperatures, um, the oils they use burn. So, they have to put oil stabilizer in there. What do they use? Organophosphate chemicals. So, um, um, now, how do they heat the cabin up? They use recycled air that comes in over the engines. So if those engine seals are leaking, and in the older planes they are, engine fumes come into the cabin, and all the occupants are poisoned by organic phosphates, um, in particular one called uh, TCP, like the phosphate, not the, not the disinfectant. And this has been a big issue amongst cabin crew, air, airline pilots and cabin crew, um, who have been systematically poisoned for decades. Mm -hmm. And um, um, there's some very, very sad stories there. But the modern, I mean, it could be fixed quite easily. All you need is um, to take cabin air in from the outside air, which is clean, more clean than the thing that's <coughs> coming over the engines. But it costs about £30,000 per plane, that costs money, but then you want heating the air after it comes in. So, you know, it's more cheap and efficient to drag it over the engines. But you know, the modern planes are now being built like that. But you know, if you get sick on a plane, it's not necessarily you know, aircraft flu, it's probably poison. So that's why I don't like flying on planes these days. Um, again, vaccination, gut parasites. And if somebody offered me a free trip to India, I'd say thanks, but no thanks. Mm -hmm. It's certainly coming by chronic giardia, amoebiasis, um, or whatever. You know, what do the cricketers get over there? Deli belly, you know, not surprising. So if you had any of those things, then there'll be ticking mechanisms, or maybe do early spot tests, or maybe metal detoxing, you know, or if it's aerotoxic syndrome, then you want to do sauna, sweating, some sort of heating regime to get that load down. Gradual onset over the years. Um, again, you follow dental work. And again, people don't put two and two together. You know, they just think dental work is okay. And um, but you know, they're putting nasty, toxic metals in your mouth. They're putting mercury, silver, palladium, um, 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 coppers, uh, cobalt. They're nasty, toxic metals in there. And you know, and they just. If you have your things taken out, what would you then get replaced with? Um, well, the flavor, well, they're different flavors. The mark, flavor of monk mode is zirconium. Mm. You know, one stage everybody was all up for titanium, but now we're seeing a lot of titanium allergy, so that's not so good. So then zirconium is the next flavor of Ideally, of course, would be ceramic, and there are some you know, uh, amazing dentists that do that. If you want to have the, you know, the full Monty, I suggest you go to Hungary because the dentists who there is fantastic. Very high quality, won the Swiss you know, Award for Best Dental Hospital of the Year. They do it for a fraction of the price it costs in here, and you have a jolly nice holiday at the same time. And they're very caring and very good. And I have one people who've done that, but I might go and get my own Nash's bun. I know they don't look very nice, but hey, I don't care about that. So <laughs> But, <laughs> there's a dental hospital, I can't remember the name of it, it's, it's a Hungarian name, but it's the... It's in Budapest. It's in Budapest. So there are three main ones there, and they're all super. Um, um, if it's a job change, and think sick building syndrome, new hobby. You know, I had one girl who was poisoned, poisoned herself with photographic chemicals and ended up with an interstitial cystitis, you know, under glues, you know, all those sort of things can, can poison you. Farming is a dangerous business because you're getting moulds all the time. I mean, every single house in this country is, has got moulds in it. Nobody's mould free, and the immune system can cope with a certain amount, but if you get hay, it's on the ground, and then gets rained on, and then dries, and then they'll be full of mold spores. And you get aspergillus. And the farmer's lung, of course, is chronic mold infection of the lungs, and it's very common, but undiagnosed because you know, nobody's looking for chronic infections like that. Um, um, water damage buildings, that's that's molds as again. Carbon monoxide, probably more common than we think, but difficult to diagnose. Why? Because you have to take blood at the time of the poisoning. Um, and if that's missed, then um, the diagnosis is never made. Surgery using metals and silicones. Again, foreign bodies in the, uh, in the body are very bad news. I've seen over 250 women with chronic fatigue syndromes and inflammatory conditions following silicon breast implants. They are really bad news. And um, you, know, you 
probably won't get that person work until the rest of things being removed. Now, the difficulty is finding a surgeon who's prepared to remove it because they don't like to admit that it's causing a problem because they're putting them in all the time and making very pretty pain in the process. Thank you very much. I mean, I have one girl who came to see me and her 18th birthday present was sort of a mood. This is just horrifying, isn't it? Mm -hmm. um, but you know, um, hernia meshes are often silicon based. Um, <coughs> so you, know, you have a, a mesh repair then, and so yeah, it's silicon. Yeah, yeah, thank you very much. Nice. So you really want to do it every time. You can 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 do it every time. You couldn't get easy saving. You couldn't get anybody. You know that you went to spend a fortune trying to get somebody to say that's what's causing your illness. Because he wanted it removed, he wanted to say nobody would say. I would say, I mean, don't laugh now. I had a complaint against me um, that came through the General Dental Council because I recommended that one of my patients had the mercury fillings removed. And she went to see a dentist, and of course, the dentist did it badly, and so he complained to the General Dental Council. And when they saw my name come up, they said, Oh, we'll have her again. Mm -hmm. So, you know, of course, I keep things to touch very easily because, you know, I often do the dental work. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, doctors, yeah. Get into trouble for, I mean, for me speaking like vaccinations, my colleagues, my contemporaries, mother would dare speak like this about it. They wouldn't dare speak like this um, because they fear that they get into trouble. Then they know it by screen. It says on that one um, HRT, what yes. alternative do you suggest? <sighs> Again, it's a long story, but the pill and HRT. Are major risk factors for chronic fatigue syndrome because they induce metabolic syndrome, they're immunosuppressive, and aside from that, they're growth promoting, they're a major risk factor for cancer. Now, it's women that run into problems because they have hormones, now female sex hormones, and because the point is, is the only reason we are on this planet is to procreate. You know, if we don't have babies, we're going to go extinct. You know. And so the body has to experience very dangerous things for the business of producing babies. We you know pregnancy and childbirth is a dangerous business, and the hormones that surround that are also dangerous to us. They give you sticky blood, they give you high blood sugar, you all know about diabetes, especially with diabetes, they give you high blood pressure, they're growth promoting, they're respect for cancer. So if a woman gets cancer while she's pregnant, the first thing you do is get rid of the baby. Otherwise, that cancer just makes it wild. So hormones are very dangerous things. They're essential for the survival of the species, but they're very dangerous things. And we experience those when in our child producing years. And then of course, when the hormones go, um, um, uh, actually we're, we're probably in a healthier state. The last thing you want to do is, is take HRT. What about the lactose rates and the other No, you don't need it. No? You don't need it. Um, 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 uh, the adrenal glands should take over much of the function of the, um, um, of the ovaries. And getting all this stuff in, in place, especially the thyroid cell, greatly mitigates menopausal symptoms, which are often ascribed to hormones, when actually that's a very dangerous way of treating them. So, you know, I, I don't like the pill, I know it's a major factor for, for chronic fatigue and other conditions, cancer. And again, I've had a whole GMC hearing about this. Um, and managed to kick the expert witnesses into touch. Um, and um, and then we shouldn't be having HRT. Yeah, so, what, if you've been on it for a long time, yeah. You, slowly, you put all this stuff in place and you slowly tear it off. Yeah. Doesn't affect any osteoporosis, that's a, a, a incorrect as well. We well, just got rid of all the thymoid to just this and having any and then 10 days of misery every month on top, which is absolutely well, hypothetical. What you're describing is, is, is PMT. Which is um, probably hypothyroidism. And um, the hypothyroidism out that melts away. Hypothyroidism. Correct. Yes. Yes. Okay. So, yeah. so often PMT just disappears, you get all this stuff in place. Right. Mm. Mm. So, well, just about your, on the onset again, you were saying, yeah. um, I just looked at the, the, the list, and um, I think that what happened for me was it was to do with sort of trauma, you know, mm. bereavement and loss of a job. Yeah. Around within six weeks of each other, yeah. effectively. Yeah. Well, and so, I call it that kicks an emotional hole in the engine. And um, you know, I don't, don't talk much about that because there are lots of psychiatrists and lots of psychologists who do a much better job than I do. But yes, that's the last straw that breaks the camel's back. But what you have to remember is how do we cope with trauma? I mean, what did I do when I was in the MRI with the UNC? I did have a couple of glasses of wine at my house. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. We turned to victim, control that symptom. And you know, doctors are useless, so you know, people have become complete, put on weight, 
they come, 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 they, they scrape, they fake, they pretend cannabis or whatever, alcohol to just make life more bearable. I think it's, it's, I know, I've probably got this wrong, but it's, it's called hypothalamitis or something, it's something like that. Hypothalamus. Well, that's, 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 that's the treatment. Yeah, you can't diagnose it, there's no specific yeah. treatment for it. It's just part of the messenger system. Right. And it's like people blame the autonomic nervous system for POTS. No, it's the autonomic nervous system. Yeah. No, that's just the messenger. That's just right. relaying the message saying you've got to keep the blood pressure up, so let's get the heart beating faster in order to, to do that. But um, it eventually it gets kind of um, overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. So, so um, I hear what you're saying. It's, it's still the basic psychotherapy. Again, very often I have. Oh, again, um, so surgery using metals and silicones is often a trigger. Addictions. Um, um, I don't say a lot, but some of my patients have been you know, serious drug addicts and, and major heroin intravenous use and whatever. And I see people going through life, as, as I call it, working about the addiction ladder. And it starts in childhood with sugars and dairy products, and then they turn to chocolate, and then to caffeine, and then alcohol, and then cannabis, and they go up the addiction ladder. And they suddenly realise when they're kind of mainlining cocaine, Christ knows what, this is not good. And they, so they work their way back down the addiction ladder, and they swap one for another, and one for another. And they end up sugar and carbs, which I think on a national basis is the most pernicious and the most damaging addiction of all. And you've got to get rid of that. And I found for me to sort out my addictions, not that they were that awful, um, once I got off carbs, I don't crave anything anymore. I don't crave chocolate, I don't crave alcohol, um, um, I don't crave sugar, um, because my whole system is just so much more safe. I enjoy a glass of alcohol when I go out. Um, and two glasses all I need to you know, hit the spot, and I'm very jolly and extrovert and funny all evening, and then I have a good night's sleep, or not so a good night's sleep, and, uh, and I'm not too awful the next day. So you know, addictions are very jolly things for social occasions, but we shouldn't be using them all the time to deal with everyday you know, stress. And stress is the symptom the brain gives us when it knows it doesn't have the resources to deal with life. And you know, if I've got lots of energy and lots of mental energy, the work can put anything at me and I'll bat it away and deal with it somehow. But when I'm tired or run down or whatever, then you know, it all becomes too much, and that's when you feel like you know, falling into bed and shooting me up and head over there. Um, prescription drugs, statins are real bad news for all my energy patients. I don't think I've got a single patient that hasn't been made much worse by statins because they have a lot of function, they stop us producing um, K2 10. And actually, there's a really interesting story about statins, which bears repeating. Uh, lovely, worked out by a lovely cardiologist up in the northwest called Dr. David Grimes. And he got interested in vitamin D. And he had patients in Blackpool, and patients in Preston, and patients, you know, and, and, and basically the higher up they went, so they, you know, it's patients in the Pennines, the greater their risk of heart disease. Down on Blackpool, um, and, and the difference was sunshine. If you live in Blackpool, on the coast, lots of sunshine, the higher up you go, the more clouds, the more rain, the more forest, the less sunshine you get. And so he produced a really interesting paper looking at the relationship between vitamin D and heart disease. Vitamin D is highly protective. It's very anti-inflammatory. And then he started looking at statins and saying, well, how are statins working? Because we are told they work by reducing cholesterol. And we now know that's rubbish. Statins do reduce your cholesterol, but you would think that the greater the reduction, the greater the protection, but there's no linear relationship. And what Grimes showed is that statins look like vitamin D. They're vitamin D mimics. And they have their benefit because they look like vitamin D. So you get all the benefits from statins by just taking vitamin D. And none of the risks, i.e. knocking off your own protection of K3 and fibrin your mitochondria. And actually now, there's now very good evidence to show that statins are contributing to our epidemics of heart failure, because they're fibrin our mitochondria. And um, dementia, because again, dementia is uh, a symptom of poor energy delivery mechanism. And when you have a senior moment or your poor short term memory, you know, um, that's poor energy delivery to your brain. And guess what? You know, it happens when you're tired and, and, and when you're fatigued. So, you know, statins are, are, are real bad news and we shouldn't, we shouldn't be using them. Okay, and again, it's got nothing to do with, uh, again, uh, uh, people have got so into, oh, I've got high cholesterol, I've got arterial disease. Cholesterol issues do not cause arterial disease. Now, um, I had a, had a very good analogy the other day. If you had you know, an alien looking down at the planet and he saw a car accident, you know, he had a bit of a on, on, on your roadways, 
and then suddenly the ambulances move in. You might say, oh, the ambulances are causing the road traffic accidents. Well, the cholesterol is the ambulance. The cholesterol is there to heal and repair the arteries. So if your arteries are being damaged by, I guess, what sugar and alcoholic syndrome, then the cholesterol moves in to heal and repair. And um, um, you can tell, I hope you've bought some blood tests because we get it from blood tests. Okay. But um, it's HDL is, the, is, the, is called the friendly cholesterol. Um, and the point here is HDL is used up in the business of healing and repairing arteries. So if your arteries are damaged, you use up your HDL and you get very low levels. So that is the key measurement. So I don't do what any of your blood tests are wrong, but you can look at your HDL percentages. You know, on a good PK diet, your HDL should be at least 35-40%. I've got two centenarians that I, um, or near centenarians that I um, look after, um, and their HDLs are both over 50%. <laughs> their arteries are in great shape. Are you reverse? Can you reverse? Absolutely. Absolutely, yes. Uh, but the point is, you don't have to have an angiogram to tell us the state of your arteries from an expensive test. You can tell from your HDL. Because if it's a good percentage of the total, it means it's not being used up in the business of healing and repair, ergo they don't need healing and repair, ergo they're not damaged. Another major damager of arteries um, is homocysteine. And I mentioned that there. Um, and you can get homocysteine on a finger drop sample of blood at York Laboratories. I hope I put the, the link in somewhere, but it's certainly in the, in the books um, if you need to get that measured. But that's also a major factor for any. Yeah. I like to see a home system below 10. Um, it's, it, no, the bad news is, it, oh yeah, of course, I, think, I just want to look the other day, it's not expensive. I thought it was 150 quid, it's now come down to about 89 quid, so that's much more doable. And you do it yourself, finger up time for blood, and I like to see that below 10. But you can't do that when you start interpreting um, 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 the blood results. Mm. If you've got problems dating from childhood, so colicky baby, probably diarrhea, eczema, asthma, snotty nose, growing pains, tonsillitis, that's an allergy. You've got an allergic child there. And um, um, a, a very common uh, um, sequence of events is the milk allergic child, which is common, recurrent tonsillitis, gangrene fever, ME. That treatment probably makes up, I know, one in five one in four of the patients who come and see It's a very common sequence. If you've got that sequence in your, on your patients, look for Epstein Barr virus. You know, get all the basic packaging in place, vitamin C, all that stuff. If you're not making progress, get tests on it. Um, arm laboratories for Elispot for Epstein Barr virus and see if you can get self united virus. I might like to choose the herbal ones first, um, but the, the drug ones, we've got four studies clearly showing good results. I have got one or two patients who GPs prescribe it for. GPs get slapped on the wrist and ticked off and told, you know, not to do it. Um, but, but bless them, they plug on. And, um, and that's very helpful. But most GPs won't um, do, do that. Okay, and then people come to me with buckets of tests which have been badly interpreted. Now, um, again, my standard interpretation of all these tests is in ecological medicine on dependencies. It should have been out by now, the book, it isn't, I apologise for that. But I can send the relevant chapter rounds to Mark and he can send it round to you if you want to have a look at it. But have any of you got any blood tests that we can look at? Let me have a look at yours then. Do you mind your tests being made public? Uh, no, they're normal. Of course they're all normal. <laughs> <laughs> that is the joke. They're not all bloody normal. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So A, you know, um, you're told they're normal tests because they've been interpreted badly. So let's have a go at this. And um, um, yeah. right. So let's go see. Okay. So these are standard NHS tests. So we're looking at TTG. So that's um, wheat antibodies. Now. You will be told, oh, that's a normal range, it's safe to eat gluten. Rubbish. Now, I went to a conference the other day and the combined feeling of the members of the conference that, that modern wheats or modern grains are now so dangerous it should be animal food only. Mm. So do not eat wheat. You know, again, that is this dip you can buy. Um, the pollution in there is a very powerful antigen, pollution levels much higher than they ever used to be. Um, they're high in carbohydrates, so they'll be fermented in the gut. They're covered with glyphosate. Glyphosate is the pesticide that is, is causing so much damage at the moment. When it first came out, many of my patients were farmers, 
They used to be told by the, you know, um, the chemical rep who'd come out and tell them what to scrub they can't. This stuff is so safe you can drink. Mm. <laughs> and you don't see that on the tins, obviously, but you know, that was the, the buzzword amongst the farmers. Oh, it's so safe you can drink it. That doesn't cause any problems, you know. Um, it is terrible stuff and it's extremely persistent. It lasts for years in the soil. And we are all poisoned by compost. That is another reason to do your best to eat it as organic as you can and to do regular heating regimes to try at least to keep the levels low as we possibly can. So, so don't eat meat. Okay, vitamin D is 20. Well, that is disastrously low. Um, um, and um, my naughty younger daughter, I never do test my children, my son, but you're going to do them on fair because you know, um, she's very pretty and she doesn't want the sun to spoil her skin. So although she lives in Paris, she refuses to come. If she's listening to this, she'll do a nothing. <laughs> <laughs> we'll edit it out, that's all right. Could you edit that without, Mark? Make sure it doesn't get to Paris, anyway. Um, um, and, and, and so she's got very white skin, despite me, because we should be brown and fair. I measure vitamin D levels and it's on the floor. So that at least persuades us to take vitamin D and get a bit more sunshine. But a level of 20 is far too low. Um, the NHS range is used to be 30 to 60. This one's a bit better, it's 50 to 174. I like to see the vitamin D's above 100. If you go to deepest darkest Africa, they're running in the 200s. And guess what? There's a very, very effective treatment for multiple sclerosis where you give patients super high dose of vitamin D, maybe 50 or 100,000 in, in that use every day, which is dramatically good results. This is a fantastic antibiotic. Now, up, you can take up to 10,000 IU every day with no problem whatsoever. If you don't, if you don't eat dairy products and you shouldn't have a big and you're not taking calcium supplements and you shouldn't, it's safe to take up to 20,000 IU a day. If you take more than that, you've got to keep an arm and serum calcium because you can get hypercalcemia. So if you've got multiple sclerosis and taking 100,000 units a day, I'll insist on monitoring the calcium daily. So, well, regularly until you need to be found out where you're at. Um, but I have to say, I've never found a patient with hypercalcemia yet. Um, despite trying that on, on uh, uh, or my colleagues from the branch patients, but I don't see MSC. Do you mean count of rain? No, a high calcium is killer. You know, you've got to keep the calcium, you know, um, well, certainly below 2.8. If it starts to get up to threes, then you, you, you know, you're over 30. I've never seen it, neither of my colleagues, but it's something you have to be aware of. High calcium causes spinal injuries, things like that. Well, um, you know, uh, high calcium, you, if you get too high, you, the heart would stop. Yeah, so that's when you can't that I know, but, but that's when calcium gets in the wrong place, that's a vitamin D deficiency issue. Um, I mean, calcification of kidney stones, gallstones, and arteries is all about vitamin D, it's not about calcium. Because vitamin D, A, improves the absorption of calcium from the gut, but most important, make sure it gets dumped in the right place, i.e. bone. Um, and if you're taking lots of vitamin C, then you're not, you're not going to form kidney stones. Vitamin C is very good for resolving calcium in the But we don't I, need calcium. I've always been over uh, range with calcium. What's your actual levels are? Do you know the figures? Uh, no, I can remember my vitamin D levels. Which is? 87. Too low. Too low. Yeah. You've got to take 10,000 IU every day, and that brings up I, I take 20,000 IU every day because I don't take any calcium. And when I had mine, I did have mine. I've never taken calcium in my life. You, do you have dairy? I have kefir around here. Well, I know that's dairy, you see. And you know, you should, I mean, grow, kefir is wonderful stuff as so long as you're not yeast allergic, but grow it on coconut milk. Now, to grow it on the, I like, I use the grace coconut milk because it's only 2% carb. And, and you know, with grace coconut milk, I don't feel deprived anymore. I've got my cream. It, does, it is a bit variable, it has to say, and sometimes it, it's thick and goopy, and sometimes it pours like single cream, but it, the only ingredient is coconut milk, that's why I like it. And coconuts are growing high up trees, easy to grow, so it's going to be learned pesticides, they're not just spraying coconut trees. So my guess is you know, it's, a, it's a great food. I try to be self-sufficient at home, and I've got my own pigs and my own garden, but I do import few <coughs> things. I'm afraid that I import coffee, <laughs> and I import the grace coconut milk, which is the partner. I just thought it was my husband um, he went up higher on his vitamin D and he got palpitations. Um, that's not vitamin D. That's not vitamin D. Um, so how high did he get? Was that measured in the blood test? His blood, when um, I did his vitamin D, it was 146. Perfect. I congratulate him, give him a big hug. <laughs> <laughs> and after it goes up to 250. They were blaming vitamin D. They brought it back down because he's got 
content. Well, there's something else going on that is not going to be good. And the other important thing about vitamin B is yes, it absorbs your absorption of, of calcium, but it absorbs improves your absorption of magnesium. And everybody's magnesium deficient. Now, as I was saying earlier, so some people used to do very well on magnesium injections. But now I find with Kishani gut, with Nitina Balcons, big dose of vitamin D, uh, or 10,000 of vitamin D, and some magnesium, then you get magnesium levels up and then you don't become so dependent on injections. Did you see the magnesium alongside the high B? Absolutely. And what about the B? Well, if you've got a, if you've got a good high fiber diet and with my linseed bread, you, will, you should be making your own vitamin K in the best. Um, so I'm not so, I mean, yes, K is great. It's probably these supplements, it's difficult to know where to stop because yeah. they all seem like a good idea. And you end up with, you know, you can't, it just comes on the board. So I'm not, I mean, yeah, in theory, K2 is a great thing. Everyone says, yeah, take it. But it's just phenomenal expense. And, but my view is if you're well PK and you're having some linseed bread and high fiber, your gut should be able to do it itself. Mm -hmm. I, I found when I do that, I just needed so much less sleep to the point where I was almost not sleeping enough. Well, um, I mean, if you need less sleep, that means you must be functioning better. So maybe I just want to take a nap and use it. Well, possibly. Magnesium is nature's tranquilizer and, 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 and helps you off sleep. And that's another good tip for getting off sleep, take the magnesium at night. Um, um, but you know, the bottom line of vitamin D is we evolve running naked under the afternoon sunshine. And 10,000 IU, you might think, oh, that's a lot. That's an hour of sunshine on the skin. And uh, those black everings are getting 12 hours. Will that help with the kind of Absolutely. The further away you go from the equator, the more autoimmunity there is. Why does vitamin D level do that? So vitamin D is absolutely critical. We're all deficient on it. Why? Because we're, we're not got we direct sunshine now. And why do we get through in the winter? It's not because it's cold, it's because there's no bloody vitamin D around. So vitamin D will stop you getting thrown, well, not stop you, but taking the coronavirus as well. So it's one of the supplements we should all be taking. Um, it's in your mineral mix, isn't it? Yes. So, it, so yes. is that enough to take? That's five thousand IU a day. So, if I take the five scoops, whatever it is, yeah. Day, so but these days I use a sunshine salt. Okay. Well, very good to take the five scoops because they 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 are they're pretty disgusting to take mm -hmm. the MMS. But it's a brilliant product, but pretty disgusting. Um, <laughs> and, um, so I've now swapped to sunshine salt. I've got some pots here because it looks like well, it looks like yellow salt. Right. So it's eighty percent molten sea salt. And guess what? Your requirement for salt increases on you. Right. So you need more salt. All this ad, the advice, oh, we have less salt, rubbish. Salt is an essential thing. What was the first trade in this country? The salt trade. Yeah. What does the word salary derive from? Well, we're a historian amongst us. Um, <laughs> um, salt is really important. So it's 80% sea salt. And then I put in there all the other minerals I'm allowed to put in. Magnesium, uh, zinc, copper, selenium, calcium, molybdenum, chromium, the, 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 mm. the whole thing you know. And five milligrams of methyl B12 and 5,000 IU of vitamin D um, because um, they're both heat soluble, everywhere's deficient, and it means you can give the whole family this. So, you know, whilst you're treating yourself, right, and what I do, it sits on the table and you sprinkle on the food. So, you all need to go away with the pot of sunshine. So. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, These are the must buys. So, just talking about vitamin D, um, how would it be helpful? Um, well, interstitial cystitis is allergy to gut microbes, mm -hmm. and um, it's an allergic condition. Yeah. And I think what it is, it starts with the fermenting gut. Yeah. Now, we are taught at medical school that yes, the gut is full of bacteria, and there they stay. We now know that's wrong. They do get into the bloodstream. In fact, if you take blood off someone like who's just brushed their teeth, you will see teeth bacteria, mouth bacteria in the bloodstream. So they get into the bloodstream very easily. Mm -hmm. And they get excreted by the kidneys. Now, if you've had a urinary tract infection you know, ever in the past, the immune system is sensitized to bacteria and, and, and will react to the low dose. If you get recurrent urinary tract infection, <coughs> maybe from these microbes and spilling up from the fermenting gut, the immune system then ends up being permanently active in the bladder. So you get chronic inflammation in the bladder and it's called interstitial dysphagia. So guess what? We're seeing epidemics of it at the moment. Mm -hmm. Treatment. Eugenic diet, so stop supplying the bacteria, kill the vitamin C of our problems. And vitamin C spills over to the urine and it will kill the bacteria in the urine. So it's now the acid of it is, can sometimes be a bit irritant to the bladder, and some people have to neutralize that with some magnesium carbonate. But you know, that is the essence of treatment. And I've got lots of patients well just by that simple intervention. So moving on, um, folate 12.6, well, that's okay. 
388, that's the square root there. The square root there. <laughs> um, um, okay, that will stop you from getting pernicious anemia, but it's not sufficient for normal biochemical function. And um, you need B12 to methylate. Now, methylation is an essential biochemical tool. Without methylation, you cannot read DNA, you cannot hear and repair. Um, uh, B12 is a fantastic um, anti inflammatory. It mops up peroxide nitrite in the brain. It's great for people with foggy brains. I mean, when my, my grandmother was one of the first women doctors, and when B12 came, they could use it. It was the front I think, for disease. <laughs> Of course, in those days, they all could not be using PCM without it. It was not more active, and there was no diabetes, so B12 was being you know, utilised in a uh, fantastic work, so we, she got very good results. I'm sorry, sorry. Uh, when I was in the emergency department, I was having an IV infusion, so I had blood to take a third or two down. So that's why I like to see it. Okay. I like to see it. Well, yeah, stop taking supplements. No. Love it. And the nutritionist is saying it's high because she's taking the version of the nutrients up to the 78th thing. Rubbish. 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 Yeah. Rubbish. You can't have levels too high. As one of my colleagues commented, the only way you could kill yourself with vitamin B12 would be to drown your stuff. Okay. <laughs> yes. so again, it's one of those gorgeous multitasking tools like vitamin C, like ID, like um, uh, that you can do no harm with. You can only do good with it. And I like to see levels above 2000 um, um, and once you say once you've got the gut in non fermented state, there's five milligrams of B12 in the sunshine salt, I, the levels can't be like you well. And the point is, the blood test doesn't re predict response to injections. And some people do well even if they've got you know, levels above a thousand. So they have to use the sunshine salt to feel how to take it in. Correct. Okay. That's a very good start. Mm. And but say so you've got to have a non fermenting gut, so it's absorbed. It gets, gets on. Gut bacteria love B12. Yeah. <laughs> you know, as well. They love it all. Yeah. So, okay. so, 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 what's the range for B12 that's normal? Well, there isn't a normal range. That's the point. You know, the so, higher it is, the better. So, I'm um, understanding it. My brain's going a bit. <laughs> okay, okay. So, you know, again, you can do no harm with the B12. Don't worry about it. Just take the sunshine. But I mean, the, so it's not too low. That's what I mean. Well, in my view, this is too low. Now, yeah. it's not so low that you'll get pernicious anemia. But it's too low for good biochemical function. You're not going to methylate well. You're not moving protein very well. Uh, that DNA very well to make for protein synthesis. You're not moving tox very well. You're not going to methylate very well. Um, you know, it's an essential biochemical tool. So under two thousand is too low, basically. Well, I yeah. It's different for everybody. Yeah. Like okay. If you told that to a neurologist, they'd decapitate me. Right. So what <laughs> I can say from my clinical <laughs> experience and uh, and what's on this. The blood levels are really irrelevant. Yeah. You've just got to take lots of the stuff and guzzle it back. And, and if you inject yourself with it, and who's got the German content? Uh, yeah, it was, yeah. of course it was, yeah. Um, um, you do it, you know. Victoria. Victoria. Victoria's got a contact of a place in Germany where you can buy it yourself and you can inject it yourself. And, and fantastic. I'm looking to, now we're out, now Brexit's happened, I see if I'm going to be in India. It's the cheapest chip mm. in India. Um, um, but it's a great tool, good for foggy brain, lots of people love it. Is there a beta or in the medicine? Well, you need both to make blood. So that's probably, I mean, not directly by chemical, but they're, they're raw materials sort of common to making, you know, to making you know, So that's why some of they've given together folate and B12. Oh, folate, I think it's in iron. Yeah, so she did it. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. B12 and folate are both essential for the yeah. regulation. Yeah. Yeah. And if your homocysteine is high, uh, and that's a risk factor for ME, as we talked about earlier. That's that's symptomatic mm -hmm. for methylations, which you need methyl B12, methyl folic acid, and methyl um, B6. The methylated B6 is in the standard multivitamin that I like to take, and we'll come across in a minute. Injections of okay. B12. Fantastic. Yeah. No, waste of time. Just, just about it. I mean, you judge whether or not you have injections on, on the how to feel factor. And some people get such a clear boost with B12 injections that they never want to be about it. If you don't see, and so, it's, so I usually say half a mil day for a couple of months. If at the end of it, I say, well, it hasn't really made that much difference, I say, well, leave that one off. But if they say, oh, Jim, it's actually probably marvelous, my brain starts to work and I can function, carry on until we get all the other stuff in place. Because they don't need, people don't need injections for life. They need to kind of kick up the system and get going. Can I tell you what, lens is I know, I know, I know, I know. But that's why, if, that's why you just have to do 
all that you can possibly do that's affordable, that you've got the energy to do to get yourself as well as you can, and then uh, spend your precious, precious resources on, on the, the little things that might make a difference. But I agree with that is very important. Would B12, like lack of B12, would that cause too many white blood cells? No, no, no. B12 is an essential raw material for making white cells. And if you've got too high white cells, that means the immune system is activated. We'll, we'll have a look at white cells in a moment. Um, oh, possibly okay. for reasons of chronic infection or um, if you're chronic infection, you have a persistently high white cell count. I'll be thinking the immune system is busy fighting something. So, um, look at the bone profile, um, and that looks all fairly acceptable. Um, again, they so often do immunoglobulins, but it's not a terribly helpful um, test, I have to say. Your IgM is interesting, it's a bit high. Which, which often says it was an acute infection. So if I saw that, um, I, well, it'd be interesting to see what your white cell count is because that might reflect that. Um, okay. And you, so they've done some auto, they've done one autoantibody, it doesn't take that. Okay, here's your vitamin D3 level back again, 62, a bit better, but still miles off. Um, you know, you, 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 my guess is you've got to take um, more of it. And again, remember to absorb vitamin B12, Vitamin D is a fat soluble vitamin, so you've got to have a fatty dark bit to be absorbed. And again, people living on carbohydrates, often they're a low fat dark, they think low fat is healthy, it's rubbish, mm -hmm. um, and therefore they malabsorb vitamin D. Again, that's the bone profile again, which was okay last time. So you have to repeat vitamin D 20, dear oh dear, you've got trouble with that one. Your GP has been very slow at correcting that. Um, um, so let's repeat. Uh, TSH is 1.44. Now that doesn't really tell us very much at all because if you've got secondary hypothyroidism, it's the pituitary that's down, then there will be a normal TSH. So that is no bar. That doesn't mean your thyroid is fine. It means, okay, you don't have primary hypothyroidism, but you could have any other type um, of hypothyroidism. Anybody else got any of those tests they've got with them that might do that? <laughs> okay. So the first one is the glycosate and hemoglobin, which is the measure of how much sugar is stuck onto your um, hemoglobin. And that's not a bad result at 34. Um, um, again, um, they've moved, the reference ranges are now being moved. My lab reference range is 22 to 38, but nowadays it's, you're allowed up to 42, and then you're called pre-diabetic, and you get up to 50, and then called diabetic. So it's a, it's a measure of average blood sugars over the last three months. It doesn't tell us about the wobbles, it doesn't tell us how much it's fluctuating. You could still be running body on carbs and have a reasonable glycosate and hemoglobin, but um, um, so you still need to do the deep diet. diet. Folate above 20, really B12 above 2000, fantastic. I say congratulations. TSH is 2.2. It's starting to creep up a little bit. Um, I say in, I like to see a TSH well below 1.5. In pregnant women, like to see it you know, certainly below 1.5. Um, in America, they start creeping it creeps above 3.0. So I'd say to you, there's certainly scope there for um, a biochem for, um, for, for a trial of metabolism. We've got to be keeping that with first and on some mitral supplements. Ferritin 74 is acceptable. If you've got very high ferritin, that's typical of an inflammation. So um, again, you know, you might be told, oh, your ferritin's near 300, it's only good, well done, you, uh, 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 I don't think so. Why? Because bacteria, from an evolutionary perspective, are much more primitive than mammals. And in that primitive early evolutionary stage, they lived on iron. Iron is their big food source. And bacteria love iron. And so major defense against infection is or lactoferrin <coughs> in breast milk for the breastfed baby, but ferritin in, um, in, in us adults. So the body sequests up all the ferritin, pulls out the way, so that the microbes can't get at it. So it can be too high. Okay. Yeah, I'm just asking what would you, this is an optimal dose. So. Um, well, about 40 to 200, something like that would be fine. But like, I don't want where would you, where would you oh, well, between 40 and 200 is fine. Yeah, it's not, it's, there, there's not a, I mean, it's got to be 77 for perfection. Yeah. In fact, um, I've got these, these ranges from um, a study that's published in America, which, which followed up, I think, about 40,000 patients who were given, you know, blood tests as in their 20s. And they just followed up for decades to see what happened to them. Because most people, because they don't change their lifestyle, they stay pretty similar. 
And what they found is that those, you know, um, they, they picked up the issues that resulted in early death from whatever, whatever. And therefore, they redrew the reference ranges or the optimum ranges for where parameters should lie. And those are the ranges I put in the book, which I will send the chapter to Mark who can distribute it to. But you know, so a very high ferritin is a problem, and a very low ferritin is a problem. Um, 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 so you've got you've got the optimal level. So what, just I mean, I mean like hundreds of levels. What is it in I don't quite manage that. Much. No. Yeah. If it's between 40 and 200, you're in your you're fine. Because it's going to vary, of course. You know, if you, have a, uh, um, if you eat a lot of wine, it's going to go up a bit. And if you don't, it's going to go down a bit. And if you're not absorbing, it's going to go down a bit. So, you know, it's not a fixed thing. It was. Okay, cholesterol 4.8. I have to say, I'd like to see it higher than that. Um, and um, the HDL is 1.52, five, 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 so if they do it the other way around, I'm not my fact that but basically the HDL is about a third of the total, which isn't a bad result, it's about 33%. Um, as I say, the doctors fret when it's below 20%, um, I, with on a good PK, that say you can get up to 40% and, um, uh, fairly easy, but that's not a bad result. So the point about that is, it sound, looks like the artery is in fairly good shape, so I wouldn't be saying, oh, you must get the home system done. If someone's on the ketogenic diet and they've got a really awful HDL, there's something damaging their arteries. So the home system and now it's some infection. Okay. Um, so in calcium, okay. Vitamin D, 129. Well done. It's really good. Is she taking vitamin D supplements to get that level? Yes. There you go. I, have, I don't think I've ever that's seen... About 3,000 in Germany. Well done. I don't think I've ever seen a normal vitamin D in somebody who isn't taking supplements. Why? Because we're told sunshine is terribly dangerous stuff. You know, oh, you'll get skin cancer. Well, it's rubbish. Now, the skin cancer you get from sunshine are the basal cells and the squamous cells. Where do they appear? You know, on the nose, the tops of the ears. Do they kill anybody? No, they don't kill anybody at all. The skin cancer that kills isn't melanoma. Melanoma is not caused by sunshine. How do we know that? Because you get it you know, under the armpits, you know, or at the back of the head or behind the knees. You know, you don't get it in the sun exposed areas. There is another cause of melanoma. Um, but but you know, we are told, you know, oh, don't sunbathe, you'll get skin cancer. What we do know is that on balance, sunshine is highly protected against cancer. It's also highly protected against depression and dementia and heart disease. Guess what? I love sunshine. So, yes, don't go out and fry, you know, in Torre Molinos, you know, and get red. But the more sunshine you get, the better you will be. So, no sunshine, get out there and get in it. And at the end of the summer, you should be with brown berries. No sun cream, no. But it's, do you know what? There isn't a scrap of evidence that sun cream lotions stop cancer. Not a scrap. Not experimental, not epidemiological. But guess what? They make lots of money for the drug companies. Um, and in fact, the way that sun creams work is they absorb the energy from the sun because they're benzene rings. And guess what? Benzene rings are carcinogenic. So it's probably the sun can lotions that are causing the cancer. Mm -hmm. so, no. That's fine. That will stop you burning, but it keeps the skin nice and moist. But I don't use any of my skin work. I've got a bit of seed. So basically, if you're somewhere very hot, and you don't want to burn, what would you do? Just wear long clothes? Exactly. Kind of exactly. Of hats but, yeah, but, yeah. but don't do it pathologically so you never go brown. You know? Go out when the sun's not so strong. Go in the evening or the morning. Yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah. Work out what it takes yeah. to burn. You know, yeah. it's not stupid. You know, um, you know fair people burn. Not much for me. <laughs> <laughs> that, but, but the thing here is the fair people make vitamin D faster. Ah, right. And that's why we are white and the blacks are black. Yes. Because in south, in uh, on the equator, you need a dark skin to protect you from the, the sun, and that's why vitamin D is made in the skin because mm. it's anti-inflammatory and it stops the skin burning the sunshine. Of course, the black pigment reduces it further, but the black people who move north died of vitamin D deficiency, mm. and that's why we evolve white skins because we make vitamin D more quickly from the sun to pair our skins up. So you've got olivaceous in the Mediterranean. We're white. And Scandinavians are, are, are blonde, you know, yeah. are very pale skin, so they make vitamin D very efficient. Mm. But we, despite that, we are still vitamin D efficient. Now, we've got just about enough to get us the childbearing age, and that's all nature cares about. You know, mm. I'm on the evolutionary scrap, even I die tomorrow, nature doesn't care, the evolution doesn't care, you know, I've had my kids, that's it, it's, you know, the Olympic pattern being passed on to the next generation. So as you get older, 
to live your life to your optimum, you have to box tell us. You, know, you have to um, um, do all these things to live to your best. Then they didn't see run down, but they didn't see run down and do the detox proteins. But you know, enjoy the benefits of modern life because guess what? I love the fact I've got food security. I love the fact I'm not going to be you know, attacked by some neighbouring tribe. I love the fact I've got you know, a nice warm house that, that doesn't let the rain in. I can stake up my wood burning stove and be nice and comfy there. I love the fact, you know, that's what I want from modern life, but I also want the best of primitive life. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't like the pollution or that, but you know, that's difficult, I can't avoid it. So, um, bone profile is um, acceptable. Yeah, presumably you've got that. Okay, Billy Rubin is nine, that's good. I like to see that below 12. Um, the reference range on here will be, well, some say up to 19, some say up to 20. But um, um, if it was above 12, I'd say you've definitely got to take glutathione. We should probably be taking glutathione every day anyway, because we live in such a toxic world, and those toxins are unavoidable. Um, alpine phosphatase is fine, I don't know why they flag that up. Uh, ALT, that's good, that's 19. Now, again, I like to see ALT, AST, and gamma GT below 20. Um, these are in enzymes that are induced in the liver. So, the classic one we all know about is gamma GT. So, if you drink too much alcohol, your gamma GT goes up because the liver's working hard to detox that alcohol. But if you are fermenting, then you're producing toxins that the liver has to detoxify, and it uses ALT and AST to do that, and you get high levels. So is that um, an indication that maybe you're looking for an antidote? Yes, or it's minimal. So she's done a good job, a pretty good job there. Um, so her ALT is 19, so it likes to be below 20. But the reference range here is actually 40, for example. Why is it high? Oh, because, you know, if, if the people in their products, you know, making guts are very common and, and, and high ALT are very common. And so they've moved the reference range. Um, sodium, one for one. Again, the reference range is set ridiculously low. The reference range is 133 to 100. 146. I like to see it above uh, 140 or above because 130, you haven't got the sodium necessary for good cellular function. So eat salt. Again, we're seeing low levels of sodium in the blood because everybody's told not to eat salt um, and therefore the record trying to change, but that is too low. Potassium mm. good, creatinine good. Again, it's common to see creatinine's low end of the brain because they reflect muscle mass as well as kidney function. So kidney's working fine. But she's got slightly better muscle mass, which is what you expect some people can't exercise. Mm -hmm. Urate is fine. ESR is nine. Now that's a bit high. Uh, again, the reference range for that has changed over the years. ESR is a measure of inflammation of blood. It's, it's, it's a called the type seven notation. I like to see it below five. It's at nine. Um, when I was at medical school, the reference range was below five. On here, it's up to twelve. Um, I saw one patient came through the other day, the reference range now up to 20 and, and 30 if you're old. Well, you know, so what they're saying now is that the NHS test for acknowledging that as you get old, there's inflammation going on. And instead of saying, well, let's ask why is there inflammation going on, it's, oh, well, let's move the reference range. You know, that's easy. Oh, you're normal, you're fine, you know. I don't think so. So that's why it's so important to get the test interpreted correctly. And the White cell count 4.3, well that's acceptable, and the reference range is 4 to 11, but it's one of those ranges that's negatively skewed. So a normal white cell count is 4 to 6. If it's above that, it means you're fighting a huge infection. Again, the reason they put it to 11 is so that everybody has a proper cold, you know, it goes in and, and has white cell, a temporary white cell count of 9 or 10, I think they've got the key. That's why they do it. But um, if you have a, a level of, you know, of that, and then I want to be in person that day, let's each get some tea marks and make it fun and fun. Hemoglobin is fine. Size of cells I always look very carefully at, um, uh, is also fine. But again, the reference range is set from 78 to, 90, to 97, sometimes it's 100 and something. Again, this paper I was telling you about, the optimum size of red cells shouldn't be less than 86 and shouldn't be more than 94. Lower than 86 is typical of iron deficiency or maybe mineral deficiency. Higher than 84, 85 is typical of um, hypothyroidism or B12 folate problems. So the red cells can be too big. So the size can give us a clue. But you know, I so often have people coming in, at, at the MCB comes up at 100, and, and they've been told, oh, it's normal, but it, I don't think so. The point of the thyroid and um, methylation issues. 
But it's all okay. The white cell differential is acceptable. So, so not too awful as it's up, but the thyroid hasn't been properly tested. Um, um, the NHS test for adrenal function you can ignore, so they're useless. Of course, there's no test of mitochondrial function here, um, and there's no test of, 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 of what the blood sugar levels are. I don't know. So the bottom line, you know, do the PCNH diet, etc., etc., etc. Did that test the Okay. Um, well, that's for the thyroid. Okay. Well, um, that's no. She's got a reasonable spike in the morning. The adrenal stress profile is a test that people commonly do. And um, um, what we look at that, first of all, um, um, look at the cortisol level. And cortisol, as I mentioned earlier, should spike in the morning and then come down as the day goes on. So her samples are 11 o'clock, 4 o'clock, and 10 o'clock are all the day. So she's got adrenal fatigue, the adrenals are exhausted, fine, whatever, whatever. Um, and the DHEA levels are um, not too bad. So I would probably give some much water and cream. Okay, wrong, because we did buy the, uh, what was it, Swanson or something? Oh, the Swanson Green Blender. But the nutritionist said, no, she's a bit too much of a punch. Oh, I'm not sure about that. But um, um, the DHA levels are acceptable. So, um, uh, I mean, how are Green Blends will recover? That's the point. Yeah. With a bit of high water and cream. When you turn into an old crone like me, <coughs> the Green Blend declines with age. Mm. And I do with age, we should probably all be taking it. Um, I, I have to, I don't get but um, I'm sure the time will come because the dream lines do go down with age. Not my work, but the work of Hans Celia. Do you have Hans Celia? Great guy. But Red Book called the Stress of Life. Um, it's all about the dream function. And really, the clinicians haven't absorbed his work and uh, haven't progressed from that either. Okay. There were some um, things saying, you know, if you start to supplement too much of it, then your body doesn't start balancing it's its, its own levels. It's all about the degree of dosing. And um, we're not, not giving, I mean, the point is, is that the physicians are, are terrified about steroids. If you use some of the then you will be precisely that. Mm -hmm. That's because they use far too big a dosis to control inflammation in the body. So the key is to use physiological doses. So you're just giving it a break and not suppressing it and giving it a window of time to recover. And so if you're young, you will. Once you're old, then you're doing the function declining anyway, probably are. You should all be taking steroids. How much would you take? Well, between, you do as much as temperatures, but between 350 and 700 milligrams would be a reasonable dose that's not since the So if you just want the insurance dose, you take 350 milligrams a day. If you're not going to do any harm with that, you might be a lot of good. Well, that's great stuff. I mean, I've, I've moved simply because we can't get it to the the moment. You know, the guy um, oh, really? had manufacturing, you know, you know, the manufacturing problem. So we ran out of it, so that's why I stopped the response. It's actually a bit cheaper. Yeah, it's very expensive. I'm not sure it was doing anything, so I'm just going to stop it. Well, understandably, but you've got, it's not the work unless you've got the diet and the gut and everything else in place, right? So you can get back on the mouse. So if I just have to report some, it should be low to do the problem. No, it's high in the morning. High in the morning, and then it declines as the day goes on. And if you take the cream, you just do it once a day in different spots. Well, the high court, yes, I mean, um, it goes through the skin very well, but yes, um, at least um, once a day is probably, I'd probably do a, say, do a smear of in the morning and then one at midday, so nearly the normal week. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that just gives you cortisol when you push That just gives you cortisol. But the thing is, um, cortisol is the most important dream hormone. I mean, we can all live without testosterone, without estrogen, without um, progesterone. If you have if you if you have a lack of cortisol for a few days, you've done about this. So cortisol is the most important adrenal hormone. So the adrenal gland will make cortisol at the expense of everything else. Um, that's why I'm slightly surprised that the DHA was okay and the cortisol was low, because that doesn't quite square with that theory. But um, the point is is the cortisol, just cortisol will take enormous pressure off the adrenal gland because it can then shunt the adrenal hormones into other into other areas. I've had um, my cortisol. Uh, tests, saliva tests, four in a day, taken a year apart. Mm -hmm. They're not awfully different, mm -hmm. are they? Okay. Uh, the, the Geneva test. Okay. Um, and my thyroid um, GSH is pretty well always over 10. Oh, God. And my T4 is nearly always around 11. And my T3, well, about three. Oh, that's good. You know, you're, you've been very badly treated. That's not.
not that's I mean what's your body is using adrenaline instead of thyroid hormones and cortisol follows that. Um, so you absolutely must get away with a potty metal B and that will try to save it. And what dose you got up to? Um, uh, I can only take one fifteen. I think it's fifteen. Okay. Maybe one. If I take two, I bore them all day. Okay, well, uh, are you are you PK? No. Well, you've absolutely got to do that, and you will find you should be a lot more tolerant of that at that point. So I would... Um, um, and I'm copper toxic. How, how do you know that? Um, I've had four blood tests. Oh, so you've got Wilson syndrome? Five. No, well, they won't, won't say that. Okay. My, my ratio is 0. 0.64. Okay. And it's should be one to one. Okay. Um, well, so I can't can take any, anything. As it it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't. I know. Too. Oh, really. I know. But what I you have, have to remember is that a high serum copper is an inflammation symptom. So I'd be asking, why are you inflamed? And it's back to allergy, chronic infection, and all that sort of stuff. And actually, thyroid and green hormones are good anti-inflammatories as well. So I don't not in any doubt you need them, but you have to get yourself in a state where you can tolerate it. Um, and again, if, if you have that bad record for tiny desk thyroid, I'd be saying oh, take some of the new glands then because that helps to mitigate that. So say first get PK, because that stops your blood sugar doing that. Um, I did take it and I thought what much worse. I know but you can't do that until you're PK. That's why there's a certain order about this. Okay. So, um, so get get PK adapted and, and off grains and dairy and yeast, and then get up to the vitamin C, and then and then retry and start tiny tiny doses and go about really slowly. Mm. Can I ask you? I mean, I have got blood tests. I have right. got mitochondrial function yeah. profile. If I <laughs> very have to keep touching that. This is actually a little bit old, but it's kind of very basically typical. Okay, so you have mito tests. Yes. Well, um, um, the trouble is they're not very available for, for people, so I'm not going to great depth, but you've got very, le very low ATP, so um, um, you might well benefit from demyodose. Right. Because that allows you to recover more quickly. So that tells, that loan tells your mitochondria are going slow. Um, your magnesium is a bit is low at 0.61, should be above 0.65. If somebody's below 60, I say definitely try magnesium injection. Yeah, so that's why it's told me. That is, um, yes. Okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so that's why that has helped because it's kick-starting your um, mitochondria. The, your ability to make ATP is slow at 56.7. Mm. Um, now, that can be slow because you're deficient in something or because it's blocked by something. Mm. Um, so, and the deficiency is it's the old story. Do they do your B3 levels and your calm team, your KQ10 as well? I don't think so because I had to pay for those because I couldn't get my GP to sort of no, no, do wouldn't. anything. So yeah. I just did, I thought that was the key, one of your key tests. Well, so. it's a very, it's yes. a very helpful thing. Yeah. Right. What we can see is that your oxyphosphorus is going a bit slow because you're blocking. So you've got some sort of toxic stress blocking. You're allowed, you like, they like it to be, um, um, I'll come back to side uh, They've got that the wrong way around. It should be less than 14. So it's slightly blocked. Right. So either, which would be either heavy metals or pesticides or volatile organic compounds. And then looking at transacate protein studies, um, again, they're both going, they're both slow. So you, you, so you are toxic with something. Right. And by, uh, they worked at your mitochondrial energy score, which is 8.37. Mm -hmm. So you only got 37% of the energy available compared to the lowest limit of reference range. Right. So your mitochondria are going, you know, about a third of what they should be doing. Right. So, um, and you treat that by giving them raw materials and treating the blockaging and giving them the right fuel. Are there any other tests on this? No, sorry. Yeah, that's, fine. <laughs> that's fine. Is there so, any other things I should be reading? Well, as I say, don't spend the money on tests. No, okay. Do the regime. Do, do the regime. Spend yes, the money yes. on the grub. Yeah. And the and the ketone breath music. Right. So don't worry, that I can spend all your money very easily. Yeah. Do the important things first. Take sunshine salt, the multivitamin, you know, and um and, and just spend the money on on getting sauna, for example, because we're all yeah. the course of it. So, so, most, so from that, that would be your main Absolutely, yeah. absolutely, yeah. And um and the details all in the books. Um, and, and if you're struggling or you know, if you had dental amalgam or you had lead pipes in your house as a child 
or you've had dental braces, or you've had more fractionations, then do you have your methods? Yeah. And the details of, of, of how to do that are on, there's a link to my website page, on the back page, uh, you're interested in DMSA, there's a link there to um, uh, where you get the test done and how you can get about doing that. So if you've got a gradual onset of ME with exposure to dental amalgam, lead water pipes, you know, I should put vaccinations in there, um, then you then do that test. Yes. So do the DMSA test. Yeah, that's a yes. useful test to do because, yes. um, uh, okay, all the stuff we're doing will help pull out those heavy methods. But DMSA does work really well. Right. Um, and um, I know some practitioners say, oh, it's mobilising, but I don't buy that. Mm. It brings out the rather well. Would you mind going through my immunology ones? Yeah. 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 Sure. Um, yeah. 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 I have to say, I, I, I never ask for immunology tests. They just don't tell us oh, well, very much useful. Well, I didn't um, um, well, I'll have to quick. I mean, but basically, the immunologists, I have a league of arrogance of, of consultants, I have to say, and at the top of the endocrinologists, closely followed by the immunologists and then the neurologists. You know, they are arrogant doctors who don't think causation, who look at the test, all normal, and tell you to go away. Yeah, so many of my patients have bad experience with those doctors. Actually, the best doctor of all, the orthopedic surgeons. That's really brilliant. <laughs> they're really good at you know, saying, well, that's the problem, we'll fix it with this, and away you go. You know, they're fantastic. <laughs> so they're my heroes, really. The trouble is that you've got a metal team that works, and that's the key one. You want to use them. But, um, but they are the best doctors because they do at least diagnose. So, again, they give you all these tests about the immune system. But they're not specific, you know, they might tell us that, you know, it's a bit, you know, active, be harmful, active, but they're not sufficiently specific. And the treatment of, of these, of results with which are a bit more line, can be all the stuff that we're going to do. You know, improve the immune defences, you know, um, stop feeding the bugs with, with, with sugars and carbs, kill them with vitamin C, it's all the same stuff. But they will use this as an excuse to say, oh, there's nothing wrong with you, um, look, no antibodies, you know, off you go. Yeah, because I asked him for testing for viruses. Point blank refused because yeah. he said the IGs were fine. Yeah. And again, tests for allergies, barely worth the paper they're printed on. I wouldn't right. place too much thought by that. They're doing antibodies, auto antibodies or something, um, levels. Now, they, they've given you the normal ranges here, you know, less than 0.2. But the fact of the matter is, there shouldn't be any auto antibodies. Mm -hmm. it's, if you start making any auto antibodies, it's not normal state of affairs. Okay, so your white cell count's a little bit high, it's 7.8. I'd like to see it for, say, 4 to 6. So I would probably say, oh, let's repeat that in a month. And if it's still high, mm, I suggest your immune system's a bit active. It's been high for a while, because I had it tested a while. Okay, well, so. you've got um, some sort of chronic infection, is my guess. So, mm -hmm. um, but, so don't go and spend gazillions of money looking for the infection. Do all the groundhog, you know, chronic stuff. Why? Because that often gets people well without having to spend those money on tests. And I know that because I've seen it happen. So do the basic stuff well. And so everybody's looking for, you know, the thing. Mean cell volume is, is, is acceptable. Um, um, Sodium is only just okay at 140. You know, I like to see it you know, 140 or above, so keep um, eating salt. Uh, again, kidneys are fine, calcium is fine, um, um, calcium is fine. Give you even to 11, oh, that's good. I like to see that below 12, so you're not far out. Alkaline phosphate, again, it's 80. I like to see it below 80. Alkaline phosphate is a measure of liver damage. Common school, I guess, what is blood? Um, um, but it shows the liver is slightly damaged. So again, they give their reference range 30 to 130, but I like to see it below 80. ALT is good at 16, so you're probably not, uh, no obvious fermentation. That doesn't mean you're not fermenting, it just means you haven't got something that's fermenting that can give an enzyme. It's, it's just a little pointer. Mm -hmm. But if it's high, I'd say, well, you are. CRP is good, therapy 75, that's fine. So, nothing too awful there, but I'll put money on, you know, chronic infection and things, but there's other ones. Well, I know I'm repeating myself, okay, but um, hopefully that people don't mind that. But the, the elephant room here is your TSH is 3.56. Now, had you lived in America, you would need to stop that. Before that, it was 1.2. Well, you need thyroid hormones, don't mean any question about that. T4 is 15.7. Again, your reference range is a bit low, 10 to 25, so it's a bit of a wide one. But there's certainly biochemical scope for thyroid thyroid hormones. And your T3, again, 4.8, there is scope for a trial. So um, 
um, we're going to make our way that we end today. But we don't do it. And so we've done Richard Garth, the Vincency, and all else. So much less with Billy Rubin's fine. Um, um, so that's a repeat of what we've done. Right, so count 6.8 again, as so you say, that's been a bit hard before. Um, 8 0 and 6 is good, so that's, that's not too bad. Again, cortisol. Cortisol doesn't really tell us very much because cortisol is a very reactive form and it spikes up at the slightest thing. So if you get told by your doctor, oh, your cortisol is normal, therefore your adrenals are fine, ignore it. If you get told, oh, we've done a short synaptic test at time, you don't have an adrenal problem, ignore it because they are looking for complete adrenal failure. And we're looking for adrenal fatigue. So the NHS test up does not show you. Do you think the saliva test is good? Yes, I think the saliva tests are much more reliable. There's another TSH in there which is 3.66, so you have an abnormal one at least two occasions. Vitamin D101, so it's just about okay, so I like to see it above 100. Um, um, out of the FF72, so that's a repeat. I think all these repeats, aren't they? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I've got it sorted out quickly. That's the same again. TGD, ignore that. Um, you shouldn't be having um, grains regardless. Okay, so yeah, some of those repeats again. B12, 669, ignore that. Um, Folate's a bit low. Again, it makes me laugh. They write on this tell the patient normal. So patronising. That's what I put there. Four point seven is not optimal. You, you know, I would certainly um, give you some um, folic acid, but there's there's some folic acid in just a good multivitamin. So yeah, okay. Okay, and that was when your B twelve was. Uh, your vitamin D is eighty five, bit low. So I hope you took some vitamin D three. Yeah, I've been taking my doctor's supplements. Doctors, do you know how much training doctors get yeah, in I nutrition? Know, you know, I've tested regularly between the huge and yes. I'm usually between 40 and 60, and the doctor, the doctor said, my mum, most recent doctor, it's actually fine. On the lower side of the moment. When I asked her to taste it before winter, because I've been in the sun, she said, NHS standards now is that every adult should be taking. And they are not to be tested anymore. So she wouldn't even test Well, they're trying to save money, as you know. But the bottom line is, it's fabulously safe stuff. Yeah. So, you know, you take 10,000 units every day, no problems at all. And if you've got an inflammatory tendency, as long as you're not having dairy for you're having calcium, you can take up to 20,000 IU, no problem at all. Above that, you should probably get the calcium check. Well, I have to say, I've never seen that normal one, but you know, it's just one that needs to be done. And the calcium is a cheap test, that is a few quid. Um, and you can do many of these tests on finger drops on the blood, you can do it yourself. And if you look on natural health worldwide, you can do laboratories when you get tests done, and uh, and they will accept um, uh, any calcium from anybody. Can I ask on the thyroid if you, um, if you make as many checks tests that you can get Yeah, they're great, they're fine. That's it. You have to interpret the tests. Mm -hmm. They are not absolute results. You always have to look at the clinical picture, how you are, measure your temperature, check your pulse, check your blood pressure, get all these gadgets you know at home. Um, and um, then one day we will have our uh, fine time clever guy who can put all this on the computer algorithm. Mm -hmm. And you will just punch in all the data and you'll get a proper reply. So if, if you know any computer whiz can see you, um, uh, that see me fast. afterwards. That would be a fantastic <laughs> project. And, uh, Put it out there so it's free for anybody to put in all their bloods and it will say, well, there's a 36% chance this and 48% chance that or whatever. But um, uh, that would be a wonderful project. I'd love to do that. Okay, so um, not much here. Now, your sodium is dreadfully low. 133 is a disaster. So not enough salt. Um, um, you know, I like it to be... And he has actually said low here. I mean, you would be appalled. I've had several patients with heart failure, which are not complicated. And they're all on diuretics, and they're all 12 salt. Mm -hmm. And they have savings in the 120s and stuff like that, and they're disastrous to them. That alone will cause heart failure. And they're told to avoid salt. And they and they were people of, don't eat salt. And I, you know, I mean, they always have to torture them to pour salt down their necks, even though they're so brainwashed. But you know, um, that is is too part of it. Your TSH is too high, three point one eight. You need you need next week. You know, my guess is at least a half million screens and possibly more. 
it's uh, a, a tool I use all the time. It gets misused because people don't use it up. My dear stuff, you've got to use it responsibly, not just for your own sake, but for the, the sake of the whole fire community who's using it responsibly and keeping under the rats. How do you know how much you're going to take into the rat shower and what's enough? Uh, because um, uh, your pulse will go high, your blood pressure might shoot up, you might feel hyper, and your core temperature will increase. So you do it on the how do you feel. But that's okay. exactly what happened to me when I took to. I know, but that's because you, you weren't PK and you were spiking adrenaline as well. I, I think as well for me, because um, I'm, I'm doing the sort of temperature measurements yeah. and I'm trying to work out the level. And um, well, that might be because you're trying to run, your body's trying to have a fever. Yeah, it's an infection thing. You know, I, you know I'm, I'm giving it as, in a simplistic form, but life is complicated and, 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 and that's why you have to be your own doctor. So I'm just giving you the basic principles, as I put it, the rules again. It's a little bit like playing cricket. You know, the rules of the game of cricket are exactly the same, but every player is individual and has their own forefathers and their own strengths. And I think you have to work on things that they're good at and they're bad at. And, you know, that's what I'm, you know, I'd love to micromanage you all, but it just ain't possible. Mm. <coughs> in an ideal world, I think we'd all have our own doctor, wouldn't we? You know, that would be the, the <laughs> yeah, but you, but you do, and it's you. Yeah. And yeah, actually, the word comes from the Latin "docere," which means the teeth. Yeah. And um, somebody told me, I don't think it's right, that, that doctors in um, China only get paid for their well patients. Was. <laughs> <laughs> About 2000 years ago. Uh, okay. <laughs> so, so I'm a bit out of date on that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nice yeah. idea, though. <laughs> the, the, the theory goes that the birth of doctors, uh, there was very little in the way of finance because people were paid by bartering and by goods. Um, but uh, we didn't live in a, a decent house and get hampers, if you like, and decent food. Doctor, and he has a lot of real patients, mm. but you live like a king, so you're all healthy. The possibility is quite small, not good. Mm. Mm. Um, and the curious, curious thing is that diet comes first, then herbs, acupuncture right at the back end, Absolutely. whereas we use it so badly. Uh, uh, uh. Okay, the interesting thing is though your, your TSH is, you obviously need thyroid hormones, your free T4 is 17, and most people say, oh, that's fine. I'm sorry, I'm yeah, sorry. Um, 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 and you know, you might be one of those people who don't feel well to your Right, so, do I, should I go on metabolism? Absolutely. But get PK adapted first, yeah. use the breath test um, to make sure you are, you're yeah, doing that. You're doing. Yeah. They didn't see to bowel Mito package in place. It takes about four months of mitochondrial supplement yeah. sign over for mitochondria to recover. But I wouldn't wait till once, you know, after two months they've been up there to get going to recover. Because there's a certain momentum about that recovery. Yeah. And if people lose momentum and get get this, you know, get, get discouraged, they slip on the dark and the dark falls apart and the whole crumbling edifice you know, goes to the top to the ground. So you've got to keep the, the pressure up to get well. That is the key. So sort of about so maybe three or four weeks to get keto adaptive. Then oh, um, no. you get keto adapted in a couple of weeks. Right. So so and then, weeks, yeah. and then you get up to bowel pump deficiency very quickly in a few days. And then you see. Mm, and that clears out the bugs and up. And then you start absorbing the, 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 the goodies and your supplements, the B vitamins and the minerals. And it takes I'd say at least four months for the mitochondria to really recover. I don't think it's done perfectly, but in a few weeks of that will get you well on the way. And that's when you start taking the bit of these. Yes. yes. Yes, um, because there's a whole balancing act between them, you know, okay, I'll give you an order that sounds very neat and comfortable, but actually you need thyroid, thyroid to fat burn, so you have got a bit of thyroid, uh, then you're never going to get there sort of thing, so to do it all gradually, gently, and monitor, mm. you know, learn to check your pulse, it's easy, get a blood pressure cuff, do measure your core temperatures, because they're all nice objective measurements, and if you're not sure, Okay, you can get the blood test done, give you a guide and look at that well worldwide. It tells you where you can get them done. Mm. Okay, monocytes. Oh, um, yeah, total white cell count is a bit high, it's 6.7. Um, and so we then have to ask is it the, 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 the neutrocytes or the neutrophils? And it looks as like if it's the neutrophils are a little bit towards higher than they would, would be. 
which might point to a, a bacterial infection. Mm. Now, there are four bugs that come up time and time and time again in my any patient. Epstein Barr virus, um, mycoplasma, and we're seeing epidemics at the moment of mycoplasma pneumonia. Uh, it's called atypical pneumonia or walking pneumonia. Just keep having pneumonia, but they don't feel too awful with it. Um, well, in that worse, it would be well worth getting mycoplasma on at uh, arm in and maybe taking um, doxycycline for some um, weeks or months uh, because that's a very good antibiotic for mycoplasma. Um, it nails it reliably well. Um, and then um, Lyme disease. And the third one are uh, chronic fungal infection and mycotoxins. So if anybody is presenting with sinusitis, you know, snotty noses, chest, blah, 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 and they live in a water damaged building, because that's what we do with the water damaged buildings, um, that's worth considering. Now, you're probably aware of some work done, recently done by a guy called Joseph Brewer. Now, in um, June, I'm running a conference in London about my moles and mycotoxins, and Jennifer is coming here to talk, as is David Denny, who's a world authority in aspergillosis, as is our three speakers in Finland talking about the immune disorders, as is um, um, Joe Brook talking about fungi. And he published a paper, um, he, well, he, he was asking the question, do these you know, any patients have chronic fungal infections? And uh, what do fungi do? They produce toxins, they produce mycotoxins, we mentioned them earlier from the American book. And he developed a test that measures mycotoxins in the urine. And what he found is that 90% of any patients had high levels of mycotoxin in the urine. And he then went on to treat it with intranasal amphotericin, which is an antifungal drug, and um, something like 80% of them improved and so on. It was an astonishingly good result. So I thought, well, this is interesting. So I started measuring mycotoxins in patients. Now, the fact of the matter is, I've never seen a normal result. Everybody's got some. Why? Because we all live in water damage buildings. But mycotoxins are toxic. I mean, all antibiotics are mycotoxins. What's penicillin? It's a mycotoxin. You know. What's streptomycin? It's a mycotoxin. What's cephalosporin? It's a mycotoxin. You know. What's mycophenolic acid that's used as an immunosuppressive? It's a mycotoxin. So it's, it's all about the total load again. Uh, and mycotoxins produce antibiotics because if you look at life from the point of view of a fungus, if it's made itself at home, you know, comfortably in, in somebody's armpit or somebody's nose, the last thing once another bug is moving in. So they produce toxins to keep the environment clean so that just they can inhabit it. It stops the bacteria from invading. But they're, you know, some of them are fairly benign, but some of them are very nasty toxic substances. So mycophenolic acid, for example, is used by doctors to suppress the immune system and give you lots, you know, tissue transplant, for example or if their immune system is overactive, you know, it's a very nasty toxic compound. Um, and so if they've got high levels of urine, what do you do about it now? I said Brewer was treating using intranasal um, antitericin. Now we can't get antitericin in this country. He repeated the study and got just as good results with my statin. But guess what I'm using? Contact kills everything. Dirt cheap. Anybody can use it. I know it works for chronic sinusitis. I know it works for bronchi exercise. I know it works for acute pulse and folds and flus. It's a fantastic tool. You never, you won't hear about them anywhere else. Why? It's too cheap. They didn't make any money. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's you know, it's the old story. of money. And if you think the NHS and Big Pharma are there for the benefit of patients, mm -hmm. let me tell you, they are not. They're there for the benefit of themselves. In fact, in the EQ Med group, I've, um, book that's coming out, I've got a lovely cartoon in there, which is a picture of a, a man in a white coat and. It's, it's medical students, first year at medical school, pointing at the blackboard. Remember, mem remember boys, and he said, or girls, boys and girls, yeah. a patient cured is a customer lost. What about the June Saturday? You said that that was June in London. Oh, yes, yes, yes. It, it, um, it is the Saturday, the 13th of June. Um, um, and um, uh, it's, the, it's a BSEM meeting, it's first come first served, it, it, it'll, be, it'll be a great meeting um, and I'm very much looking forward to that. We, we learn a lot more about mycotoxins, but the treatment is, is, is the same. It, it's, you don't detoxify the mycotoxins, you have to get rid of the fungi. Where are they? In the airways, in the gut, in the perineum maybe, on the skin, 
or in the environment. So if you're in a, in a nasty, wet, you know, water damaged building, get out of it. It's legal. Now, the best, a very good test for people who've got, uh, you know, am I having a problem for, because of, of mould in the environment is go away to a holiday in a hot, sunny place. And if people say, and I've got one patient, in, and she said, like, I feel marvellous when I'm in Greece. Yeah. Hot summer. After three days. Mm. Like I've been for three days. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you may well have a mock problem there. You may well have a problem. But then, I mean, there are lots of things when you're away. Again, it's warmer. And when the body is physically warmer, we go faster. I mean, that's why athletes warm up before they take exercise. That's why, you know, reptiles someday before they can really, you know, move fast, they actually have to warm up. And so it's another one of vicious cycles in chronic disease. Because if your whole cortex is cold, then nothing's going to go fast, you know. Um, you know, it's the same bolt that a wind is 100 meters, and he's at 40, 30, 40 degrees. I don't think so. In fact, during the London Olympics in 2012, more records have broken the cycle in the velodrome than ever before because they kept it 29 degrees. Mm. That was the temperature for optimum metabolism of the, the body and they broke all the records. Mm. Now, 29 degrees is quite hot. Mm. I mean, it doesn't get 29 degrees very often in this country. Mm. Um, so, you know, we're all bloody cold mm. all the time. So that's why you felt better because you're in the velodrome, effectively. So you're, 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 but also, hot means dry and dry means no molds. I mean, if, if, the, if the humidity is about 40%, molds can survive. And they can grow on anything. They can grow on glass, they can grow on wood, they can grow on anything. So you've got to be dry. So, um, so hot dry is, is good. Cold dry is good. Because above 3,000 feet, the air is so thin it can't hold the moisture. So skiing holiday, not you guys who can't ski, but if you find great up the top of the mountain, that's a good clue. If you feel great right on the coast, onshore winds blowing in, you know, uh, guess what? Molds can't grow on salt water, so it's going to be low molds. That's, that's a good clue. So those are all the good clues you've got a mold issue. Mm. Treatment, same old stuff. Get rid of them from the nose, get rid of them from the gut, with the gut, get rid of them from the perineum, with iodine oil, tampons, whatever. Get rid of any skin fungal infection, nail fungal infection, whatever, with topical iodine. Um, get from that water damaged building. Um, and, and if you want to do it for testing, they say how cold it is. Can I ask you one more quick question about inflammation in, in the gut? Yeah. Because um, I'm not on a PK diet, so I know that I need to do that. But yeah. I found that when I am sort of eating, um, not eating carbs, I'm still getting some symptoms of inflammation. It's like, well, it doesn't go down overnight. No. And also, once those microbes are in there and at home, they're, they're difficult to, to, to dislodge. That's right. why the vitamin C is so helpful. Right. So it really is a two pronged approach. Okay. Mm. Can I ask Oh, go on. Yeah. Um, yeah, you go on. Yeah. Oh, no, I was just going to ask in terms of the blood tests, you said that a high white blood cell count uh, signifies chronic infection. Um, mine are very low, like my neutrophil is very chronically low. Um, I haven't had them being tested recently because I was first really yeah. ill. So I wondered, and I was told that that signifies it. Well, yes, because, because, you know, the, um, in order to put out white cell counts at high level, the bone marrow has got to be very busy. And the bone marrow is the immune system effectively. It's like, a, it's like the brain, it's full of fat. And for the bone marrow to keep throwing out you know, immune soldiers, it needs a lot of energy and it needs a lot of raw materials. So it's the same old stuff. Give the bone marrow the energy and the raw materials and it'll function fine, thank you very much. But you know, if, you, if it hasn't got the energy, because your mitochondria down, because your power is down, because your diet's awful, hasn't got the raw materials because they're not absorbing, whatever, whatever, then yes, it will go down and you will be immune suppressed as a result of that. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's basically from all this stuff in the wood of evidence. And when I do tests at Armin Laboratory, very often we do hematology, and he does CD57 and natural killer cell counts. And the ones with chronic infection often have disastrously low levels because the body is exhausted by fighting its family. Mm -hmm. And it just cannot put out the white soldiers, white cell soldiers, to fight the rest of the infection. Mm -hmm. um, so again, it's, you have to groundhog chronic, chronic as a call, mm -hmm. you know, in space, do it really well. Um, and if not making progress, then try and identify the infection and give the immune system a helping hand by targeting that infection, whether it's inhaling iodine or giving the seat of bowel products, or maybe Lyme disease herb, or maybe uh, valocyclin antiviral drugs, or maybe doxycycline mm -hmm. antibacterial drugs, or whatever. Mm -hmm. So get the basic stuff in place first and then try and identify the big issues that are left over. But the point is, if you do get the basic stuff in place well, the clinical picture clears up and becomes less fuzzy. 
and it's more obvious then what the outstanding problems are. So would you expect, because this was a while ago, I've improved a lot since then, so would, if I had the test redone, would I expect my future field to be higher now? Yes, yeah, I would. Okay, I would. Okay. Um, and I was just going back to the yeah. point you were talking about um, the fermenting guts. Yeah. Um, and I can't tolerate physical source acid, um, which means that I'm doing that using water sorbate, which is neutral. Uh, well, what's cheaper than that is just to add magnesium carbonate. Right. Yeah, it's much okay. cheaper because magnesium sorbate is expensive. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, because I'm just sort of wondering the whole if I can't tolerate it and I have a fermenting gut, even though I'm doing, I am doing a vegan diet. But I've got um, sort of interstitial cystitis, and that's sort of kind of a recent symptom. Um, and I'm just wondering if it's got something to do with the fact that I can't tolerate acidity um, in this way. Well, that, that you've got an irritable bladder. And yeah. once something is irritable, the slightest thing will upset. Right. You know, a bit of acid, a bit of cold, um, a few bacteria, you know. Um, so you just have to damp the whole thing down. And there are lots of techniques which I call reprogramming the immune system to make the immune system less twitchy. Yeah. Um, you know, a, a really good cheap simple one is just turmeric. You can have a hobbit five grams a day. It's a good all round antibiotic. It's nice and cheap. People get a lot of them from low dose naltrexone. It's a bit more tiresome and it's calm. It's easy to do, but you know it needs prescription. And um, so you have to log them with something like me. But I haven't I'm sure if I mean looks you can get healthy and online, you should be able to. Sorry, what were the last two And then... Hydrofibin D, yeah. um, um, low dose naltrexone yeah. is, is often a helpful intervention. Just detoxing, you know, reduces the um, yeah. inflammatory drive. Um, it's pretty smooth. Um, um, but there are desensitization techniques. Oh, lactobacillus ramnosus is a very good probiotic to, to grow. Good studies showing that induces immune tolerance in the gut. Okay. So it's, Sorry, what it's called lactobacillus rhamnosus, and it's on my website. Okay. It's, and, and the shop, the products in the shop. But again, you, you can grow it, it grows very easily on coconut milk, but you have now and you have to put a bit of sugar in it mm. because otherwise it doesn't feed. So so don't drink it, don't have it too soon. So you can make it very easily. You have feed it with sugar, but only drink it when it's then consume it's really sharp, i.e. Mm. the sugar can come it down. But the point is you can inoculate a brew with that and then it lasts you forever. I've had a brew on the go for years, and you know, I just top it up with coconut milk and sugar, leave it on the back of the Rayburn, and um, you know, and leave it for a week. And you leave it long, it makes quite a good cheese. Um, <laughs> um, and it's never gone rotten, it hasn't made me ill, I still have to wear that. Mm -hmm. But that induces immune tolerance in the gut, so that's a helpful you know, addition. So you, know, you chip away every which way, but mm -hmm. there are things like neutralization, EPD. There's another technique I'm looking at the called micro therapy. Which again is a homeopathic desensitizing uh, treatment. Again, there's a whole page about this on my website. It's something I learned very recently. I've only just started using it, but it can be used for extra time. But it's very good for viruses. Um, and that might be a better starting point than maybe Valocyclic. Because guess what? Ken Quick can get it. Um, well, I, I fiddle a few things to make sure that anybody can get it, but, um, um, but we can get it through somehow. But it's, you know, it's more expensive. It's more expensive. It's about a month or something like that, so it's just another expense. That's why it's important to put the basic stuff in really well and you can see where that gets you. Yeah. Mm. So it's now one o'clock. Are you happy? To, I mean, I'm quite happy to go on talking. Um, if you want to eat your lunch while we're talking, that's absolutely fine. I find if I say let's break for lunch, then one or two people come in and we just carry on with the thing and everybody else misses out. <laughs> so I'm quite, I should go and have a pee. I don't normally have lunch. So I'm quite happy if you have lunch and we can carry on. I'm going to need to go and get some lunch, so yeah. please. Can we have like maybe just some other people? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we'll get some food. Of course. I've got the list here with all the stuff that I've got with me. So if anybody wants to take any stuff home, then uh, I'd like to tick the box and write that we'll talk about it. Um, yeah, continue with her output yeah. as she always has. And maybe 
How do you get an absolute fat and protein genetic meat on your EK diet? The thing about it's not uh, it's, it's a meat based diet. Mm. EK diet means paleo, I know dairy, grains, mm. and yeast. Ketogenic, low carb. So, so my staple, so my breakfast would be bacon and eggs. And you can't eat meat. Well, it's more difficult, but it's possible. I tried, but I had to give up after three days. I was just famished. I just, so I'm well, going to do it for about two or three months. But she was good on it. She was really busy on it. So. Well, that's because she's not fat burning. So you need to, um, the, the, the DDD reaction is can take weeks. And the sicker you are, the longer they, they take. Mm. But it doesn't mean you're doing things wrong. That is the road to walk, just to keep at it. But if she hasn't got the flour of the fat burn, then that, that would make her ill. It would be suggesting the cream rather than the uh, Yeah, but that's, that's the cream. That would be the cream. So, yes, use the high proportion cream, that will help, and then add the most of it. Get that up, keep it, keep it, keep it up. And as there's a PK cookbook there. Mm -hmm. um, I was looking at you, see, you're kind of your cheat sheet, but if you're really not feeling very well and you're trying to do PK, yeah. and you've kind of obviously helped with your books and work, but it's lots of. But lots of it's canned. Well, I know. Kind of, I know. Is that, is that, I know. Do you think that foods that are canned and tinned generally are kind of okay? I mean, well, is it, is it, it's all relative. Yeah, it's better <laughs> than eating you know, a Western so diet. So it's so much mm -hmm. better than eating a Western diet, it's worth, and taking, and the worth is, taking the risk. If you haven't got, yeah, but if you haven't got any energy, so you can't go out and, and, and mm. hunt down the wild boar and skip it single handedly, mm. which you should all be doing, um, then what can I tell me? Because I was trying to do it the other day and I realised that I, you know, for like a couple of days I basically eat quite a lot of stuff out of tins and I mean some, you know, not salads and things obviously, but like all the, because all the lives also, it's very, very expensive. I know. Well, I've got a very good option near me, but that's why I said I'd rather you guys spend money on treatment than on fancy tests to mm. get the diet and say it. So in a timely <coughs> manner, Sarah, she we got somebody asking a question regarding changes for the vegetarian diet, having no eggs or fish, and having cheese and milk only. I think they've kind of heard some of what you've just been saying, obviously about you can be PK, but it's going to be harder. Um, and I, because they say cheese and meat, milk only, I guess you're going to also say you don't have a good dairy due to the growth proteins. Yeah, things. I mean, you shouldn't, no, I mean, dairy products are not even your food correct food. Right. We are the only mammal species that eats dairy products in adulthood. Dairy products are there for young mammals um, that um, need to grow very quickly. If they don't grow very quickly, they get eaten by a saber tooth tiger. So dairy products are full of growth promoters. And that's not good news, you want to avoid cancer. Um, and also, they are major allergens in so many kids' conditions, you know, snotty nose, blue ears, um, um, recurrent tonsillitis. Scientists, it's all dairy allergy. But get more for dairy, um, that's absolutely essential. Um, and, as, and as a general guide, avoid all dairy or avoid absolutely. certain yeah. types? No, more, all dairy. No? It's all the same. It doesn't matter if it's sheep, you know, goat, um, um, you know, donkey milk, it doesn't matter. It's all dairy, it's all growth promotion. Not that I have any patients on donkey milk. <laughs> right. So while people nibble, would it be a good time to maybe run some of the other questions past you? Yeah, sure. For those not in the room, <clears throat> and it may well be shared topics. Let me Thank just find you. out what we've got. Yeah, yeah. First. Sorry, guys. Grab a take off what you fancy, and then copy it up. And Martin, you can. I've got a card reader there, and thanks for having us. Square up at the end of the day. Please, yeah, yeah sure. So a question from somebody whose daughter has ME and she believes it was first triggered by um, HPV, I assume vaccination on HPV itself. Um, what 
mitigation can be brought to bear on it to detox if you've got a teenage son or daughter who's had HPV vaccine. Oh, it's the basic workup is exactly the same, you know, diet, supplements, vitamin C, the bowel points and so on. But HPV puts you into a pro-inflammatory state. So it puts you in place as many interventions to reduce inflammation. And um, HPV has got aluminium in it. So um, you, you might you might choose to, to measure heavy metals or just deculation therapy, which you do with all DMSA details in the book to bring the um, um, aluminium load down. That'd be very helpful. Um, but but yes, yeah, she's in the pro-inflammatory state, and she's got poor energy during the mechanism. So she's got ME, so she has to do it all. Right. Um, and I say the starting point is the diet. Sure. Okay. And the supplementary was that she's had between 20 and 25 courses of antibiotics. Um, and do you know of any links between ME and UTIs? This is the same person, so it's the same history. Um, and what can she recommend if bacteria become antibiotic resistant well, well, after 25 courses of antibiotics? Well, the answer is she's got a rotten immune system and she's probably feeding with carbohydrates. So, you know, PK diet, starving, which is out, vitamin C to bowel tolerance to keep the gut clean and tidy, um, because almost certainly those infections are coming from the gut. Okay, lovely. So, so one is the, the urine nice and clean, and the, the awful thing is the more infections you have, the more sensitized the immune system will become, and so that you risk ending up with interstitial cystitis. Okay. So, I do see the antibiotics might be necessary in the short term, but they're not a long term solution. You've got to get at the root cause of why she's getting those infections in the first place. Okay. Um, <clears throat> she was asking about test interpretations and notwithstanding the fact that you can't necessarily take people on, mm -hmm. do you have a recommended way that people can find others such as yourself or Roderick or something well, like that who on, might be able to On the Natural Health Worldwide, that. um, if you NHW, um, I wanted to call it NHS, Natural <laughs> 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 but I wasn't allowed to. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, natural there are lists of practitioners right. and where you can get the tests done. Um, and I've some produced, I've produced another book, Ecological Medicine. It should be here today. Unfortunately, it's not been printed yet. It's all done. And there is a whole appendix on how to interpret tests. What are the proper reference ranges? And what's if it's too high and what's if it's too low? Um, as pointers, I'll send you a copy. Chapter mark and maybe lovely. Yeah, I'll YouTube disseminate YouTube. accordingly. That's brilliant. That's it, yeah. But yeah, another, tell my publisher that by the way. No, okay, <laughs> <laughs> you to spend money on the books. <laughs> another chap with um gut fermentation problems. Obviously, he's, he's heard most of the stuff, and I suspect you've probably covered it. Um, I understand the importance of following a low or no carb diet, so PK diet, it's the only way. Um, can you clarify which supplements should be stopped or restricted? so as not to feed the bacteria more. You mentioned B12, what other supplements feed bacteria? That no, wasn't no. the same. Once you right. start out with sugars, then there's no problem with supplements. Yeah. Um, um, you know, as in the early days, when I hadn't quite got it. I used to use transdermal supplements and they work quite well and they're like by a the gut. But I now know, go keto, take vitamin C to bowel plants and you stop fermenting, you then revert to a digesting and absorbing gut. Okay. And then the supplements are no problem. <laughs> Okay, good. So, same questioner. Also wondered if you could speak about those of us who have weaker detox pathways and moderate methylation pathways. It is, best to, is it best to strengthen this first before anything else? I'm wondering if they're not strong, then any detox will make life very unpleasant. And how would you strengthen detox pathways in the first place? You mentioned glutathione. I know there is an importance with sequencing, this is what I find tricky. Which bit to tackle first? Thank you so much. Crumbs. Um, well, it's as in the um, um, the process I've iterated. Yes, the darts, the vitamin C, it's the supplements. Um, as soon as you do, as soon as you do that, you massively reduce your detox load, your toxic load, because most of the toxic stress comes from the gut, comes from the products of fermentation, bacterial endotoxin, and fungal mycotoxin. So that alone greatly reduces the toxic stress on the liver. Um, and then it's got the energy and the raw materials to do everything else. And then you can add that by doing sauna, sweating regimes, maybe heavy metal deculation to get the toxic metals, um, and then you start looking for the chronic infections. Mm -hmm. So it's exactly the same. It's, it's all the same stuff. And yes, you will get a bumpy ride, which is unavoidable. Mm -hmm. So my DDD reactions where you get awful and 
keto flu followed by detox reactions and then Herxheimer reactions and it's all very painful but I don't know another route to walk. Fair enough. Um, <clears throat> Actually, mentioning the uh, apropos of the vegetarian diet, of course, people who can eat fish, I would suggest probably oily fish is a good thing, isn't it? Well, the trout fish is so polluted these days. Right. So, um, you know, can, uh, trout is probably quite good because it's grown on, on, um, in fresh water, so that's less, probably less polluted. On the other hand, they might be run off from the local farm, for all we know. So, mm -hmm. it's difficult. Fish is, 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 is all polluted. Um, and the more offshore fish you can get, the better. So um, something that's caught you know, a thousand miles away from land is going to be better than, than uh, an onshore right. or uh, uh, seas that are close to, to, to the edge. But it's very difficult. But again, if, if people are not <coughs> wanting to or feel they're able to eat meat, then fish is a, yes, a, a, a good absolutely. interim. Absolutely. Okay, good. So fantastic. I mean, we have this ridiculous notion that you should have more than two eggs a week. You know, I have tea, I have two eggs every day. And sometimes four eggs every day. It's a fantastic food. You know, it's full of all the right fats and oils and there's everything in an egg to make a whole bird. Of course, I'm very lucky because I've got my own chicken, so I get the best eggs in the world. Um, but you, know, you just do your best. I mean, in Lidl, you can get organic eggs these days quite cheaply too. Yeah, yeah. So that's what I do when I'm down in Brighton. Um, I haven't got enough to keep. Keep going for these. Organic three ranges better than organic. There must be three um, ranges as well as organic. Well, three, three ranges in this note. I've yes. seen three range chicken pens, believe you me. Yes. And ninety nine point nine nine percent of them are indoors. Right. And there's one that might sort of be out now. A bit cold out here and dies back in here. So it's a nonsense. I mean, they give you these pictures with the you know, trees in the background okay. and they're nice turf and rubbish. I don't think so. Right. So I don't buy three range at all. I just don't buy that as an idea. But organic. Yeah. Okay. It's, it's, it's probably, it's going to be better um, and have a lower toxic load, but you know, um, sometimes I wonder about organic how, how <laughs> it is. Well, anyway, yeah, yeah, just have to be your best. So another one, any cut that says, uh, are there any, with regard to blood tests, what is implicated by low serum bicarbonate levels? Well, that suggests they're in a state of acidosis and they're, they're, they're acidic. Um, and that happens if you've got poor energy mechanism and you're constantly switching into anaerobic metabolism, which leads to lactic acid. Um, and of course, when you, if you've got a lot of adrenaline, um, just being a high carbohydrate, you <coughs> tend to make it difficult. So, um, uh, it's not something that can be cured by drinking lots of bicarbonate, it's something that has to be fixed by doing all the other stuff. You know, keep your dark, and you're back to square one again. So it's a symptom that metabolism is arrived. There's not a specific treatment you do to fix that. Okay. Can excess B12 make urine turn red? Absolutely. It can. <laughs> good. Very good, good. Teresa, you've got your well, answer. You're well saturated. Right. And, uh, if you inject somebody with, you know, five or ten milligrams of B12, I said that now, you will be pink. <laughs> okay, and then last last one at the moment, uh, then we can continue. Um, the same lady before. Are there known links between ME and UTIs, and what would you recommend, please, when UTI bacteria have become antibiotic resistant? My daughters have between 20 and 25 cause of antibiotics. Some urine results have come back as no bacteria is showing, but have now had private tests in the doctor's lab you mentioned earlier, and we discovered that she has ESLB E. coli strain that is resistant to most antibiotics anyway. So a frightening number of antibiotics for no reason, but what would you recommend, please, to mitigate the effects on the gut microbiome, etc.? Also, another question on detox. Daughter's ME, CFS symptoms start with the HPV vaccine. Oh, Are there any detox protocols? I think kind of you yeah. reiterated about that. And she said, what about infrared sauna treatments? I think you've talked about yeah. far infrared in terms of blankets and things, and also perhaps the lamps and even the nasal lights, <laughs> which we've yeah. played with, which in increase mm -hmm. ATP, mm -hmm. are probably all going to help. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's, you know, all roads lead to Rome, then I say it. You know, it's the same old stuff done well. But basic stuff done really well gets you an awful long way there. And uh, I mean, this is the problem with antibiotics. I mean, um, um, the chief medical officer, Sally Davis, she's now somebody else now, um, she said, in order to keep up with modern day infections, we need a new class of antibiotics every 15 years. We haven't had one for about 30 years. So we're going to run out of antibiotics. There'll be an end gap without that. Um, you know, we're in a cozy, you know, we, we think that we can deal with all, but we can't. 
and we're seeing evidence of sepsis, for example. Mm -hmm. so, in, in, you know, I've had two neighbours, not patients of mine, just people I know of, young lads, you think they'd be fit and healthy, cut their finger, end up in hospital with sepsis, both of them. Mm -hmm. And why? Because they're really cracked. Mm -hmm. I mean, the idea of a fun weekend for young people these days seems to be going to get pissed out of your head, you know, uh, you know um, in, in, on a Saturday night. And then they're eating sugars and carbs and crisps and crisps all the time. And so they're sugar in the blood, and that feeds the body. Yeah, in fact, they love sugar. And that's why ketogenic diets are so good because you're, you're just starving them of, of, of the fuel they need to, to survive. Last one for now. Another one. My daughter was injured by this. Is another one. Was injured by HPV vaccine, and her test showed mitochondria had a detergent-like substance on it and high levels of mercury. It caused seizures, but we didn't give her any pharma drugs, and it has and has progressed, which I would suggest says has eased, but still gets skin breakouts and fatigue. Well, skin, skin break, it's, it's, that, that could be an allergic thing or an infectious thing. It's, it's, right. it's again the same old story, you know, the PK dark, because so much eczema is dairy allergy or you know, food allergy. It's not that. I've always, you know, always used to wonder why it is that with atopic eczema, it happens in the skin creases, you know, the arm, the arm, the core, the And of course, that's where the skin is thin. And that's allergy to staphylococci on the skin. And again, the iodine oil works fantastically because it contact kills all the staphylococci. I've had several patients with really nasty infected eczema that's just they've been on antibiotics, they've been on this cream and that cream. Apply the iodine oil ad lib, yes, it goes on a yellow colour, gone. And in the ecological medicine, I've got a wonderful case history of a, of a girl who came to me with um, abscesses in her armpit. Now, they had been there for years, you know, I think it was about eight or ten years she'd had them. She'd had antibiotics, she had surgeries trying to remove them, drain them, and she came and there's a separating, stinking mass of, you know, a, a, a carbon in her arm that no good. The surgeon didn't dare dig any deep because the break and be deep because the break of Texas was there, which is, you know, the nurse, the arm, she didn't have a paralyzed arm. And that was in the orb she came to see me. So uh, she was a fruit and holiday. She thought she was doing um, herself <laughs> by having lots of fruit juice, so she was having lots of, well, it's healthy, and the said, oh, yes, lots of fruits could, you know, mm -hmm. fruit's just a bad thing. Mm. And fruit juice is even worse. And actually, fructose is more pernicious than, uh, than the white stuff. So she was drinking you know, pineapple juice and apple juice and eating up, blah, 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 and other stuff. So, guess okay, so what? Ketogenic diet first, cut out all the fruit juice, didn't even see the bowel plants. And I said, I want you to keep that armpit permanently. Um, uh, laps with iodine. Never let it go free from the iodine oil. So forget all the flamazine and the dressings or whatever. Do it. By Christmas you'd heal that completely. Mm. It was just a brilliant result. And actually I think that saved her life because the surgeon couldn't do any more. She's got antibiotic risk and MRSAs in there, so the antibiotics were ineffective and it's just slowly eating its way through and it would eat its way through into her, her chest cavity. Uh, if there's if people are sensitive to certain supplements is there any form of vitamin c which might be better tolerated i assume you just move up from the cheapest yeah. accordingly and then somebody <laughs> saying if is ester vitamin c better than ascorbic if you have utis well it's not better than i mean the best is ascorbic acid it's the cheapest and the best ascorbic, the trouble right. is it's made from the <laughs> Um, and my very common sense to patients, some of them don't tolerate it. Some people don't tolerate vitamin C because they don't, the ascorbic acid, because they don't tolerate the acidity of it. And yes, you can use magnesium ascorbate or whatever, it's ester, but it's a lot more expensive. Um, so what I usually suggest is use the uh, ascorbic acid, but just put magnesium carbonate in it, which we sell on the website, it's dirt cheap, and just put it into the stock space and it tastes neutral. Um, it, it's a slightly milky liquid, it doesn't look too awful. It also gives you a nice set of magnesium. Hmm. Um, but you can get vitamin C from Sago, but it's expensive. Right. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, so, are you doing this now? Yes. Uh, 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 well, I thought we got, well, yes, no, carry it. We'll do that now. Do at the end of the day. Uh, yes, we'll, 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 we'll chunder on. We've got another couple of hours. And, uh, and then, yes, if anybody wants to anything, pick it up. Marjorie will shoot. You have to tell the girls at home what's gone. And um, you give me a credit card when you pay for that, and anything that's left, I will take it. Can you have a spare sheet?
So if you tick off what you want, grab what you want to take, toss it up, and then I'll um and there's if anybody has struggles with the adding up, there's a calculator here. Um, oh. You, you don't have the robot and ribos on your list. How much is it, please? Oh, is it not on there? I can't see it. It's possible that I'm wrong. Oh, no, 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 that's the girls who missed that then. <laughs> I think it's not happening. In fact, yeah, it's about 25 quid. I won't be overcharging you if I say 25 quid. I think it's 27 quid or something like that. But um, okay. call it 25 quid. So it's just right here. Yeah, yeah. Um, Eighty seventy, so I take that and then um, I'll find that in and do it. This tea, have, have um, yourself tea and coffee. It's the stuff by the sink, not all the food that's out. Yeah, milk or coconut yeah. milk or dinner. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. I'm very paper, but I'm going to bring me back a... Actually, no, I'll put that You've been approved. Excellent. <laughs> there you go. Thank you very much. Right. So we just back up through the um, um, the tests. <laughs> Still on the first page. We'll accelerate through the rest of it. Okay. Now symptoms. I mean, many of the symptoms that people come with this are poor energy delivery systems. So if you've got physical fatigue, delay fatigue, post exertional maze, malaise, no stamina, muscle pain, episodic blood vision, intolerance of cold and heat, intolerance of bright light, intolerance of noise, these are all poor energy delivery symptoms. We're at the bottom of the page one here. Okay, I'm trying to um, stick to my stick to economy. And getting you that, that's all about poor energy delivery to the body. And that's all about the diet, the mitochondria, the power, the same old stuff. And so getting you right is like conducting your orchestra. You've got to do it all. You've got to um, have all the players playing at the same time and in time with each other. And then um, we have half the time. Okay, and then, um, so we talked about this earlier, low blood pressure, hot, half, heart, half, half. That's all for energy delivery to the heart. You know, treatment is exactly the same. You need to do the energy delivery mechanism. Again, support energy delivery to the brain um, on page two now. Foggy brain, short term memory, problem solving, multitasking, intolerance of light, noise, people. You know, um, they're all, the brain hasn't got the energy to, to sort those things out. And then low mood, depression, anxiety, procrastination. Those are the symptoms the brain gives you when it knows it doesn't have the energy to deal with demand. So um, you will be pleased here, you're not depressed, you're not psychotic, you're not being able to support energy. And then everybody has to have a basic package of supplements. This is what I call ground health basic. Why? Because of modern agriculture. I reckon the basic package is a multivitamin, and I tend to use bio -kester, a sunshine salt, hemp oil, which you can use in your um, kitchen, and vegeta, which is a good all-round. So that gives you a smattering of vitamins, and minerals, and oils. But make sure you keep it at the first you can afford them. Diet. Well, we've talked about that. I've written two books about that. Diabetes book, which explains why it's a problem, and the PK cookbook, which explains how you do the ketogenic diet. How else does it allow for non meat eating in the PK cookbook? I didn't feel qualified to write about that because okay. I'm a meat eater myself and I only write about things I feel qualified to write about. Um, but um, it can be done. If, if you allow eggs, that that definitely gets it. Okay. Well, you could just give a yolk. Yeah, that's we'll that's do good thing. Uh, but it, can, it, it is possible. It just makes a rather boring old diet. Um, and you have to make up with um, nuts and seeds to a certain extent. But uh, the trouble is, vegetarian diets are high carb diets. 
Um, so because I cruelly say to my patients, my job is to get you well, not to entertain. <laughs> it, it is doable because I, I do it. Um, I will do it with lots of um, vegetables, loads of vegetables, stews, and things. So I actually can't have any sauces and things now. So no. Thing. No. What, what is our good of vegan cheeses? Um, and this, I, I bought myself one to chew on the way back. Um, that's a mozzarella flavoured one. Yeah, but if you go from this, okay. Well, they're, well, they're um, coconut based, and there's a bit of soy in them, yeah. yeah. But they are getting better and better. And I order every so often from the vegan supermarket, which is online, and I get vegan block, which is my butter alternative. I get vegan cheeses, and there's a very good cream cheese. As a, uh, I'm not used to learning, so I get very good blue cheeses, which are excellent. And then on page, page, um, or chapter four of the GK cookbook. Um, is the bread, and that's my PK bread. Now, there's a video of me on, and so I should chomp on that on the way home. And, and the only ingredients for that are linseed, water, and salt, because nothing else goes into it. And I can make those in five minutes. Wow. It really is quick and easy. And um, um, the, I, I used to make the loaf quite well, but so many people came back to me and said, oh, the loaf doesn't rise, it's soggy in the middle. So these days, I recommend you make the dough. Um, and when you make it massage it out, so it's about the shape of a rolling pin, and then cut into discs. And that makes 12 buns, and they put your lardy up. And it, you, when you cut that, it looks like bread, it rises. Hot oven, it is, the hot oven and the water in the, in the bread is what rises it, because the water and steam and lifts it. So, you know, I've now got my bread, I've got my butter, I've got my cheese. I don't feel deprived anymore. So that would be a very good start. So the way I do it is, okay, my <coughs> breakfast, okay, I have, I have bacon, but you have eggs with, you know, onions and you know, mushrooms and cook it in lard. You all know the rules about cooking with oils and lard, don't you? Um, which is, uh, you must never cook with oils. Um, I'll, I'll do this quickly because it is really important. Um, in nature, there is no such thing as a bad fat. They are all good. And um, the most important fat we should be using are the saturated fats, which we find in coconut oil, which we find in lard. And these are, um, they're straight fats. They're completely saturated with hydrogen ions. So they're stiff and they're tough. And when you heat them, they don't denature there. We should be using them for, cook for cooking. And then we have the unsaturated fats. And they are missing a carbon atom, which means they're um, a big one. They're, they're missing hydrogen atoms, so they've got a double bond, and so they're kinked. So olive oil is king to only get three, um, sour sunflower is king to only get six. So olive, olive oil has got one king, it's called the monomal saturate, and the others, they're polyunsaturated, they're king to six, or maybe they're king to nine. And they're boomerang shaped, they're curved. And in nature, they're all left-handed oils. Now, if you cook an, an oil, heat it, or you bubble hydrogen through to make margarine, you will flip some of them into right-handed oils, right-handed boomerangs, and they don't fly, they don't work, they don't fit enzyme systems. They're called trans fats. They're the dangerous, nasty ones that clog up the system. So the, so the bottom line is all the fats in nature are good. Um, but the saturated fats are fine to cook with, and the oils never cook with them. Keep them cold, use them for drizzle on your food, make drink dressings with them, but don't cook with them. No coconut oils are saturated in that. Broadly speaking, if they're solid at room temperature, they're saturated. If they're coconut oil is solid, so is palm oil. Um, so it's butter. If you're not, if you're not dairy allergic, and you're sure you're not dairy allergic, then butter is fine. I use I'm very dairy allergic, so I use the vegan block, which is a coconut oil. The rapey oil. A big one? Not for cooking, but fine to drizzle on your food and you can drink better. I'm sorry. But it's all about the proportion where there is six, so only get three. I know, I know, and it's probably high in chemical foods, so you can get organic and plastic. But the reason I prefer hemp oil is it's got the right proportion of only the six to only the three, which would be four to one. People are inclined to take lots of fish oil because they think it's going to make them brainy, but you can very quickly end up with too much of the only the three. So it's got to be a balance. So I, that's why my, my recipe is multivitamin fish oil with vitamins. Sometimes I'll fish all the minerals, plus a good dose of D and B. Well, hemp oil, use that for your your um, food on the table, then cook with it, use that in your French dressing, your food on the vegetable, and then veggie with it, a couple of days of sugar, which is, again, there's been studies done by Hassan Curie, which shows us that it works with people's health and disease. <coughs> what else do you think like you said for the non-dairy vegetarian? Oh, it's just the vegan supermarket. Oh, okay. And
and they deliver. Uh, and they, because it comes chilled, you have to get 50 quid's worth, but it lasts for years, you know, months in the fridge, it lasts months in my fridge, I'm seeing these right away. Um, and they're delicious, I mean the feta, well it tastes just like feta to me, and the cheese is excellent, it's a cream cheese. So as I say, if I, my starter for pudding, um, when I, if I start on my evening, because I don't generally eat lunch, is um, my linseed bread with vegan butter on it, and a chunk of cheese on it, or sardines, or tin mackerel, or whatever. And then my main course will be meat, I'm lucky, I've got my own pigs with vegetables in the garden, I'm lucky, I'm a keen gardener, so I've got my veggies. And then, even, and then pudding will be berries, and again, I've got a deep freezer full of berries with the coconut milk poured on them. And I feel satisfied, and I feel full, and it doesn't matter how much I eat, I just stay the same. There's, the, there's no limit in berries if you turn vegetables? So long as you're in ketosis, you're okay. Okay. Keto meat is there, but that's why the keto meat is so good. Um, and I found once I got there, I could get away with more than I thought I'd be getting away with. Um, so and I'm now regularly blow between two and three are on the key tens. Um, what, um, number you, what number do you have in your Any amount will do. As soon as you'll be you'll be keep your inky test, you're fine. But what I find now is it's very rare I sit below two, it's nearly always between two and three. Now, in the early days, and I had this problem with a patient of mine, she, she started using the keto meter. Very early on, as soon as she went keto, she said, oh, I must have a go at that and see how it works. And she was getting growing readings of five or six or seven. And that is, it's not diabetic keto acidosis because the blood sugar is fine. It's simply that the body hadn't learned how to manage fats. You know, because it's been running, if you've been running on cars for decades and suddenly give it a new fuel, you know, it's not time to learn how to do this. And, and the body is intelligent. It's like my horses, you know, if I, if I want to um, build them up for horse racing or whatever, um, um, I don't do that so much these days, I mean, break my neck three times doing it. Um, I, you, you, you change their diet gradually, you don't suddenly, you know, impose a complete um, uh, dietary change. It's the same with us, but to get into ketosis. So, it, so don't worry about if you show very high readings early on in the day. Diabetic ketoacidosis would be running at 20 and 25 and 30. So dawn this last, she got up to sort of seven, eight, she, and she was sending emails, oh, still worms, so don't panic, don't panic, calm down and get so when it goes high, it shows up purple and everybody panics. Please don't panic. Can I ask you a question? Yeah. What about hallucinant dark chocolate? Where does that fit? It's really? fine. I mean, it does have some carb in it. And guess what? I've got to make five percent with the way home because I'll keep you awake driving back to Brighton. Okay. Um, and I know I can have four squares back and still blank in places. Okay. So that's why everybody's different. And that's why that meat has been so helpful. It's been such a breakthrough okay. because you know, suddenly people aren't saying, you know, am I, aren't I, and giving me great dietary histories, you know, which, you know, I've heard all before. Yeah. yeah. Men can get away with more than women, generally speaking, um, but it's, it's, a, it's a great tool. I know it costs 50 quid, it's expensive, but the test costs nothing. You can do them as often as you like. What about the stevia? Mm -hmm. Well, the trouble fresh. with the artificial sweeteners is the body is intelligent. Mm -hmm. And if it tastes something sweet in the mouth, it'll produce insulin in anticipation of a sugar spike. So it keeps the old, you know, um, right. uh, hormones spiking when, when they shouldn't. Mm -hmm. So it's okay for a little bit, but you know, I'm an addict, and mm -hmm. you know, if I start, and the interesting thing is your taste will change. Mm -hmm. And I never thought I'd be able to eat black currant raw with no sugar or no sweetener, and now I find them too sweet. In fact, baby Bob's this ketogenic baby that I've been telling you about. She she won't eat strawberries, but she will eat raw black currants mm -hmm. and just mm -hmm. hammers them down because that's what she's learned to like. Because we learn taste, we're not born with a sense of sweetness or taste. You know, we <coughs> you know, taste is there to guide us through the jungle to tell us what's safe and what's not safe. And if, as a baby, you've been given all those things, that's safe food. Mum gave it to me. I'm well. I'm great. It's safe. I like it. But you know, the South Pacific tribes who live on tapioca, well, like, that tapioca is absolutely revolting. They love it because that's what they've always had. Like Gosh. the Eskimos, a friend of mine went up to, um, sorry, uh, and you can't call them Eskimos. I called them Eskimos on the website and they got ticked off. Yeah. They're Indians, okay? Yeah. Don't make that mistake. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, they give their kids, um, instead of a lollipop, you know, a frozen fish and they just chew their way through mm. it and they think it's yummy. That's their idea of a treat. Question on nuts, quickly. Yeah. Um, regarding the omega-6, omega-3, yeah. should we discriminate between the nuts that have unfavourable ratios because some of them do have quite unfavorable ratios or not bothered, just eat moderation. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, use it for everything. 
I mean, do primitive man, you know, go around with a little book, you know, consulting with now, I don't think so, just show the doors back. You know, but the body's fantastically adaptable. Um, you know, so as long as we're somewhere near, the body will be there. And talking about um, primitive man, you mentioned at the beginning that um, there was a kind of, you know, surplus of potatoes or wheat bread at some point. Is that something that we can incorporate into our diets or is it just not? Well, it depends how much of an addict you are. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm not a paragon of virtue. At Christmas, yes, I slipped off the wagon and, and had a few glasses of wine and made a fool of myself and had a jolly drink and then got back on the wagon again. Yeah. I think that's the way to do it. And maybe when I get older and perhaps wise, although my daughters doubt that very much, mm -hmm. um, um, maybe I won't be able to drink alcohol at all, ever. But, you know, it's a great social enhancer, isn't it? The jokes are much funnier. <laughs> <laughs> you can dance on night. I can't do that anymore. <laughs> but, um, it, you know, you just have to use your noddle. And, 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 and basically, if, if your function is a high level, you can, you know, then you, you're not far off, you know. But as long as you're not functioning on a higher level on addiction. Yeah. I was I'm really interested, I was at a conference the other day and uh, um, a nutritional therapist came up and we started talking. She said, well, I've got this patient who's coming to see me and um, 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 you know, she's got a few aches and pains, you know, she's functioning at a higher level. She's one of these, you know, uh, city bankers in the city and, and firing this and firing that. She said, but when I did her blood, her ESR was over 100. Now ESR is a measure of inflammation. And if somebody has an ESR over 100, that is serious pathology. And it stopped me in my tracks. I said, there's something very serious going on there. You know, you know, you've got so I said, tell me a bit more about her. And, um, and she, said, she started, well, she's a bank. So I said, I said she's on cocaine, isn't she? Mm -hmm. And she said, well, she tells me she has it once a fortnight. I said, no, she doesn't. She's having it all the time. And that cocaine she's taking is giving her energy and suppressing her symptoms of inflammation. I said, she will drop dead if she's not very careful. If you go back and crack the whip, she's telling you 40 pies. Mm -hmm. So you've got it, because she's using addiction to perform and suppress her uh, and, and suppress it. And guess what? She got an email later and said, you're absolutely bloody right. Mm -hmm. um, but they all are. That's what's so frightening. Um, um, you know, I, I don't need some first hand experience, but I know from somebody who's moves in those circles and says, they're all on cocaine. Um, have you seen that amazing film about drug smuggling in South America and, and they start with BB Florida? And now it's people on Wall Street for these consumers. Marcos, Narcos, Narcos. Oh, okay, I think it was a different one. <laughs> one of many. <laughs> right, okay, so that's the diet. And then sleep. You know, again, I always talk about sleep because if you're not sleeping, everything else will waste. And there's three big disturbers of sleep that we've discussed. Metabolic syndrome, i.e. pico gut. The inflamed brain, because that's allergy, infection, toxic stress. And thyroid, adrenal, and melatonin, because they just, just determine our circadian rhythm. And um, um, the disturbed sleep, you know, I would say talk about that a lot. Um, and being an owl is typical of being of hypothyroidism, which is the whole thing. And, and most of my any patients, guess what? They are owls. They don't drop off to sleep until in the midnight at one o'clock, and then they're terrible in the mornings, and they maybe wake at eight, and they don't, can't get going until eleven, and you know, uh, and the classic hours. And, and when we get all this together, then um, their sleep patterns would improve. Now, the interesting thing about sleep is um, we sleep comes in ninety-minute chunks, and there are two bits for sleep. There's REM sleep and non-REM sleep. REM just means rapid eye movement sleep. And I don't know if you've ever read Matthew Walker's book, Art Sleep, which is a lovely book, and I learned a lot of useful stuff from that. But we start off with non-REM sleep, and basically non-REM sleep deals with the problems of the past. We relive the memories of the day, remember the stuff that's <coughs> important, throw away the stuff that isn't important, um, <coughs> because that's survival value. And then REM sleep is when we dream, and we're making connections all over the place, and that's when we problem solve for the future. And as the night progresses, we, we, we slip, so we have more non-REM sleep early on in the night and more REM sleep later on in the night. So the most of the dreaming and problem solving takes place you know, later on in the night. And you know, I know full well myself, if I've got a problem or a difficult letter to write or something, I put that problem in my mind when I go to sleep and in the morning I've got the answer. Um, I don't even notice doing crossword puzzles, I love encrypted crossword puzzles, you know, 
Um, you know, you, you, you get them all, and there's about three left again. You're really cross yourself. Go to bed at night, wake up in one, one, two, three, bang, bang, bang. It's so um, that the brain is problem solved. Um, but I think, again, increasingly, we're seeing a lot of post traumatic stress syndrome at the moment, PTSD, and OCD problems in children. I think it's all much of it is related to metabolic syndrome. Why? Because if you're running on carbs, it's spiking adrenaline. And during that non-REM sleep, when you're trying to rationalize the problems of the day, if you're doing that in an adrenalized environment, i.e. a stress environment, you enhance those memories and make them worse. You relive them in, a, in a, an unsafe environment. And again, I think you noticed that Walker at the end of the book describes the studies he did in patients with PTSD where they even beat a bottom of the night to stop that adrenaline spike. And that was a very helpful treatment for the post traumatic stress. I'm saying don't use the drugs to the rest you die. And in fact, when combined with a lovely guy called Rob um, um, Edwards, who is from the um, parachute regiment, and he deals in, in um, parachute uh, regiment people and SAS and army people with post traumatic stress. And we're going to set up a unit at Upper Western, which is my place where they can come and um, it can be free, and they will sit around the group like this and learn about the diet and blah, 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 blah. And, um, and I've got a sauna at home that they can use to do the detoxing and they can take some supplements um, uh, to help them deal with their PTSD. So Rob said to me, this up and I'm saying, yeah, I have Upper Western free, and I'm very happy to come talk to the group. Some of their good guys. <laughs> so, um, but uh, sleep is really important for problem solving. And for dealing with the problems, the problems of the day, and we need to sleep in a safe environment. So <coughs> there's again in the books, point to you know, there's stuff to do for sleep hygiene. You know, got to be dark, and um, and got to do the timing right. You know, be dark, be dark, be dark. But when you, one thing I try and do is bring people's sleep forward in, um, so it's it's the cause better. So you should be dropping to sleep when it gets dark and when it gets light. And because we get these sleeps in 90 minute chunks, you change your sleep in 90 minute chunks. So if you're dropping off to sleep at midnight, then you aim to catch 10.30 sleep wave. And once you're catching that efficiently, then aim to catch the nine o'clock sleep wave. So um, there's no point going to bed half an hour, so it won't work. You've got to go to bed an hour and a half earlier and to catch the early sleep wave. And we get sleep waves through the day. And um, if I've been um, working, I get a sleep wave after lunch, and I often have a 20 minute kit after lunch. Out cold, wake up, where am I? Oh, ready to go again. And that is much more important than eating for me. But um, 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 the only patients need to, let's say, be as disciplined about sleep as you are about diet. And you know, it's very tempting to stay up late at night because that's when the good tail is on, and very often people feel at their best during that time. You've got to use that to get to sleep. Um, yeah. I quite often, one of the reasons why I know that I'm not doing very well is I'm usually at the nap. A lot in the afternoon, like I could easily eat okay. quite often that two hours, two and a half hours, three hours sometimes okay. in the afternoon. And my best time is actually between about nine in the morning, about 12, okay. 12 o'clock. Okay, well, you're hypothyroid then, that's typical of hypothyroid. Yeah. That, and, and poor adrenal function, so to have that real tail. I mean, short nap of 20 minutes is fine, yeah. but that's really a bit too long. And yeah. that, is, that will mess up your evening sleep, your, your night sleep, I guess. Sometimes, like, I mean, and it's probably, I'd say three to four times a week, I have to have a two hours sleep in the afternoon, mm -hmm. like I can have a day, like today I'm, I'm not doing it, but tomorrow I want to, to make sure I have a, have a okay. good nap. Well, so my guess is you're hypothyroid. Yeah. And if you're not, um, you know, you've just not got the stamina. Mm. So if, you, if your sleep's okay, but you're not, so my daughter would be, she goes upstairs to bed at 10 every night, she's sleep by 10 30, mm -hmm. she wakes at 6 37. Oh, well, that's a good sign. It doesn't guarantee she's not hypothyroid, okay. it's just one of the pointers. Okay. Mm. Is there any foods or drinks you can suggest like to help sleep? A kitchen and gun. It's the most important thing. And not a sleep. Well, yeah, I, yeah, but um, people often say that is um, 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 don't sleep too soon. I, and the way that people eat in this country, which is, you know, starve or snack throughout the day and then have a big meal at nine o'clock at night is a disaster. Um, I mean, what we should be doing is actually, we should probably be having one day a week when we fast. Um, I'm so greedy, I don't do that as often as I should do. But what I do notice is that, and my idea of fast is to have breakfast and that, that's it. I sleep better on the days that my diet. Mm -hmm. um, and there are lots of possible reasons for that. But yes, uh, I, again, um, there's a neurologist who has one called Dale Bredesen who reverses reverse Alzheimer's disease.
And one of his criteria is you have to read all your food in a 10 hour window of time. Mm -hmm. um, because of that thing. And so I tried to have breakfast at eight and supper by six. And it doesn't work like that every mm -hmm. time that I get as close as I can. And I do find my sleep. Yeah. So I keep talking about myself simply because I'm illustrating the point that we all have to be our own guinea pigs. Mm -hmm. And you know, and, and you will try these on yourself. And what works for me might not work for you. But the basic, say the rules for getting the same, it's like playing cricket or golf, over the top and the swing mm -hmm. gets the result in the one way or other, and your swing might be different from mine. And but the basic rules are the same. I found it just like I've been doing this with intermittent fasting, and the one that I was reading about is a 16 hour window, which is quite, I mean, only 8 hour window, which is quite common. <laughs> eight hours with no food. Eight hours to eat into it. <laughs> well, so, I mean, one of the things I know that I'm in ketosis is, you know, I have to cut them up now, but that's because I'm greedy. I don't eat them. Yes, yeah, because I feel less hungry doing it. Keto. Well, doing this, this intermittent fasting, I'm not, I haven't done well, properly done the PK. Well, if you eat fasting, then your body will be switching into, into fat, won't it? Mm. So that's a, a jolly good running, but I'll put money on you being high for that. Right. Or, you or, you, or, be, or just be mindful. Do I, will I need the adrenal support as well, do you think? Or do, some, do some temperatures and see, yes. probably. But um, when it comes to results, I get results from using thyroid five times more often than I get results from using drink. So I'm trying to get rid of the most direct, you know, the best way sure. to get rid of it. So okay. yeah. Do you think those lamps that supposed to collect the blood? Well, uh, the best thing to collect the body clock is sunshine and light. Yeah. And what you, one of the things I mentioned in the book is you know, when you go to bed at night and you can't get off sleep, don't have the light on, don't watch the telly because that's all stuff you need to use melatonin. Listen to something, you know, listen to a tape or music. Now, I'm a great fan of Amazon Audible. Have you discovered Amazon Audible? Mm -hmm. It's wonderful. You know, your long car journeys melt away when I'm listening to, I'm listening to like, the third one, which you probably gather. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I had all the Harry Potters, the Stephen, mm -hmm. the Sherlock Holmes, it's fantastic. They're by Stephen Fry, he's such a lovely guy, obviously. But um, um, they'd be ideal because you can, you can set it up, you put the phone on, uh, so it's not connected to Wi-Fi, obviously, and it just chats away. I think it's £6.99 a month, and, you, and the books are there hours and hours. Of, and they are brilliant. I've learned so much stuff. It's like terrific. It's Harry Potter, like, oh, it's great, isn't it? Yeah, really. Yeah. <laughs> How much does that cost a month for them? Six ninety nine. You get three months for nothing as a trial. <laughs> yes. And I tell you, what, I'm a complete IT nutter, but you might. Yeah, yeah, okay. It really is. Yeah. It's, 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 it's all good. Some of everything else is trying to be something you're going to try it yet. I mean, there are lots of things you could try, and I don't know the answer to that. Um, I mean, if I've got some, I, and I do have one or two patients who absolutely cannot sleep. Mm -hmm. Now, um, and I'm quite sure that they've got damage to their, they've been brain damaged in some way. One, one was a guy who followed a head injury who got knocked out when he was out in um, uh, Taiwan or somewhere, and he still hadn't been able to sleep to him then, and he was so resistant to say, take taking sleep meds. I said, you'll never get one unless you do. In about two or three years down the line, he eventually, all right, then I'll take him. It transformed his life. So he takes Sopiclane every night, and he sleeps fine, and, um, um, and he hasn't developed tachycinitis, so he seems to need it. And, and it is. He's not very happy about it, but hey, I can get back to the last back. And he's out teaching in Eastern Europe now instead of, you know, crashed out of pain. And, and I'm sure you, we, we know you can get viral damage to the brain as well. And again, that's one thing that's slightly worries me about vaccinations if it's knocking out the sleep centre. Um, um, and the best example of that was in Spanish flu epidemic of you know, uh, 1918 to 1920s, between 50 and 100 million people died worldwide, which thought. But some of them developed neurological damage. And it's called encephalitis lethargica. And um, but but, uh, but some of them it knocked out their sleep centre, so they were unable to sleep. They were all dead within two weeks yeah. um, because sleep is naturally essential for life. And there is a prime disorder called familial FFA, familial fatal insomnia, um, where it, again it slowly knocks out the sleep centre, and they all die from lack of sleep. And in those cases, no drugs in the world. Can so sleep isn't absolutely essential. Mm -hmm. It's actually more important than eating. You know, we can survive two weeks without food, we can't survive two weeks without sleep. So work hard on sleep and do everything you possibly can to improve it. Um, I noticed you say melatonin. Yeah. Yeah. Melatonin is not um, um, well, we 
it. Uh, and we're never quite sure if we're saying it legally or illegally. Um, but you know, it's a, it is a complete nonsense. You buy it in America from the drugstore, kicking yeah, in the drugstore, buy it. But I'm, I'm determined to not have it in. Biovia sell it. Okay. Yeah. So if you go to Biovia, they'll sell it. I think it ships from Europe at night. Okay. Well, we certainly yeah, stop it. Yeah. If it's not on the shop, and I'm ashamed to say I don't know if it's on the shop or not. If you drop me an email, I'll send you on to one of the girls and they can get you some. Okay. Yeah, yeah it's, it's just I'm three to nine in advance. Three. Interestingly, I went to, to a clean heart um, uh, lecture um, on, lecture on the Fox Saturday, and he was saying that you um, the, the cancer uh, and severe, I mean, they use up to 100 or 200 milligrams in their which is, you know, normally it's three to nine milligrams because it's a very good anti cancer drug and very good free for breakfast. Um, I just can't get it in those sort of doses, it wouldn't cost an arm and a leg. But, you know, it's another one of those things that's gloriously safe. Percent of a harm and it's zero. Yeah. It's actually on NHS prescription if you persuade your GP, it's called Cicada. Um, um, so, Tricy GP's arm, you might be lucky. And just to go back to falling asleep, that's my issue. Is that a thyroid issue? Which you say the most? What stops you falling asleep? Your brain or your body? My brain. Right. Say. Well, we can do something about that. Yeah. Um. Uh. What you have to do is you have to find some sort of mantra or meditation. If yeah. you are thinking reality, I mean, if I go to bed thinking, oh God, I didn't tell them that. I must remember that. No chance. No chance. Yeah. No chance. So I have various sleep dreams that I put in place, and I've detailed you know, what you do in the book. And you know, one sleep dream might be my favourite walk that I do with my dog that we've got in the afternoon. Uh, I'm not working, off I go around Little Hill, I remember every detail, I go up the track, got to the top, and a bit of bracket on the right, and we go around and all, and then there's no tree on there. And you know, by the time we get to the top of it, you know, I've gone. <laughs> or I do it there's long distance ride, I do it, and I imagine every detail of the long distance ride, which I take plenty of other kids across, and we've done that. Before. 22 years now, um, and, and I now know the, you know the whole route across Wales in, in my sleep. And you know, I usually get to land this before I fall asleep. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> but if I'm thinking reality, no chance. Because I think so, you might be a bit of both with me because it's just like even if I have an empty head, like I do try and just like. Mm -hmm. I, I feel, I don't know, it's like physiological in a way, I just feel mm -hmm. like I can't fall asleep. And once I fall asleep, I'm usually okay. Okay. Well, yeah. again, that was an audible, just set, set the thing so it lasts for five, yeah. fifteen minutes, not you know. yeah. but, but, but don't think reality. Yeah. Think yeah. dream. I'll be fine. I'm, I was recommended to take a, a suitable quantity of uh, magnesium. Oh, you know, absolutely. Day, an hour and a half. What I found was that it took me up two hours and then I woke, woke up remarkably. <laughs> <laughs> and so, what I is just playing with the events mm -hmm. and I've been reducing it and reducing wow. it and it's probably a quarter of a teaspoon yeah. for me. Brilliant. Um, but I was talking to somebody else about it and they were taking it the other day and they said they couldn't take it because it made them so bad. Well this is what's so interesting about you know how everybody has to tailor their regimes to um to get something that suits. But but what I find is that I say, if you get the regime in your face, you just don't have to micromanage so much. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just, you know, things just sort themselves out. And, you know, the high dose vitamin D has been very helpful in that respect, you know, so I don't need to use my these injection soft on people because 20,000 units of, of vitamin D with, um, um, you know, good 300 milligrams of magnesium, you know, and they're done. And it helps a lot. Yeah, I mean, because my numbers are always so important, I, uh, I could not worry about numbers because Absolutely. I worry about them. And then in the last week, mm -hmm. so now I have to live with them for a couple of months. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, and something to do for a couple of months. This is what And that, that's why it's so important to have symptoms, symptoms, you see. Because, you know, if you've got you know, arthritis and, and what happens if you go down to your GP with a sore knee, it gives you some natural symptoms, some involvement drug like that, 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 that takes the symptoms away and therefore you've lost your guiding line, you never work again. So you know, that's why the doctor's so dangerous. Right, okay, so um, the mitochondrial engine, so we're on poor engine delivery symptoms, but, but yeah, if chronic fatigue syndrome comes down the female line, that often points to the mitochondrial problem. The mitochondria come down the female line. 
Oh, the whole mice mitochondria. Just the whole. Yeah, uh, your, you know, um, um, your susceptibilities and your um, the genetic mitochondria. People think if I've got genetic or whole mitochondria, then I'm not. That's it. I think I don't think so. Most diseases, gene, environment, interaction it means you just need to have to work hard on the mitochondria. So I see lots of mother-daughter, mother-son combinations. You know, our grandmother was the same. She was always tired. That's because the mice, so you've got genetically slightly iffy mitochondria. Um, another clue that's a mitochondria issue is, is, is the kid that comes last in all the school cross country places. They're going to have <laughs> The kid that comes first is going to have good mitochondria. I mean, generally speaking, of course, the athletes have good mitochondria for obvious reasons. Um, it doesn't mean they can't burn themselves out. And they can also improve their performance um, um, with you know, the mitochondrial package and the keto diet. So, can I ask what? Uh, I'm, I kind of know it's going to be, I think it is, but niacinamide, what's yeah. that, what does that do? That's B3, that's one of the most, that is necessary to make NADH, which is one of the most important kind of intermediaries in Krebs citric acid cycle. Okay. And we need that in large amounts. And um, if somebody said to me, okay, and now you've got to rank the deficiencies that we most commonly see. Number one is going to be magnesium. Number two is probably going to be vitamin B3. That always comes up deficient. Coenzyme Q10 is nearly always deficient. Uh, AL carnitine and then ribose as a rescue remedy. Okay. So um, um, uh, you know, ribose is expensive. That's why I said part of the reason why they don't take it all the time. It's also sugar, so you know that can knock you out of ketosis. So I say, hang on to the ribose, use that as an emergency. So if you think you can be absolutely knit that today, have a two or three teaspoons of the ribose under berries, and you will recover. Without the carb, it's actually it is a sugar. It is a sugar. You know, it's a it's a five carbon sugar as opposed to six carbs. Now the body can make its own D ribose from sugar. But it's a nasty bit of pump by chemistry called the pentose phosphate shunt, and it takes some hours, if not days, to work. So you can make your own brand new ATP. Of course, you can take it in the first place, but it takes a long time. And I think that partly explains the delayed fatigue we see in We also see it in athletes. And guess what? After Steve Redgrave had just won his third gold medal, you know, the next day he was absolutely slaughtered. Why? Because he could completely overcook things. But if he hadn't done that, he wouldn't have won a gold medal. So, you know, we can all overdo things. And you know, that's how I assess, am I doing too much? Am I doing too little? If I'm, as long as I'm fine the next morning, carry on. If I'm nicked that next morning, mm, I've done things a bit and I've done wrong. So, you know, be your own doctor. Right. Um, so, the characteristic symptoms of the thyroid problems is just, if your pulse is less than 70 beats per minute, you're hypothyroid. And I had a guy who came to me the other day, his pulse was running at 45. I said, figure out, how are you standing up, matey? And she said, oh, my GP said, that's fine. He said, I must be really fit. I don't think so. No, that is far too slow. If, if it's less than, if it's much less than 70, if it's in the you know, uh, 50s or low 60s, you are high to high. Irrespective of age, fitness. Pretty much. Is this like oh, no, not fitness. See, Greg Ray's pulse, you know, when he assumed it was going down 36. Mm -hmm. and he so, but you know, guess what? My any patients are not fit. Mm -hmm. They're not athletes. So, you know, you can take that out of the equation. Um, I mean, I thought, you know, my pulse was a bit slow because I was super fit and I was very tired of actually I was high to go down. And I got my gloves on, you know, and I was wrong. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Now, it can be marked because if the heart is doesn't beat powerfully because of you know, all my tunnel function stuff. Then to maintain cardiac output, it has to beat faster. And that is driven by adrenaline. So, you know, you might be hypothyroid, but the heart, heart beating faster, it jolly well has to do that on adrenaline. And if it's doing that and you <coughs> take extra thyroid, it'll go even faster and cause you real problems. So, you know, it's another clue. It's probably a good idea not to treat the thyroid and you know, you've got to do a close iron pass. If it starts to creep up much above 85, then you've got to pull back and get everything else right before you dare try it that hard. So, poor energy delivery is obviously a thyroid symptom, but there are some symptoms which are peculiar for thyroid. Slow pulse, being an owl, as we've discussed about, thinning hair, loss of eyebrows, fluid retention and puffiness. If you're going to get puffy legs, you know, and your weight varies you know, very much, 
doing the water that got from the power issue. Look, it runs in families. Clara probably run very strong in families. We've got one local farmer, um, and there his whole family of Clara, all his three kids, him, um, at, probably I think wife and then my brother, and yeah, and their parents here. Yeah. So for some families it runs very strong. So if you've got somebody in the family who's been kind of toxic or underactive, it increases your chances of having a problem. Inability to lose weight. You know, people say, I'll do the wretched darts and I'll do everything, and I just cannot lose the weight. That's because they can't fat burn the calories. Um, not benefiting from the keto diet. So, what would you do in that to help yourself to lose a bit more weight if you're doing the keto and you're doing everything that you should be doing? Eat thyroid. Mm -hmm. Start thyroid. Right. Yeah. Metally, that's why this is why the gland is so wonderful because you don't have to go and beg and count out to your doctor who won't give you anyway. You can do it yourself. And there are other websites where you get thyroid gland um uh pin from products and time you can get um 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 on the bar from the bit if you're that taking money but you can get it um as far as F you can get um the in Mexico you can get T3 so there are places you can get it online um and I think it's three percent of it certainly not I think the other way this account we don't need um the uh final plans because I would say my daughter's none of those things. Okay well get well get do all the other stuff and I'm, I'm not guaranteed you've got a power of problem. Um, um, so get DK, get up speed with vitamin C, um, look at the heavy metal load that's HPV induces and, and she's probably in a pro-inflammatory state. Now, if you're in a pro-inflammatory state, the immune system is busy and that keeps a hole in your energy body because so, you know you're, it's civil war effectively, isn't it? You've got standing on, you've got fighting and that's not good news. It's like civil war destroys any part of the Right, um, and then the adrenal give up. So again, there aren't any very peculiarly adrenal symptoms, but some people find they can't gear up to deal with stress. They can't move into overdrive. You know, when the demands come on, then that. So that may point to an adrenal problem. It may just point to the fact that you're you're working to the absolute limit of what you can do, and so you can't do any more because you're already stressing the system to the nth degree. But that sometimes gives you a little bit. Okay, allergy. Are you allergic? Yeah, well, the allergy symptoms are, are asthma, rhinitis, eczema, urticaria, headache, migraine, irritable bowel. They're all allergy symptoms. In fact, um, during the 1980s, I used to work, um, or I had a lovely lady, I didn't work with her, but I saw her very regularly, um, Honor Anthony. Very bright, she was really my mentor during those early years. And she was in cancer research and um, was very allergic herself. And, um, for 13 years, ran the Airdale Allergy Centre, which was up in Keith in Yorkshire, um, and got fantastic results there. And I remember her saying to me in then, in the 1980s, all arthritis is allergy. And I remember thinking, yeah, can't be, can't be. I now know she's absolutely 100% right. Um, it, yes, it can be food, and I know one, one thing that stops me from dairy products is I get an arthritic right hip. You know, my mother had it. Hit the face when she was 42 and had it revised and then uh, into this and not much older. Um, so we know foods can cause arthritis, no question. But the major drive for arthritis is allergy to microbes in the gut. As we discussed earlier, microbes don't stay in the gut, they get into the bloodstream. And if they get, and they will get stuck in connective tissue, they'll get stuck in joints, muscles, tendons. And if you get allergic to them, they drive inflammation. And um, and so the treatment of anybody with any joint pain, you know, arthritic process, and it doesn't matter if it's osteoarthritis or rheumatoid arthritis or psoriatic or whatever, is the same. Ketogenic diet, cut out the main grains, um, you know, the, the main allergens, grains, dairy products, vitamin C products. And I've had not dozens but certainly several patients that have been able to cancel their hip surgery you know from new hip cancel their knee surgery because um because they have cured their arthritis with these inflammation i'm sorry in terms of question we can see the bowel intolerance you've got a stoma bag how do you do it rums is it um uh, an ileal an ileal stoma i don't know if it's um, from the large bowel, then probably the same. Okay. But for an ily one, they're, they're just running all the time, so that would be more tricky. I okay. can see that. But you just do your best. Yeah. One of the things that going to bowel tolerance, as you can see, I see there's a really great side effect because it keeps the pathways going. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And it's 
one is glorious. It's getting really good. That's it. And, get, and the major cause of brain fog is just constipation. Because, you know, you've got all these, you know, um, bugs fermenting away, and even the good bugs will produce some masses to give you a foggy brain. And, um, again, many of our patients who have had, you know, colonic irrigation, it's, oh, I can feel better after that. Mm -hmm. they got loads of, they got rid of loads of shit, haven't they? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's not rocket science. So, yes. So, and again, uh, constipation is often the thyroid symptom. So if despite you eating all the fibre and the didn't eat bread and whatever, and you're still constipated, then you have another useful thing. Um, so fermenting up, we've talked about, and again, reflux, heartburn, blue, bloating, burping, foggy brain, being apple-shaped is characteristic of fermenting gut. Why apple-shaped? Again, it's a lovely story. And again, this is Rosemary Waring, one of my favourite researchers. Um, um, she asked the question, when she was working at Milton Kings, she asked the question, what do wild animals do with their fat in the autumn when they get um, overweight? And where do they store it? Um, and when she used to go to work, you know, on a bicycle with a, a, a basket and pick up all the roadkill that she could find in order to dissect it and have a look at various times of the year. <laughs> <laughs> Probably wouldn't be allowed to do that nowadays, would you? Yeah. Um, um, and, but to cut a long story short, the body dumps it round the lymph nodes where the immune system is busy. Now that makes perfect sense because the immune system needs a lot of energy. And if a wild animal gets a cut or an abrasion, the immune system needs the, the energy to be able to deal with that before it develops an infection. So her work gives us a clue that the body dumps fat where the immune system is busy. If you've got a fermenting gut, you've literally got kilograms more grams of microbes try to fight their way into your body to give you a set of semen. and the immune system is very busy in the gut and so the gut is inflamed at the low grade level the immune system is busy fighting back the invaders and it's powered by fat so you, you become apple shaped you dump you dump and that is the reason for the beer belly of course um, and it's been well recognized that people who are apple shaped more likely to get heart disease than people who are pear shaped you dump it around your thighs then you haven't got a fermenting gut, and therefore you're not damaging your arteries, and therefore you can't. So um, that's another clue that you've got a fermenting gut. And again, I put the, to, so, so you can see, I'm, I'm going down the symptoms, the mechanisms in the middle, and the treatment is on the right hand side. And guess what? Strava directs out with PK gut, then you didn't see the bowel problems. It's back to basics. And if you, know, you couldn't be bothered to fight your way through the symptoms, and you just went through all the actions, you get yourself a job along the way. I'll ask you the same as SIBO? Well, SIBO, the answer is yes. I mean, SIBO is small bowel bacterial overgrowth. The autobrewery syndrome is yeast fermenting, um, but I don't care what it is. Okay. The treatment is the same. But I call it upper fermenting gut because everybody can get their head around that. And it doesn't distinguish it. It doesn't give you the impression you've got one treatment for bacterial fun, you've got another thing for yeast fermentation. It's all the same. That's a really interesting question, and um, uh, I've got a funny answer to that because um, um, John McLaren Howard, who I've worked closely with, he that guy should get the Nobel Prize for biochemistry. He is just brilliant what he's done. Um, 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 but he was when he was working at Biolab in the 1990s. Um, he had, um, can you do a fat bark to my cellular? We'll see what's in there, you see. And John said, oh, don't be silly, you know, it's all the same, it's all the same. She said, no, 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 I said, I said. So he did two biopsies for He did one, and it's very easy to get fat bark to. You just stick a needle into the flesh, pull it out again, and the fat within the bore of the needle is sufficient. So it sounds very fat. It's terribly easy to test it. But some of my patients do it themselves. Don't tell the MC that. <laughs> 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 Um, um, so he did both. He did the cellulite and he did the, um, the fat. He said, now normally when you look at fat under the microscope, it's white. It's lard. Mm -hmm. That's he said, I looked at the cellulite and it was grey. And he said, I wonder what that is. Do you know what it was? Aluminium. <laughs> Isn't that fascinating? Oh. Now, that is one case, one example. That's the only, there might be other reasons, I don't know. But, um, so it could be toxic. Correct. Yeah. That might just be one of the toxins because you have that bit had to be great, but it could well be toxins. Yeah. It's the one, I mean, 
there are different ways you can motivate people, but one way of motivating is through vanity. <laughs> <laughs> and when I formed my daughter of this, they really threw away their aluminium deodorants and do something much safer. <laughs> but again, another interesting thing about the PK diet is you stop having BO. Because actually, sweat doesn't smell of anything. It's odorless. Sweat is just what comes from the serum of blood. It's just blood without the, the, the harbors. What makes it smell is bacterial fermentation. And if you are exuding sugar onto your skin, because you're eating lots of sugar or you're diabetic, then um, the bacteria will flourish and you will have the air. So it's not, it's not, it's got nothing to do with keeping clean, it's got everything to do with what you're eating. Um, so having BA is, is, you know, a symptom, you're not well, you're ill. And in fact, there's a fascinating study done in, um, it was reported in New Scientist a couple of months ago. At, at some point, I had intractable, terrible BA. And so they treated him with, with loads of antibiotics and antibiotics, and um, he absolutely cleaned the skin and then killed all the micro with some gas, the antiseptic. It wasn't iodine, I know that. So it was completely sterile. And then inoculated it with sweat from a non smelly member of the family. Cured him. Got rid of the end. <laughs> so, okay, yes, it's the bugs there, but it's also feeding you. Now, I would have treated that guy differently, obviously. I would have used Jimmy Dunn. But um, um, uh, that wouldn't have been reported in New Scientist, but I thought he did what? <laughs> <laughs> I actually think the smell of breath is an indication as well as to whether you're. Yes. Because I, I'm in two situations, because one is a parent to one day whose daughter had it from 12 to 20. And she said when she walked into the bedroom in the morning, she could tell how her daughter was. She was one of those any children that could go to school one day, not the next. And she could tell how she was good. And my daughter is constant like that. Sometimes I'll sit next to her and every fifth breath or something, I just think that just smells as like mm. breath. And smell, I don't know what it is. Well, it could be products with fermented gut. It could be one of the infection. I mean, when I was a um, um, young teenager, I used to babysit um, two kids who both had cystic fibrosis. Um, and, um, and I could tell how ill those kids were the moment I moved from the house. I could smell it. And if they had chronic lung infection, you could smell it on them. The smell is a really useful tool, but we don't employ it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's not, you know, it's not sexy against sniffing. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's a it's a yeah, abnormal fermentation. Yeah. Don't worry. I mean, again, one of my when I was working as a GP at Lentrodine, um, I had a, a a lady who came in who'd got a breast lump, and she said, um, um, "I thought a breast lump." I said, "It's where my horse bit me." You see, and I thought. Um, oh and, and I think it's just that, you see. So, um, oh, I said, I said, I said, I know. I said, but you know what it is? With breast lumps, I'm always suspicious about them. You've got to get it right. So, so I, I sent her off. And in fact, I was very nauseous and very jokey. I had a team Britain being bitten by um, a Welsh cop. If you've been a thoroughbred, she'd have been fine. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, she had a cancer there. Mm -hmm. um, and now, whether the horse bite just drew her attention to it or the horse was trying to tell her something, or what, I don't know. But, it obviously smelled that normal, and uh, and he could see that as a, as a threat because I don't think it might hold. What about horses? Probably, I would probably prefer horses. Oh, <laughs> well, they are much more sensitive yeah. to it, and they guess what? They use sniffing dogs for all sorts of, and they should be using dogs for diagnosis too. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Mm, okay. So, get about it. so any treated by viral infection again, you know, we've, we've talked about that. The starting point is groundhog chronic, and there's a link to my website. Is there? Okay, well, um, uh, and get tested on our army lab for uh, the same number one is Epstein Barr virus. Comes up time and time and time again. Um, or any could be triggered by a bacterial infection. So if it follows an insect bite or a tick bite or foreign travel or a chest infection, a typical pneumonia, as we discussed, think, you know, um, um, bacterial infection, and again, um, more detailed information in the infection day, groundhog chronic, same old story, and then maybe get tested on if that's not really cutting it. Um, and then um, chronic infection is fine, and yeast could be a problem. So if you're any followed exposure to water damaged buildings, uh, chronic sinusitis, you know, like farmer's lung, um, uh, think, am I infected with yeast or fungi? Measure urinary toxins, um, mycotoxins. It's a rather expensive test, 250 quid, but it can be very useful. Now remember, everybody will have some positives. I've never seen a normal test. Octotoxin invariably comes up. But if you've got much higher levels than generally expected to be found, um, then you've got a mycotoxin treatment. 
salt coat with iodine, ketogenic diet, for the seat of bowel function for the gut, you know, and, and treat any patch of ringworm or nail infections that you may have and you get away from any exposure. Now, this is something I've learned recently, where there's any chronic infection, you likely have an underlying retrovirus. Now, we talked about this earlier, and again, this is stuff I haven't learned from thinking about. We all prefer retroviruses. We've got human endogenous retroviruses hurt. Increasingly, we're picking up retroviruses from other animals, because probably because of vaccination. So, if you look a bit, you know, um, 67% of any patients have mouth retrovirus, breast cancer, first vector, but bovine retrovirus cancer. And um, there are two good tools that um, King Hearts has used, and I'm only just starting to use them, um, which have been cut very helpful clinically. One is Sister Sinkhana's tea. Cheap, easy, you can buy it online. I bought some, doesn't taste bad at all, six cups a day. Sister Sinkhana's tea. It's written down there. It's on there. And the other thing you can use is CBD oil. Now, I have to say, I've been very nervous about using CBD oil because I've been thinking to myself, that's symptom suppressing, and we shouldn't be symptom suppressing. But it does have very wide application. You know, it's a proven benefit in epilepsy. It's a proven benefit in multiple sclerosis. Many cancer patients use it. Many ME patients use it. And I think the reason for that is they're all driven by retrovirus. And, and CBD oil is um, antiretroviral. So maybe if you've got you know, some chronic underlying infection, we should all be taking CBD oil just to fix that. Now, you don't want the stuff with the THC in it that makes you get loopy. Um, but the CBD oil, you can buy it over the counter now. Now, it's not cheap, I have to say, but now it's become more available. It will get cheaper. Um, and um, you know, I've got one or two people I need to think off the top of my head who have been you know, done all the other stuff and had a quantum leap improvement since trying CBD. So don't, don't, don't start that off the front liner. But you know, do all the other stuff first. It's a useful tool to try to use. Um, and also, because there's lots of different levels of strength. So, mm -hmm. so if one person works mm -hmm. and you want them to try something else, you can help them. I know I'm not the expert. And I suggest that you would need to look for something that's a full spectrum organic companion. Mm -hmm. Because I use a, a use CBD, which is a full spectrum mm -hmm. organic mm -hmm. What's the name of the product you use then? It's from a company called CBD Hero. He started, his wife started using it because of something that she's had. And then after a couple of years, the, the problem was improving, so he decided to, to sell it. And actually it's doing so well uh, that she's now going into working, she's working with him. And when I started taking it, um, I was on um, anti-inflammatories that came from Dr. Strengthens. And after three days I woke up and I had no more the pain. Uh, after three days of taking it, the pain was gone. And I went off antidepressants after using it as well. I used it thirty percent. But if you look at the um, reviews either on Facebook or on the website, um, there's some amazing stories about how it helps it. So that people with it's no problems and acne. I know that's what's so fascinating about it. You know, and to have that widespread application, it's got to, there's got to be a common you know, factor. Well, I've actually got to find five and round CBD oil. Fantastic. Yeah, that's so a good yeah, but 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 you know these all these right. things are going to work much better if you do everything else. You do the groundwork. Yeah, I'm doing that as well. Yeah, yeah. I've put it in. Right. So again, you then need to follow down to work. That gives a clue. Um, and again, when people sit down and really think about it, then they suddenly oh, do you know what? When I had you know all those crowns and all that that bridge work and all that you know um, and it's things I hate seeing kids in corrective dental braces. Mm -hmm. It's a poison. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons why kids are we then using so much of those that brace material is because kids don't eat these food anymore. They don't have to chew. You know, all their food is soft, it's all packed, it's all soft biscuits and soft bread and boiled up vegetables. So, so they're not using their jaw. And it's using the jaw chewing that pulls the whole thing into shape. And you may be aware of work by um, Western Price, who is a dentist in the Western Price, I think in the 1930s, where he went around looking at the dental arches of primitive tribes who were eating primitive foods, you know, hard food that they could chew. And they've got beautiful dental arches in all three, you know, transversely, horizontally, vertically, um, um, uh, dimensions with beautiful teeth with no decay. As soon as they go on to modern dance with sugars and carbs, the jaw becomes on the shop, they, they get rotten teeth, and they lose teeth, and they're all gappy and, and missing teeth, and they don't need 
And yet, if you look at people, um, um, there's another book uh, called Yours, which is about what the height of him. And if you look at people in profile these days, so many of them have got yours. And that's sticking out. Now, you can, there is a lot of traffic work you can do to pull this out. Um, uh, some people might make it out of the and if, um, uh, you know, you have to be in fact, you have to be very careful when you are your children. Mm -hmm. when, um, when my girls were little, you know, I explained to them, we thought, I've got my head on the wrong subject, but I said, how they could diagnose tertiary syphilis because um, mm -hmm. it's a collapsed, it, it, it destroys the nasal brain. You get a collapsed nose, it's called a saddle nose. Ever since which, uh, anybody who came to the house, they'd shuffle around to the side of them, <laughs> and see if they could get through trouble, I knew exactly what they were looking for. <laughs> <laughs> but not you got surgery syphilis. <laughs> okay, and again, if somebody has got a history of exposure to spray drift, aerotoxic syndrome, you know, um, chemical fires, chemical dumps, you know, think poisoning by pesticides, volatile organic compounds. And guess what the heating regime is like? And I don't think it matters what sort of heating regime you use. I don't think it matters if you use hot baths with depth and salt in, or saunas, or running if you've got the energy from it, or sunbathing is fantastic, or a sunny holiday is even better. In fact, I had one family who came to see me um, who had been poisoned because in the 1980s, you couldn't get a mortgage on your house if there was exposed timber. It had to be treated with linden. Mm -hmm. And without that Lindane treatment and the rent kill certificate, you couldn't get a mortgage. So lots of people had their houses fumigated with fucking Lindane, terribly nasty, toxic stuff, of course. And the guys would come in in full chemical warfare suits and, and, and go out and say, yes, it's fine to go in there. Don't you? Yes. It's a joke. Anyway, I had a family who came who'd been well and truly poisoned. And I did the fat belt, says, yes, high levels of, 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 actually they had OPs, they wasn't Lindane. They'd been treated for, the house been treated for fleas. And fleas they use organophosphates to fumigate the house. Any of them are RBs. Do you know what RBs are? <laughs> Again, this is a great story. I'll just jump sideways for a bit because it's a joke worth telling. But this is a there's an article in the, in the Daily Telegraph, oh, 20, 30 years ago, about a merchant bank who had decided to um, target its top 100 clients for a new investment scheme. So they got some scroff in the admin department to you know, put the letter together. And in those days, you had mail merged. So instead of putting in your um, <coughs> dear sir, you could put in your dear Sarah Martin, your dear whatever. Anyway, um, um, the guy obviously forgot to press the button to do the mail merge uh, at the last name. And so this top merchant banks, um, wealthiest hundred clients all receive a letter that opened up, dear rich bastards. <laughs> <laughs> so oh. it has become my acronym for the wealthy ones. Yeah, he's an RB, he can afford it. So anyway, <laughs> this is an RB family who came to see me. And um, so they said, well, what's the quickest way to detox? So I said, go to Danubia Spa in Eastern Europe, cheapest chips. Um, uh, okay, you've got to fly over there, but once you're there, so they went over there and they had three weeks at this five-star hotel, which costs what two-star hotel costs in this country. And there, they and over there, they're much more into these detox techniques. They have their spa therapists, they have their massage, their sauna chambers, you know, detox diet, sunbathing, and the whole family was there for three weeks and had all this wonderful treatment. Came back to me and said, can you repeat the fat bulbs? Says, no, I said, far too long. At least we just want they might, I don't do my patients so they have at least what no come on, we're our bees, no do it. Pesticide's gone. It was incredibly effective. And where is this It's called the Nubia Spa, but there are lots of them out there, you know, um spa hotels. It's just a a, 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 a I think I think they've even got Danubius hotels in London now. I'm not sure if they offer the spa stuff. D A N U B I U S. And I don't think there's any good Hungarian spa. Exactly. You look, you look on the website, also places like Poland. Well. Exactly. They're even cheaper. It's, well, yeah. well, I mean, my, one of my, my first lovely secretary, Hanya, is mm. Polish. Mm. And she said, you know, uh, when you were there behind the Iron Curtain, um, everybody in Germany got a free week's holiday every year at Spa, mm. Spa Town, where they were treated for nothing. And it was just an accepted part of normal cups. That's what we do. And they had spas that were good for heart disease, and spas that were good for arthritis, and spas that were good for cancer. You just you know chose the ones that you could get. 
The one that you, you just passed there has wonderful kind of thermal spots with the proper kind of, you know, very, very mineral rich water. And we have salt caves as well as part of So that's this sort of isn't it? Because yeah, you, you sit in the, in, you sit in the salt cave and you kind of inhale the, the, yes, the salt. Yes, the salt. Yeah, and yeah. <coughs> well, no, uh, my, my other daughter lives in Paris and she said, oh, come on, let's go down for the Turkish Oman button. Mm -hmm. Oh, right there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah, lovely, beautiful building, of course. Red hot, and then this ice cold pool went into it. And it cost us 20 euros each. We spent five hours in there. I said, I spent 20 euros, we could get our money's worth. Yeah. Yeah. And you come out, you just feel like you're floating on it. And you have the massage, and then back in the sauna again. And, and the, the, the lovely ladies there were absolutely said, This is medicinal. This is not really cheap. This is medicinal to do. And they're absolutely right. Mm -hmm. And it's So, again. I, I always feel a lot worse after Well, that's because you're mobilising toxins. Mm -hmm. and, and you have to be very careful when you're, when you're very toxic to go into it gently. And that's why I sometimes do like it so far into the flip saunas. But, you know, this time, basically, fairly okay, but they just really keep the poison in their ears. Um, but they were well up, they probably like fine. So you minimise Well, you start off gently and you build up. So I wouldn't recommend you all die on the plane, have three weeks intensive that might make you feel ghastly. But you know, it's going to be part of the evolution, and actually, I think we should be all working on ourselves like that because we live in such a toxic place. It's a good reward, actually, because if once you get there, you know, it's like it's not that expensive. But I was in Budapest, I was actually visiting a friend, and I was in the most amazing restaurant I've ever had in my life. And you get your teeth done at the same time, can't you? Because you're in the dentist area. Yes, exactly. Well, it might end up having to do, you know. Trips to you know, Eastern Europe yes. or India, yeah. where they've got all these traditional techniques, and they're yeah, fantastic. Yeah. Well, can I ask you a little bit about the breath smell and the feeling of infections that have a I'm thinking about the same situation with my doctor. I think I have a strep infection, and all the stuff, and I think she seems to have something that's stuck, the smell from her breath. I mean, I think the garden when I get something eaten or that. It's all fine. Just the sunlight, mm. and so just the minerals, and that's what I just thought about as well. Yeah. Snip it because you snip it, it goes to the sinuses, it's probably in the sinuses, is my guess. Okay. The sinuses, you know, it's a bit of rotten design. I mean, God designed sinuses, he made a real mess that. He made a mess that. Compounded by the fact that we walk on two legs. You see, most animals, you know, they're on four legs, and where are the sinuses? Oh, they drain perfectly. So they're shaking their head and doing that. So they're draining that way. As soon as we go vertical, they're not draining properly anymore, you know, you get, a, you get a level of it. So, um, you know, there is a, it's a design fault. One that we've got away with because, you know, um, here we are. But um, if you get infection, then it's all you get figured out. Yeah. So you're not using the salt for the mouth, you're just using the minerals. You can use it in the mouth, of course, but um, people find this in the head, it kind of hits the back of the throat. It's yeah. much better tolerated by the nose. So if you want it in the nose, simply the nose, about the mouth, about the mouth. And that puts the whole of the upper airway and the lower airway in the same contact with mm -hmm. it. I mean, so much so that I now have a confession. Because um, in the, when I was doing the PK cookbook, you know, I'd be making um, sauerkraut. And you know, I'd make sauerkraut, you know, all the salt, and the crunch of put in, everything that's been there. And then as I was writing, I thought, what's a good idea? Let's make it sunshine so it'd be brilliant. So I put that recipe in the recipe and couldn't think more about it. The next time I came to make it, I thought I'd use my sunken salt. It didn't work at all. It didn't make at all. Why? Because the tiny amount of iodine there will really make it. Yeah, exactly. So I just got salty cabbage. It's disgusting. <laughs> so there's a recipe in there which is wrong, which I'm very embarrassed about. <laughs> so the next time, don't use sunshine salt. <laughs> but, um, but that is just an illustration of what a great antimicrobial um, I use. And, and the other beauty of it, is it doesn't interfere with the healing process of the body. And so many of these disinfectants we use actually damage tissues and stop the tissues from healing and repairing. And um, <coughs> I say I have my dog Nancy, but I take out a friend of mine's dog um, um, when I go walking, a lovely lurcher with the rabbit. And <coughs> as I was coming back, she jumped over a wire fence and caught her leg on, on the barbed wire and had a great gash from all the way down the leg. And normally you think, oh, go to the bed. I said to Michelle, don't panic. We're going to, it's a nice clean cut. Wash it up. I said, we'll just bind it up with the tape to hold it together. So we might pour it all out of the end. 
<clears throat> then we just drizzle the lighting on the outside of the breast now. So keep that breast in stained yellow. You know, didn't, didn't, didn't hurt that rabbit at all. And just leave it there until the, the, the dressing literally falls off. Feel perfect. No infection, no scar, um, hair's grown over, and you, you just don't notice it. But it's just a great treatment for, for any wounds. And if you're in the wild, so you all make sure you've always got ID with you because, um, yes, it stings a bit. You put neat ID on, but you know, it doesn't damage the tissues on the contact kills everything. So it's safe to put it straight onto a wound? Like it's safe, it stings. And if you, if you had something you had a large burn, you might choose to use the coconut oil, you know, so. So um, 10 parts coconut um, oil to one part nougals and, and that's that on. But the key is put a dressing over it, hold it together, and then put the ID in on the outside of the dressing. Don't peel the dressing out and have a look, because every time you peel it off, oh, how's it doing? You down to it. <coughs> so leave it all bound up. And if you put the ID in on the outside, it will keep it clean as a whistle. You won't get infected, don't disturb the wound, and it heals up beautifully. What about some else's that on? Uh, it's a very good question, and I don't know is the answer. Um, we know psoriasis has a yeast connotation. It's yeast, yeah. it's fungal driven. And, um, but I don't think, I don't know if anybody's ever done biopsies to look for fungi, but my guess is that maybe it's a microtoxin. Mm -hmm. But I don't see you do any harm with that, and I would have been intrigued with yeah. the experiments and, and tell me that it works. Absolutely. You got it. I mean, the treatment, of course, is, is um, vitamin D. There's a product called Dominex, which is an artificial synthetic vitamin D, and laps that on, and that works very well. What you mustn't do is use steroids, because short-term gain, long-term pain. But you would be horrified how many doctors dish out steroids for a glasses. I have steroids. Just like when I was 17, they actually really part of my issues. <laughs> okay, okay, yeah. So, like, sometimes some of them are nurses, <coughs> some of them are She was treating the treatment of therapy, made patches on her leg. Mm -hmm. yeah. And after three weeks, she had patches all over her body, which, in theory, are the <coughs> chemotherapy uh, of, from the queen uh, getting into the whole of her body, trying to do the job that it was put on her skin for. So she went back and she saw a doctor, and he said, that's, I'm pretty sure that's not what she was thinking. So, um, looks more like psoriasis. Mm -hmm. And she was in such a bad way. That she came, I work in hospice with some other friends, and um, she came in and she said, Can I have a re ready treatment? And would you please have a look and see what you think? Yeah, yeah. We didn't know what it was because we didn't think it was psoriasis yeah. because it's not for 18, it's yeah. not red, yeah. yeah. it's just very red. Yeah. And still got it. Yeah. She's well, got all sorts of unknown. Well, another treatment, another thing that has fantastic results with is, is varicose eczema and venous ulcers. And I now know without a shadow of doubt that his allergy to mitosis and infections to remove the mountain gum. And you know, it's when people, you know, Henry VIII happened, didn't he? <laughs> um, you know, it's when the skin breaks down, you get ulcers and discoloration and, and inflammation, you know, of, of the lower leg. And I think it occurs there because we stand vertically and the pressure is greater there, and so your know, blood is, 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 is concentrated and the, and the, and the pipes get uh, the, the fermenting micro, the micro from fermenting up get stuck there. And then you get allergic reaction, then the skin gets broken down and then it gets infected. Guess what? You take that, you can see the foul iodine oil, it all goes away. Absolutely brilliant. And varicose ulcers cost the NHS an absolute fortune to its endless antibiotics and endless dressings and nursing visits and trips to the hospital, lots of time to see me. Very mm. What about that? Mm. Well, again, you know, that's another problem with standing up. You know, we shouldn't be vertical um, um, because there's an enormous column of blood pressuring on the, and that's where we get piles of varicose veins because, you know, we just built wrong. So I've got varicose veins partly because when I play hockey, I use elastic bands to guard and glue out all my veins. <laughs> I'm just 13. Yeah. <laughs> um, and they would tend to make varicose eczema worse, but varicose veins on their own do not cause varicose eczema. Okay, so I'm going to 
Um, are you all got a good idea? Because what I want you to do is go home with the management plan, things you know you've got to do, the rules again, and then the tools that create to get you started. Um, I, yeah, let's ask one question, yes. right? Sound a bit odd, but I mean, I suppose that one of the things I think is that how would I know when I was had the right amount of sense of energy as a normal person? Yeah, um, um, yeah. Yes. I'm kind of, I don't know what that's like. Well, you've just been so crap for so long, you've just forgotten mm -hmm. And it's a bit obvious. Mm -hmm. When you're better, people. What should I be able to do in my 50s? Well, well, I mean, what everybody else can do. I mean, yeah. I, I, uh, I mean I'm 60, oh, 62, so yeah. 61. And you know, I can work the long hours that I used to. Well, I can work the hours that just happened, but not the length of time. Right. I start at 8, and by, by 4 o'clock, I'm happy. Yes. And then we can just want to take the dog for a walk out in the garden. Out in the garden, I can work all day happy in the garden. I can happily walk, you know, 12, 15 miles, no problem at all. Yeah. You should be able to do that. Yeah. Should be able to do that. Yes. I'm not an athlete anymore. Um, um, you know, I used to do, I used to run, I used to do hockey, um, and I, you know, I no, I haven't got the sprinting power to do that. And but you know, I can, I can walk. I can walk anything. So you can you, walk ten miles every day. Oh, no yeah. Do you think that's partly uh, because you're getting burned? Um, well, that's one of the kind of you know, uh, peripheral. That, I mean, you know, I, I, what re-energizes me is, is bright light and, and, and yeah. grass and trees, and, and everybody knows that. You know, everybody, oh, gosh, every, yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. Yeah. Being around our we have, a, yeah, we have a, a deep-seated biological need for a view and that contact with nature. And guess what? We're using forest therapy to all sorts of things now. Um, so yes. And having friends around and, and, and jolly people. Um, and, yeah. <laughs> it's all that sort of stuff that you will make up in. Do you have any view on people who have to go for these grounding strips and grounding sheets to connect your body to F rather than be well, free? I, I have heard about it, I do know about it, but you just walk there, put outside and the grass mm. and then you can let people not move it. Um, that, that makes some sense. I mean, if you, if, if you use a new uh, magnetism of the uh, planet, and oh, I'm sure that has the sound effects on it. I mean, when you look at oscillated effects, and why didn't you see those things? Really, it's their motion electrons mm -hmm. to damage cells. And so, um, that's essentially what the soil is doing for their foot. Yeah, the, the, yeah. It's, it's, it's really positive. It's, it's a bit like carbon oxygen. That's it. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. But like, so there's lots of reasons why it should work, but um, it's not a major part of my work. Like that. It's, no, it, it's a bit of a jigsaw puzzle, but it's not a big, it's not a big deal. Yeah. 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 And that's another reason, <coughs> a very good test. I mean, one of my ways that I try to keep sharp is I read books and do pretty crossword puzzles, and, and, um, uh, and I know that you know, I'm as sharp as I should be. Mm. But um, you know, don't think um, having a senior moment is acceptable. It isn't. Mm. That's something you know, we, can, we have lots of jokes and lots of ways of kind of trivializing it. But you know, that is a simple early dimension. That's mm. how it starts. So uh, let's tack it. When we still have the brain power to be able to track it, mm. don't wait until you, know, you can't recognise faces and you get lost and have to be careful. Yeah, too late. Yeah. So I, I, I mean, and my brain is more valuable to me than my body. Mm. And that's our personality, and character, and how we end up living, and how we have fun. You know, it's just so important. Can I ask about testing in terms of some of the ducks? Mm -hmm. In terms of thinking, you know, about CDSE versus. Yeah. There's also new ones now, the GI effects and the GI map. I'm kind of a bit lost. Well, um, you know, I wouldn't, nowadays I couldn't bother to do the testing until I put everything else in place. Mm -hmm. um, and symptoms give you a bit too. So if, you know, if, if your gut is quiet and, and you're not constipated mm -hmm. and um, um, you can eat anything, you can eat anything within a PK gut, you're not burping, you've not got reflux, you're probably pretty okay. Um, sometimes they've got function testing useful if there's a parasite on board um, and legitimacy hasn't done its business. Or if you, if you haven't got the enzymes to digest food, and that will show up in CDSA, which is quite useful. 
But again, I do do less and less and less of those tests these days. But when people come see me with those tests, and obviously I'm interpreting for them, but the, the usual outcome is the same. Star with the wet step repeated up again, you can see the bounce off, you get too awful on and on. In fact, just been chatting with a girl who's had quite severe ulcer colitis, or all the classic symptoms of ulcer colitis. And I said to her, you don't, you know, you know wait for the, for the drugs, just get on with the dark. By the time she got to the colonoscopy, it was normal. And yet, her people felt protecting her since she was 36, and, she, and initially she was passing drugs, so she had had ulcer colitis, which is still all the stuff in place, and the colonoscopy was normal. Which is fascinating. Um, so, you know, all these pathologies that you think, oh, you know, it's drugs for life, not necessarily, you know, but some of these infections work fantastically well. I mean, you probably heard about fecal bacteria therapy. Mm -hmm. um, now, if I had somebody with a pseudomembrous colitis, you know, a collagenous colitis, clostridium difficile, or ulcerative colitis, you can cure that just with fecal bacteria therapy. Um, and, you know, that's what I would advocate to do. It doesn't but people are trying to use it for, for ME and all sorts of things. It just doesn't work so well for that. You, know, you do all the other stuff, but uh, it might come to a stage when that would be appropriate because it certainly would be a first line, line of treatment. And then if you want some of the viruses to test it, that would be our method. Yes, yeah. but again, that's down the line. Mm -hmm. You get Groundhog Pond in place first. Mm -hmm. and on my website, Groundhog Pond is there. And it's a, sh it's a, it's a, a shopping list with the most important ones at the top and then semi important as you go down. And you just do them to the best of your ability. Now, if you understand that everyone's going to do it, you can just do as much as you possibly can. But you've got the resources mm -hmm. and spend your money on that. And, um, and if that means having a holiday in Danubia spa, mm -hmm. then that's what you go for. Mm -hmm. and vaccination needed there. <laughs> 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 can you address the, um, your stomach acids? Like Absolutely. Acids? It, as well, low stomach acid results when you wash the leaky stomach because the, the stomach is lined by cells with, which are proton pumps, i.e., they pump hydrogen ion constantly and balloon the stomach, and that's what renders the stomach acid. But if you've got a fermenting gut, you've got an inflamed gut, and it's inflamed, it's leaky. So the acid leaks out as fast as you're pumping it in, and you end up with high problem. And that compounds the fermenting gut problem because you're not killing the bacteria that are fermenting. You're not digesting protein, you're not absorbing minerals, you don't have to go So as soon as you sort the fermenting gut out, you get acid, you get an acid cycle. And then it empties properly, you digest protein, you go be back again. So so hypochlorhydria, yes, you can take acid supplements, but the diet and living issue should be with them. Um, you mentioned head injuries. Yeah. Um, do you know much about like the head injury, spinal injuries, like and leaky spinal fluid, that kind of thing? Well, um, I've got one patient who's going through all this at the moment, and um, it's all pretty esoteric. I have to say. I mean, I mean, I'm quite sure for some people it is, um, you know, it is an issue, but um, I've never I'd recommend a patient go down that path yet. Um, and again, I think well, even if they've got damage. Well, the MRI, MRI isn't that, just, isn't that great, and MRI just won't see that level of damage. You know, we're talking about microscopic lesions. MRI will, <coughs> will give you definition down to maybe one or two millimeters, but it won't see if you've got leaky membranes there. Just, do you so, know what talus is? What what talus is? No. Oh, because well, I was told it's leaky spinal fluid. Well, what is, I mean, that doesn't mean anything, does it? I mean, spinal fluid isn't leaky, spinal fluid is the fluid. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, if you're saying that the, maybe the blood brain barrier is compromised or stuff leaky, well, well, my guess is that's part of more general inflammation because it's inflammation that causes leaky membranes. So the fermenting gut is your leaky gut. Um, and um, and <clears> uh, my guess is in many cases, arthritis is inflammation and therefore the, the tissues are, the sign of your tissues are leaky, and maybe that causes leaky brain as well. But my guess is that is symptomatic of more generalised inflammation, which comes back to allergy, chronic infection, and the bacteria, viruses, or yeast. So yeah. it's com all coming back to the same basic stuff. And it's like looking at an elephant, you know, you're, you're describing the tip of one ear, and I'm trying to describe the whole freaking elephant. Yeah. And, um, and once you get that right, you know, um, you've got half a chance <coughs> of seeing it. Related note somebody was asking about a relapse of ME triggered. 
by a series of concussions slash head injuries, symptoms began to reoccur along with raised prolactin levels and an MRI scan has shown a pituitary adenoma. Yeah. Is there any treatment suggested for head injuries and related pituitary issues? Well, um, you know, once you've had a smack on the head, you can't undo it. You know, um, and part of the reason all these footballers are getting Parkinson's mm. and Alzheimer's and the boxers are getting Parkinson's and Alzheimer's because repeated blows on the head get damaged. You can't undo mm. that. All you can do is your best to heal and repair it you know, and try to avoid other smacks on the head and, um, um, and you know, keep your body the raw materials for healing and repair and the energy for healing and repair and freedom from inflammation that doesn't you know, cause, cause further damage. It's all the same old stuff. There isn't a particular treatment for that particular problem. It's give the body an all the wrong pills and it'll do it itself very well. Okay. Mm -hmm. Another one was, um, my heart rate, this is another person, my heart rate has increasingly gone up and now at rest is 77 beats per minute. Why is it? I am PK <laughs> adapted on Adrenavive and Metavive and on all the supplements that you've suggested. Well, the heart still isn't beating powerfully as a heart. So there must be something other going on. And one of the problems with Epstein Bar brush, for example, is you get a heart infection with a, 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 you know, a carditis, an actual infection of the heart, and maybe that is impacting. But many of the herpes viruses um, you know, will infect the heart. So um, you know, you'd have to, um, you know, without going through what this, the, the, the cause was, but you know, if, if, if the heart is having to beat faster in order to maintain cardiac output, it's not beating powerfully as a heart. So I think you can make a leaky heart valve. Is that possible? If it's, if it's an older person, that will certainly be a possibility. Or the cardiomyopathy, which means the heart doesn't beat very powerfully, which again can be a mitochondrial problem. So um, that's when things get a bit more tricky. Okay. Mm. I thought 77 was quite good. This reminds me of what you said before. I thought you said below 70 wasn't good. In uh, 70. Well, um, it's, it, but he said it's been creeping up. That may be creeping up because he's correct with metabolic. Uh -huh. um, and uh, and now a little bit more, you know, and once it all gets bounced up, then it should come back down to about 72. So 70 to 80 is really, I mean, I'm probably over 8 miles. 70 to 80 is really very acceptable. Okay, good. Mm. Another person has Sue's questions, quick ones. Do you have a view on the 16-hour fasting pattern for ME patients? Is missing out breakfast a good idea? Um, I always think breakfast is the most important meal of the day. And so um, I think you should be having a large breakfast and then maybe lunch and, and or maybe an evening or whatever. And a 10 hour window. Yeah, I think that's that's very acceptable. I, I don't think one needs to <clears> manage <throat> them you know, the, the length of the window to, to a very great degree. But if it suits you, then that's what you do. I mean, it suits me to do what I do, but other people might be suited by something else. Question regarding whether you're aware of and have an opinion on the research done by Ron Davies at Stanford. Yeah, absolutely, on um, um, OMF. He's the part general. of the OMF or whatever. Say again? He's part of the OMF. Well, I think, is this not the, the work by Navio, the Generalized Defense Response? I don't. It says Ron Davis at Stanford in the States and others who form part of the OMF. Do any of their findings connect with yours and has anything new changed your thoughts on the illness and or treatment? Well, the, the two big players are energy theory mechanisms and inflammation. And the two impact on each other. Mitochondria is centrally involved in controlling inflammation, inflammation can inhibit mitochondria. But um, I think he's talking about Robert Navio's um, cell defense reaction, which is what the cell does when it goes into hibernation mode. If it's completely assaulting the cell, it just kind of shuts down. And, um, and you know, he's been fantastic because he's described the mechanisms down to the last degree, but it doesn't change management. The basic management is still the same. You know? get those cells out of hibernation mode, give them the energy, reduce the inflammation, give them a chance to wake up and, and allow normality to restore. But he's done a brilliant job of describing the cell defense reaction to overwhelming stresses, whatever those stresses may be. Okay. That's and right. the same patient, I think, again, yeah. I think we've probably covered this one, I have an extreme reaction to anything less than eight hours of sleep. It has always led to relapses. Even on seven hours of sleep, the effects are drastic. Mm -hmm. Although I realise the recommendation will be to get sleep, it's mm -hmm. not always possible. Is there anything that you'd recommend to alleviate well, this problem? I, mean, some, I have, have other patients who are like that, and they mass it because it's absolutely critical. It suggests me they're living life a bit on the edge. Mm -hmm. And if they take any liberties, you know, they, they fall off the edge. So maybe he needs to pace better, 
and then work hard at energy proving methods, work hard at information, and maybe that will be solved. But you know, um, all my patients live life on the edge. They do as much as they possibly can before they crash, and that is not the way to do it. Mm -hmm. Because you need some energy for healing and repair. So um, um, you know, very often say, oh, I try to walk three miles you know, once a week to keep fit. So no, 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 don't do that. It's stopping you from getting better. In the early acute phase, you absolutely must pace activities, so even though it gets, goes against all our ideas of my sex life, must walk and so on. Um, when you're better, while people can't you know, hold you back, then yes, please do get them to do exercise and have a jolly time. But the key is, if you're paying for it the next day, you've overdone things. Mm. Mm. Okay. And, um, and if you're still getting delayed fatigue, you are not pacing well enough to allow recovery. I do think it's very difficult when you've got two young kids, but that is the rule. Mm. And then you get accused of school phobia and, yeah. and, and all this sort of nonsense, and, yeah. then, and you get the hands of psychiatrists, and then you're in real trouble. Can I ask about success rates from people who follow your protocol? Well, they change. Well, they found or how long you use? Oh, of course, yes. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I mean, yeah. The trouble is, you know, I, I, I cannot follow all my patients. It's just impossible. But what I can tell you now is. I'm getting much better at it. And um, most people are seeing benefits and improvements, some, well, many getting back to holding down jobs again. And, and, be, and I know that in the long term, they hold some place, they're not going to get heart disease. You know. So it's a much more, you know, it's a much bigger picture these days as I'm working towards. And um, yeah, we all have to struggle with. And they're the guys who learn new stuff from because you, know, you try everything and they're still, they're still sick for whatever it is. But whenever somebody comes to see me, I always say, how do how you go? Oh, yes, 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 I'm paleo ketone. Are you? you know, what do you have for breakfast? Oh, well, I have chia seeds these days. And, and, and you suffer those actually, they're not. They slip back into their old ways. So I keep banging on about that because I know it's boring, but this is just so. Without that, you can't be malabsorbed. You're fermenting, you're poisoning, you know, you're allergic, you know, everything's falling apart. Even if you don't have fermenting gut to start, even if that's the normal gut. Well, um, if you're eating carbs, you will, you will be fermenting. Because bacteria, it's a question of levels, yeah. I mean, I've probably got a few, well, I know we've all got a few, but as long as it's a few thousand, that's no problem. If it's a hundred thousand or a million, it is. And remember, given the right substrate, microbes can double their numbers every 20 minutes. So, you know, if you've got a million, which is, sounds like quite a lot, well, in 20 minutes time, you've got two million, and then you've got four million, and then you've got eight million, and then you've got 16 million, and people snacking through the, regularly through the day, as is what people do, it's an apple, the only biscuit there. They're feeding these bugs all the time, and they're just thriving. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you'll never get rid of every bacteria. Every surface in the world is covered with bacteria. But it's just an understanding to keep you delayed. Mm -hmm. Just wondering about adrenals, when would be the ideal time to take? Oh, I tend to say take in the morning, because mm -hmm. there's a diurnal rhythm. You know, so we have high levels of thyroid adrenal hormones in the morning at the end of time across the day. So I say take the adrenals, or if something's very sensitive, I take one. They take half the dose in breakfast and then half at lunchtime. That yeah. fires you up for the morning, fires you up the afternoon. Same with the thyroid. And then, you know, lower to allow sleep. Do you allow about the breast milk? Yes. Yeah. Can I ask about, um, like, getting viruses and stuff when you've got any? Because I have had, I've been ill for about three years and I never got one virus, even if I was like very close to people or family members that had viruses. Um, and I got my first, my first flu virus like last week. And I have actually had a better period recently and I've been like wondering if it's actually in a way. Uh, it does, well, sometimes it can be a kidney system for but it, it's an interesting point you make. And, and many people then we don't see get or sometimes don't pop cold, and I think that's because they, what should happen when you get a virus is have a massive new reaction in those that snot it out, cog it out, scrub it out, so it doesn't become systemic. And maybe you're just, it's just becoming systemic and causing a low grade content. So I don't think that means you're beginning to use it, it might mean the opposite. Um, um, our blood would still take ever any sign of any tooth infection from the mattress, waterworks, chest, gut, putting those down on the feet. Get rid of the wretches because they, they, they they become ensconced in the body. And at the front of the infection game, one of the books there, it details all the infectious associates with dementia, with the various cancers, 
and, and you know, wherever I looked, every cancer has an infection associated with it. So it might be retrovirus or whatever. So we were fine to get rid of the infections. So there's a question here about um, the patient who was having the uh, repeated antibiotics and the problems with MRI scans and things. They're now asking to do a scan or an MRS scan with gadolinium dye. Anything to be, should that alarm them? Should they well, go along with it? Well, nasty, toxic stuff and, um, and will deposit in tissues and you can have dirt people. And it, we've seen that increasingly now in tests coming up. You know, the medical profession does far too many tests. Um, we get more radiation from medical investigations than all background radiation and everything else put together. You know, people worry about uh, radioactivity and, and electromagnetic radiation. The most profession is largely responsible for that. So um, you, know, you, you want to ask the question whenever somebody offers you a test, especially an invasive test like this, <coughs> how is this going to change management? You know, what is going to be done over and above what's ever, what is already in place? So let's put the everything we can possibly put in place and okay, maybe think about it then. But I don't say yes, I don't say no, have you? So I don't know the clinical indications. But so often the, the, the medics do investigations because they want to be seen to be doing something. They want to be seen to be helpful. So that if they get criticised, they say, "Oh, well, we did this test, and we did that test, and we did that test." So you know, you've got to work it out yourself. You know, why am I doing these tests? What benefits? You know, I'd be better off spending my resource on whatever, whatever, whatever. Brilliant. Thank you. I have a question about um, lowering estrogen. Yeah. Um, and using calcium B to do it. Well, why would you want to lower estrogen? Is that somebody who's been on the pill or HRT? Um, she hadn't been on the pill at that time, but she had high estrogen levels. Also very high. Yes. Oh, that's a bit. Oh, I was. I was I don't know what. How old? Um, she's 18. Well, um, I have to look at the tests and the circumstances, but I've never been asked that question before. Usually, you know, people worry about low estrogen levels, which I'm not worried about so much. Um, but um, maybe she ovulates on that day, or um, maybe she's got um, um, sometimes the, the IUCDs, if you want IUCD, sometimes put hormones in those. Maybe she's had, I, you know, I don't know. My guess it's got to come from the outside world. Yeah, I think so. I think it came through on a test that um, who was your colleague who said she'd been awarded the medal. Oh, John Farnham. Yes, I think it came through on one of his tests when he was doing it for Naples. Well, you wouldn't find high levels of estrogen. You might find estrogen stuck onto trans okay. and something. So it doesn't mean they've got high levels in the blood, but right. I mean it's stuck in a place where it shouldn't be. Okay. Which would be slightly different. Oh, okay. mm. I'm kind of interested in this link between sex hormones and them in because it, it feels like you're a woman and I, my mum has suffered hormone irregularities her whole life in terms of progesterone. My sister's got endometriosis, my aunt's got endometriosis. I've got some horrendous mm -hmm. PMT and I just, yeah. you know, and I just, I the only thing I've been able to think recently is I might, you know, I'm in like PMDD is am I reacting in a autoimmune way to my own progesterone. You know, I'm fascinated. There's obviously a link somewhere, isn't there? Yeah. I just well, not quite... Well, you're right. All, all my workshops have been, you know, 90% women. Yeah. Um, and there's no doubt that, you know, um, that female sex hormones are to blame. As I said earlier, female sex hormones are almost unnecessary for us to reproduce, mm -hmm. and, uh, but they're very dangerous. It messes us up afterwards. So saying it? It messes us up from here on out. Absolutely, yeah. So, you know, uh, now, what you prove is with primitive man or primitive woman, she never saw a period. Because either she was so starved, she didn't have the, the um, raw materials to become mm -hmm. Or she was pregnant. Yeah. Or she was breastfeeding. Yeah. So seeing the radio cycle is actually a very abnormal state at best. It's mm -hmm. not what you know, print was, not what the evolution meant for us. Mm -hmm. Now, I have to say, my um, I wouldn't recommend <laughs> Starve yourself so much density growth at all or, or, or being endlessly pregnant. But the point is, female sex hormones are intrinsically dangerous. Yeah. Yeah. Um, even your own female sex hormones are intrinsically dangerous. 
I'm just beginning to wonder about just I'm thinking about crash it's in, I'm a reacting to project so it's obviously something that's making me like do the basic do the basic stuff well. Mm -hmm. And I, I think more for the PMTS and the compartments. So, so often yeah. on the results are only getting files. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean nobody in the family has bad thyroid results and the whole family is lethargic and overweight. You know, it's well, obviously that what would you call it well, secondary? Well they've got metabolic syndrome and and, and might say probably have got thyroid. Yeah. 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 Are we fun? Yes. It's very another pro inflammatory force. And again, I went to a, 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 a another conference <coughs> in um I think it was November, uh Academy of Nutritional Medicine. And there's a lovely speaker from America, and she said there are three things that come up time and time and time again for people they live. I can't even remember them. One is Wi-Fi, one is glyphosate, and I can't remember what the other one was um, as, as cause of chronic illness, which people seem to think, oh well, it must be dental marketing, I can't remember. But you know, she said people do a great job with their diet, they sort out the candor and stuff, and they forget the Wi-Fi and they forget the glyphosate. Which is, which is uh, glyphosate um, and the pesticides. So you know, eat organic, eat up regime, Wi-Fi, it's lethal. And this 5G that's coming on is going to just wreck the same we love it. It's just a disaster. And, um, I know. I know. Apparently, the microwaves are so much shorter than the power is very close to the community. And you can't really evade the dragon's in your body. Yeah. Whereas three G and four G waves are longer, and so you get less of them, and they're probably not going to get through. If your next door neighbour's got a big dragon in the wild, chances are I'm not going to do the whole thing. But there's quite a lot of thought that if you can boost your immune system, mm -hmm. you don't get Talking about today, I know it's just um, another load on sinking mm, ship, isn't it? Mm, it is. And Dietrich uh, Greenheart um, did a, a mini video which came to the community today, which was rosemary tincture and propolis, so two things which you can see all the So it's probably worth talking about this website mm. as well. well it's avoidance, 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 sure. and, and maybe mm -hmm. so you know, do your best. And the worst three offenders in home are Wi Fi, so switch off at night at least, um, mobile phones, and cordless phones. Don't use cordless, leave the mobile off, you know, um, use the landline. And if you've got fiber optic connection, you have to use that, get that. That's going to be my next project. I've heard a big mistake with VLCs recently. Was there anything you could think of to try and well, you know, obviously keep the doors open, reduce yeah. exposure as much as you can, but sweating regimes gets them out, and you might even consider the clays because yeah. they get they, 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 they get dumped in fat, they get dumped in bile, and um, the adsorbent clays will, will, will grab the bile and, and, and bring it out through the feces. Top spent would be would do no harm at all. Um, I probably wouldn't take it. It's a good question. She does it collate up the can see. I don't know if it does. I doubt it does. I think vitamin C is too small and wide. But they say vitamin C small, little and often to the day is what I do. Yeah. So I just slurp that. So, you know, and I know that when my bottle is empty, I've had my day, there's some bingo. And does this grow better damage your teeth? Um, some people say that. And, um, it is actually quite a weak acid. And of course, you slurp it back, and then of course, saliva comes in and immediately dilutes it and washes it away. So, my guess is I don't think it causes too much problem. If you're really worried about it, then drink it just raw. Yeah. Mm. Um, I was just talking about this because I've been doing this diet, um, and the symptoms I've been having, which is like swelling, backache, and just sort of a quick glimpse of inflammation, has come quite recently. And it's kind of sometimes it kind of gets worse with this. Well, we're going to see a slight diuretic, so it might give you more frequent food. Right. Okay. Um, um, but so again, I'm just trying to work out if it's like the things I'm doing, the supplements I'm taking, or like I'm eating the right things, which is a good thing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then, how long have you been doing it for? I mean, I've been doing it for three years, so 
Okay. Yeah. Okay. yeah, so I'm just wondering um, now, I had it sort of a year ago, um, and I've got it really quite bad, and it hasn't been as bad since. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm sort of doing sort of first order and wave issues mm -hmm. and that kind of thing. But I'm just wondering. You know, why it kind of suddenly flared up now? Well, I'm not sure yeah. the answer, but you just got to do it all and, 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 and hang on in there, and, and yeah. maybe you have a eureka moment suddenly. Oh, do you know what I said? I want to get a little, or I don't know, mm -hmm. you know. Um, but that's where the good detective work comes in, right? Because um, um, we've got shocks, you've got a shock or something can trigger that in, in the immune system. So, yeah, so it's like if you look back to you know, if you've had a shock. In, in a way that sometimes that can trigger it too. Mm -hmm. Well, it could switch on and inflammatory mm -hmm. thing. I mean, exactly. the immune system is an absolutely essential tool, but if you switch it on incorrectly, it's a very dangerous one. Mm -hmm. That's the thing, you know, like psoriasis is often used as well. And just, like, that, that, I think that's my biggest Yeah, well, you might want to go down the let's reduce inflammation path with, you know, mm -hmm. high dose vitamin D and maybe um, yeah. like cure maybe you know, five grams per day. Yeah. And yeah, vitamin C, B12 is anti-inflammatory, thyroid is anti-inflammatory, adrenals are anti-inflammatory, yeah. um, and you know, detoxing all the <coughs> heavy metals you know, are pro-inflammatory. You know, we live in a pro-inflammatory world. Um, and then you might like to look at microimmunotherapy, which is a homeopathic technique for, for switching off the immune system, and that works very well. I mean, in the early days, when I was just, you know, didn't really know where I was, where I was and muddling along, yeah. um, I used the technique with EPD. You may have heard about. I learned about it. I went and sat with Len McEwen in about 83, 84. He was using it in London and I could get it on NHS prescription. So I just ordered it up for surgery and sat in my fridge and I dished it out like bloody smarties because you know it was a tool I had. It didn't cost the patients anything. They thought it was bloody wonderful because it got rid of their knee brain, their irritable bowels, and so on. But I think it just put them into an, a, an anti, a, a less inflamed state and switched off their allergies. So I got good results just from using that. But um, you know, it's it's an expensive tool because you know you know to get it in Italy these days. It's much expensive. People have to come and see me. It made people addicted to me, which I didn't like. I just mm -hmm. want the same people coming back there, and I still do have people come back every six months to their to their their, their EPD top up shop. And it obviously works wonderful. But I'm looking for other ways to damp down the immune system. It doesn't need me to get in the way, and that's why I think microimmune therapy is going to be very helpful. And um, um, if you look on my website, I give details of all the remedies and how you can access them and, and what they do. It's only cheap, but then it's much less cheap than you can be. Um, and there's no travel, you can do it yourself. You can put stuff in the post to you. And you know, that might be helpful. Yeah. Okay. Um, can I just ask, uh, in terms of if you're talking about a shock or a breathing or a trauma or whatever, if some, that's triggered um, CFS or, you know, which is. Not only CFS. Um, do you have any views on any other kind of alternative therapies that people might try, like I don't know, meditation or hypnotherapy well, or anything? We, any we all go through life with terrible mm. shocks, and if that tipped you into me, that what that tells me is you must have been right on the edge, and that was the last straw that broke the camel. Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. So you yeah. do the other stuff. Yeah, but, yeah. There are lots of treatments. What I call the emotional hole in the engine. I don't pretend to be good at those mm. because there are so many other people that are much better than I am. And yes, hypnosis might be helpful. Yes, NLP might be helpful. You know, yes, psychotherapy might be helpful mm. or counselling, whatever. So that all helps. Mm. And are, that, are they on your kind of natural um, yes, health absolutely. thing? Are they absolutely. those people that sit there? Yeah, absolutely. Yes, there, there are. Mm. And, um, so, and, and some do consultation by Skype or phone. We can mm. see them and find someone in there or whatever. Yes, mm. absolutely. Yeah, because I mean, one of the things I trace, I have a um, he head injuries from when I was a teenager. And, um, well, that's the trouble, and you can't undo that. That's yeah, because I was 19 when I got a yeah. Well, that's not helping, obviously. Yeah, but so I think that's created a layer of stress in my body, which is kind of that's keeps it on. And permanently, almost like a kind of form of PTSD. I think. Absolutely. It keeps it on yeah, well, again, sleep yeah. would be the most important. Yeah. Like, keep hot to sleep so the body can. The brain can rationalize those things. And we know childhood trauma, with its bullying, with its emotional, sexual, financial, whatever, is a major factor of trauma. Yeah. For obvious reasons. Mm. Mm. Um, if you if you had got the antibodies of BCG, yeah, yeah, so like you didn't need the injection, would mold like trigger that? Or no. 
I mean, uh, I mean when I was, I worked in, in Uganda in 1980, looking at BCGs and, and, and the TV reactions, and it's like developed in testing patterns. It doesn't, it really doesn't tell you somebody if you do a BCG test if somebody's got TV or if they haven't, or whether they're an antibody positive or they haven't. All it means is they've seen that micro at some point in the past. It doesn't tell you that they've got it actively in their body now. So, you know, it's not useful information. It wouldn't right. change my opinion. But mold could be a. No. No. No, molds and TV, they're two different things. So, oh. um, if, you, if you're mold infected in, it's water damage buildings, it's science, scientists suggest this to us. Um, uh, the two can coexist in the same person, but I don't think one is causal or not. Do you think this is a slightly Do you think that something that's really corona virus antibodies because corona virus has existed in cold Well, yes, it is another it's a new strain. And the latest thing to say is that there is a there is a laboratory in world that um, does virus research and the and the and mm -hmm. the idea that, that well the the the, 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 the conspiracy theory is out there. Is it was it was a virus that sold from and they were developing that and it's been out there. Mm -hmm. And the blend of the animal market is in fact much safer. But the point about coronavirus is it's obviously infectious. When you get sick, and therefore it's going to be hard time down. So there's nothing we can do. We are all going to get it. There'll be no doubt about it. But with the right tools of the trade, you will survive. We shouldn't be asking, you know, our five percent going to die. We should be asking why the ninety five percent survive. And the answer is because they've got good immune systems. Mm. And 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 you help the immune system by keeping the loading dose down, iodine and salt ties, and you don't feed the bugs. So ketogenic diet and when you get it you wrap up and you keep warm you run a fever don't symptoms of pressure with parasites and all those crappy drugs that get in the way of the immune system and stop it from you know working um uh do all the ground for the cute stuff and get something like echinacea and something like garlic and something like selenium but get do that on top of all the other stuff so you just throw all the weapons you possibly got at it you know when um um henry the did got the French out of half in 1415. You know, he didn't just cover, run a couple of hours over, you know, he had a bashing round, he poisoned the water and he starved them, and blah, blah, blah. And eventually, it's exactly the same. You throw everything you possibly can. Mm -hmm. Can I ask, with the mitochondria um, stage, you talked about KP10, B3, B9, yeah. etc. Um, B3 and glutathione, yeah. if at the beginning, because we had one of the uh, Geneva by Next to One test done, um, and they came out to be okay, it was good. Do you still need this because you need greater levels? Well, um, when, whenever I do results, they're either deficient or right at their end. Um, juice done, I think we should all be taking for life because we live in a toxic world. So I, I do measure levels, that's half the, the sound program I do, but most people end up giving, giving recommended juice time. Vitamin B3, again, almost invariably comes back deficient or right at their end of range. It's dirt cheap. In a 90 tablet or 100 tablets, which will last you three ounces, is about, I don't know, it's about a ten. I can't remember the You can't make them either, so there's no bomb rate. Absolutely not. You can only do good things. B2, is that very important? Well, that's in the market, okay. and that's what we should be having. So I just seek out a real B3? Yeah, B3. Yeah. I mean, I reckon 1,500 milligrams, the idea is 4 milligrams. That's it. What's that idea? Coronavirus, and how much of that would you say? Well, you snip it. I mean, there's iodine in the sunshine salt, so that covers you, it stops you giving the acute iodine deficiency. But we're using iodine in a different way with coronavirus. We're using it not to replace the deficiency, but to kill the bugs. So you get your salt pipe out, um, and you know, a couple of drops in. I can still smell stuff I put in in the morning, so that will do, you know, and that contact kills everything. And if I sniff it and exhale it, you put the whole lot of airways in the mouth a lot. Contacts kill them. I mean, leave them sneaking from the eyes is my guess, you know, because you know, it's volatile and gets everywhere. Kids, if they don't do it, just smear some iodine all on their face, just like you did the rats with the plague virus that I was um, uh, describing earlier, and um, uh, and that will um, check the kids. So when baby Bob's who's you know 18 months and doesn't know how to use a salt pipe, we just smear iodine on her nose, and she's right as rain in 24 hours. So you use it as prevention and cure? Absolutely. It contact kills everything. So not only 
you do yourself a favour, you're also reducing the learning dose for everybody else around you because every time you exhale, it or if you've got any to exhale, you know, it's killing it on the way out. So you know your friends aren't getting such a big learning dose. So the key is you know, it give everybody coronavirus the time you need your doses so the immune system can learn it. It takes a little while for the immune system to gear up in you know, a few days and then you know kill it before it, you know, the, the coronavirus grows so quickly that it overwhelms you because that's what people die of overwhelming infection because their immune system aren't gearing up and more fast enough. That's why it's particularly affecting older people because as you get older, your immune system doesn't work sufficiently and so it's tending to kill older people. And if you've got cancer or anything like that, it's, it's you're already immunosuppressed. It's quite, you know? quite often it kills people now. Yeah. So it's going to pick so, up. Yeah. It's going to pick up the diabetics running high blood sugar. It's going to pick up people who are on almost any medication because so much medication is immunosuppressive. Mm. It's going to pick up the elderly. Um, um, but you know, if you do all this stuff, don't lose any sleep. You'll be fine. Why do you think it's going to be so much worse than SARS? Because SARS was sort of contained. Well, it's probably because um, SARS wasn't infectious until people got symptoms, so they get the symptoms. Yes. And so, they, so if they were then isolated and contained, it didn't spread. But corona is different because you can be a spreader without any symptoms. And they're talking about mm -hmm. super spreaders, you know, people who hardly get any symptoms, but you know, spread all out the, 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 the London. Like the guy from Russia, yes, yeah. Yeah, that's what I said. Yes. So don't be in any doubt, you know, we will get it. Mm -hmm. And even if we do a good job of containing it here, it's going to sweep through Africa and um, uh, South America, you know, and the whole of India because mm -hmm. they can't possibly isolate. They're much more dense. You can get all the flying train for all the time. So you're yeah. going to get it. Don't be in any doubt about mm -hmm. that. But, you know, um, you know um, um, be prepared. Yeah, and, yeah, and, yeah. Yeah, what, yeah, let's say, you know, um, fail to prepare and you prepare to fail. Mm -hmm. What I'm saying is take, take the, the, the two and put them in your first aid mm -hmm. box so they're there. And then when it happens, you know, don't don't wait for it to happen and then get on the website and wait three days for stuff to arrive. It's too late. Mm -hmm. you know, be prepared. Get the stuff that you need in your armamentarium now. And even if you can't go to buy a salt pipe, just sniffing the ID. Do you do that every day or not? Is that just no, no, I'm just doing it to demonstrate. Okay. Um, um, but if there's a, if you've been in from any being exposed, then blast the moment. I guess we can go on a plane flight or something. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, How long do they last those? Um, well, the salt pipes last forever. Yeah. No, I mean, no, even, even when you put loads of iodine in there? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, it always is. It's only a delivery method. method. Yeah. Now, the salt, pipe people, time. the salt yeah. pipe people tell you only need one every six months because guess what? They want to sell salt pipe. Nice. <laughs> but it's just yeah. a delivery method. Yeah. If you want to, you can punch in the hole and just pour your own salt in there. Yes. You know, or punch in the hole on the bottom and then put a bit of tape over it. It's just a delivery method. Yes. yes. But, it, but it's a very good one. There's only one big member of the family. That's what you said, Because it kills stuff anyway. Exactly. So. You know, that is a sterilizer you can get. It, it stains it yellow so the RD is there. So if you want to have a practice, if Fine, doesn't yeah. cause a problem me. I've, you know, what's um, the idea of the salt? Sorry, that's kind of fancy. Okay, well, the salt pipe was invented by a Polish doctor, and he noticed when he worked in Poland that the miners who worked down the coal mines came up with terrible lungs and conjugated airways disease, and the miners working down the salt mines came up with beautiful lungs. We never had a lung problem, you know, lungs work perfectly well. And he asked her, Oh, I wonder if salt is good for lung disease. So just salt alone without the salt pipe is very good for asthma and for and chronic infections. But you can supercharge it with iodine. Is that just Himalayan salt? Any old salt. I think that's Himalayan salt. Yeah. So do you for people who are ex-smokers who might go? Absolutely. You know, we've got young salt. Absolutely. Absolutely. I want to ask a question about long time, the long term viral health and heart. And well, it's all the stuff I've said. But the, the point about the thyroid is um, there's an optimum amount. You can overdose with it, you can underdose with it, and there's the right amount. And you use all these clinical symptoms and signs that we talked about to, to, to make sure you're on the right dose. <laughs> I mean, the endocrinologists do their nut when they, um, there's a slight hint that you might be overdosing the keyboards. They oh, you must reduce the dose. But they're not living in your body. Mm -hmm. And you know, if you're keto adapted and you're taking all the supplements, you ain't going to get a heart disease. Your heart's going to go on beating for decades. And you know, I learned so much of my stuff from cardiologists. 
um, it's been the Sinatra in the States, but the other eggs of Europe in Italy, both completely conventional cardiologists doing you know, the heart transplants and the, the surgery and the um, drugs and the uh, pacemakers and that sort of stuff. When they started practicing nutritional medicine, they no longer needed those tools because the heart healed and repaired. And you give the heart good you know, energy delivery mechanisms, and it works absolutely fine. In fact, the first, you often see the first changes in the heart because the heart muscle is about 25% by weight mitochondria. Why? Because it needs a lot of energy. It never goes to sleep, it pumps 24 7. Whereas muscle tissue is about 20% mitochondria. Why? Because they rest and they don't have to work as because of the relentless of the heart. And you can't have people with hearts that stop, you know, information rapidly gets to the vent. <laughs> so the heart wants to go and it works perfectly well, but you've got to give it the raw materials. So, so, for example, I mean, I've um, been getting a few chest pains recently, and I think it's probably because of the improvement that I've had. But I mean, I think it's also probably the groundwork's been laid by the chronic fatigue, hasn't yeah, it? Well, yeah, well, yeah. I mean, uh, uh, chest pain yeah. is when the when you know the the mitochondria <coughs> don't work fast enough, and they go into anaerobic capacity, mm -hmm. which is lactic acid. And giant is lactic acid permanent, as we discussed earlier. Um, my any patients get angina. Mm. Uh, it doesn't get diagnosed as angina because it takes an awful long time for that lactic acid burn to go away. Yeah. Uh, if it's due to angina because of poor blood supply, then you know the patient walks out the hill, poor blood supply, gets angina, stops, blood supply continues, lactic acid is cleared away in, in, in a second, pain goes away, and you start walking again. And that's the classic history of angina due to poor blood supply. But if it's angina due to poor mitochondrial function in the heart, it takes days for mitochondria to, to recover when you've overcooked them. Mm. And so they get very long chest pain. So the cardiologist says, oh, it can't be angina because that always gets better in a few minutes. It is angina, but it's because angina is just a symptom. But it has a different cause. Mm. It's because of poor mitofunction, not because of poor blood supply. Mm -hmm. And if you're getting chest pain and you're an only patient, then you just don't do anything. Yeah. You just sort of pull back. I find I've had a bit of a problem with potassium levels and I took a strong B12 but I felt like it knocked my potassium out. And I feel like every time I get that pain and you know, that breathlessness, I, I take the electrolytes. And, and your regime with the sunshine salt, how would you recommend to get the, the sunshine salt is the perfect rehydrating mix. Yeah. Um, and it's what all athletes should take. Because, as I say, sweat is just a, a, a filtrate of blood. It's, everything in sweat is in the blood except the, you know, the red cells and the white cells and the big proteins. So, um, so, so when you sweat, you don't just lose salt, you lose potassium, zinc, copper, selenium, chromium, the whole lot. So again, if you do sweating regimes and you, and you get hot, so you actually sweat, you should rehydrate with the sunshine salt. If you get gastroenteritis, rehydrate with the sunshine salt. It's got it all in there. And isn't there enough potassium in there? Too? Absolutely. Because I don't know what happened, but I think I must have been doing keto, but not keeping potassium up. Uh, it's a strong dose of B12, and it's just totally not my own. Yeah. What's, what's going to be a major constituent of the keto diet? Green leafy vegetables. Yeah, uh, I've been able to do a good job of that. Yeah, so it's a diet, basically. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. 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 If you can't get what you find difficult, but it sounds a bit weird to get your hands on green vegetables, you know, sometimes it's keeping fresh in the fridge, and you know, know. Um, it's actually easier to have. In general, I'm fishing. Is that, yeah, what do you, what do you want to do? Is that my nose? Yeah. I'm living in a very small flat. So, one of the problems I have about buying stuff and storing it, that's one of the problems I have with fresh fish. Every time I have to go well, out. I mean, frozen measures, yeah. I mean, they're not too bad. But, I mean, yeah, but yeah. I, can't, I don't have any frozen anything. I don't have a really small flat. Mm. So, but then you mix the cycle, you have to go, oh, I always go out to the shop. Sunshine's all, I've got like a dog with potassium. Yeah. But I mean, for example, I've been peas. Absolutely. Yeah. But yeah. 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 But Timby is quite high, quite hard. So it's one of the right. Yeah. 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 Um, it's just a difficult problem. There's no, there's no, um, I live in a building which doesn't have a, an entry phone. Oh, so then it's expensive. It goes to the local post It's not that I can't get out, I'm not saying that, I all the time, but it's just, you know, maybe three, yeah. two or three days out of seven or four days, I might not 
get my hands on some green vegetables because it's not very convenient. Or because, yeah, they're local. You, there's little Sainsbury's locals and Tesco locals. Yeah. Can you remind me what the veggies part of the school are? I can't remember. Oh, it's just part of the essential fatty acids. I mean, you know, if, if you were otherwise fit and well, hemp oil would do it all. Okay. But we see blocks in the enzymes of the delta 6 desaturase, particularly downstream from the hemp oil at the top. So the veggies would just kind of oh, provide, would provide oils down, okay. downstream, as I call it. It's a bit of an insurance policy, really. I say, okay. you know, working hunky dory, you wouldn't need it. But so many of my patients do get benefit from that, but uh, I tend to include it off my end. So you say two a day, didn't they say six a day? Well, yeah, you would, wouldn't they? Um, I mean, no, if, they if, you had a day, well, two a day would be a main yeah. day. So if you wanted to start off with six or eight a day, you certainly can't overdose with it. Yeah. It's quite expensive again, yeah. um, and it's bouncing up with all those. I guess if you've got a problem with histamines or fish, presumably it avoids all of that. Um, the there are, are, there it's called okay. vegeta, but there is fish in it. Oh, is there? Yes, I know. They're very naughty, actually. Oh. They shouldn't call it vegeta because it gives the implication that it's, um, the EPA is a fish oil and they get it fish oil. Okay. Now, the good thing about it is they do clean it up. So it's been filtered yeah. through activated charcoal, so it's not used for dioxins and mercury, because that is the problem. Don't buy cheap olive oil, you'd be doing more damage than good. Mm -hmm. But we're all fine. Sorry. What about borage oil? Well, that's that's an excellent oil, but I say oh, some, the reason I like hemp oil is because it is naturally you can buy it at the supermarket. Get the best stuff you can find. It's it's naturally got the omega six to omega three in the portion four to one. That gets the thumbs up. You know, that's what you want. But you can certainly have those with too much fish oil. Yeah. I use um, flax oil. That's that's almost identical. Flax oil. They they educate on the old. How long this stays fresh and that stays fresh and grind it yourself or cotton grinder? Well, actually, it's one of the nice things about making the PK bread because you get a lot of oil in, in, um, uh, in just consuming that. So that gets the thumbs up. Actually, is there a way you can buy the ground because you have to grind the seeds, don't you? Can you, you do. find the ground? You can, but it doesn't work so well. Right. And believe you me, I got up early every morning for six months and flat practiced and played. To get the to get a consistency is upset. Right. And uh, the, the rest is in the PK cookbook, but you have to weigh just the right amount of, of water, just the right amount of seeds. And um, I grind seeds in the coffee grinder because mm -hmm. I get coffee grinder for 12 quid. But you have to do about three batches. You can't do it in one big batch, otherwise you burn the engine out. Uh, and I've done that too. <laughs> so, um, uh, so 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 that takes the long to do, so grind the seeds. And then you add in the water and sunshine salt and you just mix it and mix it and mix it. And initially you think, oh, I made porridge, this is too much water. But then if you grind the seeds fresh, they're much drier okay. and they pull the water and the whole thing sticks together. Right. The now my daughter complained that it tasted fishy, so now I put a handful of cumin seeds or um, 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 fennel seeds in there and that gives it a nice flavour. Mm. Um, or caraway seeds, they're lovely too. Um, uh, and so then, so what I do is I so you make the dough, and then if you've got time, let it stand about 10 or 15 minutes, and it absorbs even more water and becomes even more cohesive, and then you get quite a solid dough at the end of that. And then so I have a mass it out, so it's about rolling pin thickness, and, um, uh, and about rolling pin length, and then cut it in half, 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 and make 12 buns, Yeah. and they cook much more reliably well. So I don't get soggy nibbles and door handles sticking out. In the wrong shape. Never had a favour doing the buns. Mm. I was one question about um, the, the dose the dosage on, on the magnesium and the B12. And if you're doing injections, what maintenance doses would you apply? Whatever you need to be. Whatever aware. you need. Just, yeah. You can't, those doses yeah. you cannot overdose. Yes. I'm starting to fake. Yeah. Um, um, please, Brett, if you want any of those bits and balls, mark it out a piece of paper, help yourself, pot it up, and lock it in and take your money off. Mm -hmm. If you think I'm out of stuff, I want more stuff in the car, but uh, this is, this is, um, I'm 
No, you can go if you want. You can get the dinner on. <laughs> That's all right. It's fine. Okay. <laughs>